Chapter 1 In the hospital of the orphanage at Street Clouds, Maine, two nurses, Nurse Edna and Nurse Angela, gave names to the new babies. The director of the boys' division was a doctor. His name was Wilbur Larch. One of the nurses thought that Dr. Larch was like the hardwood of the tree of that name three. Nurse Edna imagined that she was in love with Dr. Larch, and she often named babies John Larch, or John Wilbur her father's name was John. The boy was named Homer Wells by the other nurse. Homer had been the name of one of her family's many cats. Wells was associated with Nurse Angela's father's business, drilling wells, hard and honest work. Angela thought that her father had those qualities, which gave the word Wells a deep aura. Street Clouds, Maine, the town had been a logging camp for most of the 19th century. The first building was a sawmill. The first settlers were French Canadians, woodcutters, then the river bargemen came, then the prostitutes, and at last there was a church. The first logging camp had been called, simply, Clouds because the valley was low and the weather was cloudy. Dr. Wilbur Larch, who was not only the doctor for the orphanage and the director of the boys' division he had also founded the place, was the historian of the town. According to Dr. Larch, the logging camp called Clouds became Street Clouds only because of the Catholic instinct to put a saint before so many things. But by the time it became Street Clouds, it looked like a mill town. The forest, for miles around, was cleared. There was never any spring in that part of Maine. The roads were impassable. The work of the town was shut down. The springtime river was so swollen, and ran so fast, that no one wanted to travel on it. Spring and street clouds meant trouble, trouble of drinking and prostituting. Spring was the suicide season. In spring, the seeds for an orphanage were planted. When the valley around street clouds was cleared and when there were no more logs to send down river, the sawmill was closed down. And what was left behind? The weather, the sawdust, and the buildings, the mill with its broken windows. The Har Hotel with its dance hall downstairs, the few private homes, and the church, which was Catholic, for the French Canadians. And the people who were left behind? There were people, the prostitutes and the children of these prostitutes. Not one of the officers of the Catholic Church of Street Cloud stayed. Anyway, in 190 Dr. Wilbur Larch started to correct the wrongs of Street Clouds. He had a lot of work. For almost 20 years, Dr. Larch left Street Clouds only once, for World War I. Dr. Larch wanted to do something for the good of someone. In 192, when Homer Wells was born and named, Nurse Edna who was in love and Nurse Angela who wasn't had a special name for Street Cloud's founder, physician, 
town historian, war hero, and director of the boys' division. They called him Saint Larch, and why not? Homer's first foster parents returned him to street clouds, they thought there was something wrong with him, he never cried. They thought this wasn't normal. His second foster family reacted differently to Homer's silence. They beat the baby regularly and Homer cried a lot. The boy's crying saved him. The stories of Homer's loud cries found their way to the orphanage. So Dr. Larch brought the boy back to Street Clouds. Homer Wells came back to Street Clouds so many times, after so many unsuccessful foster homes, that the orphanage made Street Clouds his home. It was not easy to accept, but Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, and, finally, Dr. Wilbur Larch, had to admit that Homer Wells belonged to Street Clouds. Well, then, Homer, said Street Larch, I expect that you will be of use. In his journal, A Brief History of Street Clouds, Dr. Larch kept his daily record of the business of the orphanage. Here in Street Clouds, Larch wrote in his journal, We have only one problem. His name is Homer Wells. He is a true orphan, because his only home will always be at Street Clouds. God forgive me. I have made an orphan. His name is Homer Wells and he will belong to Street Clouds forever. By the time Homer was 12 years old, he knew the place perfectly. He knew its laundry room, its kitchen, its corners where the cats slept. He knew the bells, in fact, he rang them. He knew who the tutors were. He knew all the girls. The director of the girls' division was not a doctor, so when the girls were sick, they visited Dr. Larch at the hospital or Larch went to the girls' division to visit them. The director of the girls' division was Mrs. Grogan although she never mentioned Mr. Grogan. The three tutors came to Street Clouds from a nearby small town. There was a woman who taught math, she was a bookkeeper for a textile mill. She preferred addition and subtraction to multiplication and division. Dr. Larch discovered one day that Homer had never learned the multiplication table. Another woman, a rich plumber's widow, taught grammar and spelling. Her method was chaotic. She gave her pupils long texts with uncapitalized, misspelled, and unpunctuated words and told the children to put them into sentences, correctly punctuated and correctly spelled. She then corrected the corrections. The final document looked like a treaty between two illiterate countries at war, which was revised many times. The text was always strange to Homer Wells, even when it was finally correct. This was because the woman took the texts from a book of hymns for the church, and Homer Wells had never seen a church or heard a hymn. The third tutor, a retired teacher, was an old, 
Unhappy man who lived with his daughter's family because he couldn't take care of himself. He taught history, but he had no books. He taught the world from memory, he said the dates weren't important. He could talk about Mesopotamia for a full half hour, but when he stopped for a moment to drink some water, he continued to speak about Rome. So Homer liked doing chores more than education. His favorite chore was selecting the evening reading. Dr. Large read aloud 20 minutes every evening. Dickens was a personal favorite of Dr. Large. It took him several months to read Great Expectations 1, and more than a year to read David Copperfield 2. Almost none of the orphans understood the novels because the language was too difficult. But the evening reading helped them to fall asleep and those few who understood the words and the story could leave street clouds in their dreams. Both Great Expectations and David Copperfield were about orphans. What else could you read to an orphan? Dr. Larch wrote in his journal. Chapter 2 Wilbur Larch was born in Portland, Maine, in 186. He was the son of a tidy woman who served a man named Neil Dow, the mayor of Portland and the so-called father of the Maine law that introduced Prohibition I to that state. Wilbur Larch's mother loved her employer and saw herself more as his co-worker for the reform than as his servant which she was. Interestingly, Wilbur Larch's father was a drunk. To young Wilbur, his father never looked drunk, he never fell or lay in a stupor, he never shouted. But he always looked a little surprised, as if he had suddenly remembered or had just forgotten something important. When Wilbur was a boy, it never occurred to him that his father's missing fingers were the result of too many bottles of beer while operating the lathe, just accidents, his father said. Although he grew up, in the mayor's mansion, Wilbur Larch always used the kitchen entrance. He studied hard because he preferred the company of books to his mother's talk with other servants. Wilbur Larch went to Bowdoin College, and to Harvard Medical School where he was an excellent student. In the same year, 188, when Wilbur Larch became a doctor, Neil Dow died. In grief, Wilbur Larch's mother died soon, too. A few days later, Wilbur's father sold everything and went to Montreal, where he drank a lot and eventually died of cirrhosis. His body was returned to Portland on the same train that had carried him away. Wilbur Larch met the train and buried his father. Larch was a neither addict. He was an open drop method man. With one hand, he held a mask over his mouth and nose. He made this mask himself, he wrapped many layers of gauze around a cone of stiff paper. With his other hand, he wet the cone with ether dropping from the can. Wilbur gave much less ether to himself than to patients during an operation. When the hand that held the ether can felt weak, 
he put the cane down, when the hand that held the cone over his mouth and nose dropped to his side, the cone fell off his face. He didn't feel the panic that a patient experiences, before that happened, he always dropped the mask. When young Dr. Large started to deliver babies in the poor district of Boston, the South End, he thought that ether could relieve childbirth. Although he carried the ether can and the gauze cone with him, he didn't always have time to anesthetize the patient. Of course, he used it when he had the time. He didn't agree with his elder colleagues that children should be born in pain. Larch delivered his first child to a Lithuanian family in a cold water top floor apartment in a dirty street. There was no ice in the apartment. The ice was necessary in case of bleeding. So Larch asked the husband to bring some. There was a pot of water already boiling on the stove, but Larch wished he could sterilize the entire apartment. He listened to the fetus's heartbeat while he watched a cat toying with a dead mouse on the kitchen floor. When the husband returned with the ice, he stepped on the cat, which cried so loudly that Wilbur Larch thought the child was being born. It was a short and safe delivery, but the patient continued bleeding. Larch knew it was dangerous, fortunately, the ice helped. After washing the baby, Larch left the apartment. Just then, he heard a noisy quarrel of the family. The delivery had been only a brief interruption to their life. He walked out of the house and looked up in time to see the object flying through the window of the Lithuanian apartment. Larch was shocked to see that the object thrown from the window and now dead on the ground at his feet, was the cat. Here in Street Clouds, Dr. Larch wrote later, I am constantly grateful for the South End of Boston. He meant he was grateful for its children and for the feeling they gave him, that the act of helping them to be born was perhaps the safest phase of their life. One night, when Wilbur was sleeping in the South End branch of the Boston Lying in Hospital, he was informed by one of the doctors that a patient was waiting for him. There were stories about an abortionist in the South End who charged nearly $500 for an abortion, which very few poor women could afford, so they became his prostitutes. His place was called, simply, Off Harrison. One of lying in hospitals was on Harrison Street, so that Off Harrison, in street language, meant not official, or legal. The woman who came to see Dr. Larch knew Off Harrison methods, which was why she asked Wilbur Larch to do the job. You want an abortion, Wilbur Larch said softly. It was the first time he had spoken the word. It isn't moving yet, said the woman. Wilbur Larch didn't think anyone had a soul, but until the middle of the 19th century, the law's attitude toward abortion was simple and to Wilbur Large sensible, before the first movement of the fetus, abortion was legal. And it was not dangerous to the mother to perform an abortion before the fetus started moving.
Wilbur Large could hear the nurse anesthetist sleeping. For an abortion, he needed only a little more ether than he usually gave himself. He had everything he needed. He could operate. But Wilbur Large was too young, he hesitated. He didn't know what to say to his colleagues, or to the nurse if she woke up. It was illegal, it was dangerous. So the woman left. She was brought back to the South Branch a week later. No one knew how she got there, she was beaten, perhaps because she hadn't paid the usual abortion fee. She had a very high fever, her swollen face was as hot and dry to the touch as bread fresh from the oven. They woke Quilber. The woman died before Dr. Large could operate on her. I refused to give her an abortion a week ago, Wilbur Large said. Good for you, said the house officer. But Wilbur Large thought this was no good for anyone. In the morning, Dr. Large visited off Harrison. He needed to see for himself what happened there. He wanted to know where women went when doctors refused to help them. If pride was a sin, thought Dr. Large, the greatest sin was moral pride. He beat on the door but no one heard him. When he opened the door and stepped inside, no one bothered to look at him. They did not use ether off Harrison. For pain, they used music. A group called the German Choir practiced leader in the front rooms off Harrison. They sang passionately. The only instrument was a piano, there were not enough chairs for the women, the men stood in two groups far from the women. The choir conductor stood by the piano. The air was full of cigar smoke and the stink of cheap beer. The choir followed the man's wild arms. Larch walked behind the piano and through the only open door. He entered into a room with nothing in it. Not a piece of furniture, not a window. There was only a closed door. Larch opened it and found himself in the waiting room. There were newspapers and fresh flowers and an open window. Four people sat in pairs. No one read the papers or sniffed the flowers or looked out the window. Everyone looked down and continued to look down when Wilbur Larch walked in. A man was sitting at a desk and eating something out of a bowl. The man looked young and strong and indifferent. He wore a pair of work overalls and a sleeveless undershirt, around his neck, like a gym instructor's whistle, hung a key obviously to the cash box. Without looking at Wilbur Large, the man said, Hey, don't come here. It's only for ladies. I'm a doctor, Dr. Large said. The man continued eating, but he looked up at Large. The singers took a deep breath. And in the silence, Larch heard the sound of someone vomiting. One of the women in the waiting room began to cry, but the choir sang again. Something about Christ's blood, Larch thought. 
What do you want? The man asked large. I'm a doctor, I want to see the doctor here, large said. There is no doctor here, the man said. Just you. Then I want to give advice, large said. Medical advice. Free medical advice. The man studied large's face. You're not the first one here, the man said, after a while. Wait for your turn. Larch looked for a seat. He was shocked by everything. He tapped his foot nervously and looked at a couple sitting next to him, a mother and her daughter. The daughter looked too young to be pregnant, but then why, Larch wondered, had the mother brought the girl here? Wilbur Larch stared at the shut door, behind which he had heard unmistakable vomiting. Suddenly he heard the scream. It was louder than the choir. The young girl jumped from her seat, sat down, cried out, she put her face in her mother's lap. Larch realized that she needed the abortion, not her mother. The girl didn't look older than 10 or 12 years old. Excuse me, Larch said to the mother. I'm a doctor. So you're a doctor, the mother said, bitterly. And how can you help? The mother asked him. How many months is she? Larch asked the mother. Maybe three, the mother said. But I already paid them here. How old is she? Larch asked. The girl looked up from her mother's lap. I'm fourteen, she said. She'll be fourteen, next year, the mother said. Larch stood up and said to the man with the cash box key, pay them back. I'll help the girl. I thought you came for advice, the man said. To give it, Dr. Larch said. When you pay, there's a deposit. You can't get a deposit back. How much is the deposit? Larch asked. The man drummed his fingers on the cash box. Maybe half, he said. When the evil door opened, an old couple looked into the waiting room. Behind them, on a bed. A woman lay under a sheet, her eyes were open but unfocused. He says that he's a doctor, the cash box man said, without looking at the old couple. He says that he came to give you free medical advice. He tells me to pay these ladies back. He says that he'll take care of the young lady himself. Larch realized that the old white-haired woman was the abortionist, the old white-haired man was her assistant. Dr. Larch, Dr. Larch said, bowing. Well? The woman asked, aggressively. What's your advice, doctor? You don't know what you're doing, Dr. Large said. At least I'm doing something, the old woman said. If you know how to do it, why don't you do it? She asked. 
If you know how, why don't you teach me? The woman under the sheet looked shaky. She sat up and tried to examine herself. She discovered that, under the sheet, she still wore her own dress. This knowledge relaxed her. Please listen to me, Dr. Larch said to her. If you have a fever, you must come to the hospital. Don't wait. I thought the advice was for me, the old woman said. Where's my advice? Larch tried to ignore her. He went out to the waiting room and told the mother with her young daughter that they should leave. Pay them back. The old woman told the cash box man the angrily. She put her hand on Dr. Larch's arm. Ask her who the father is, she said. That's not my business, Larch said. You're right, the old woman said. But ask her, anyway, it's an interesting story. She spoke to the mother. Tell him who the father is, she said. The daughter began to cry. The old woman looked only at the mother. Tell him, she repeated. My husband, the woman said, her father. Her father is the father, the old woman said to Dr. Larch. Do you understand? About a third of them get it from their fathers, or their brothers. Rape, she said. Incest. Do you understand? Yes, thank you, Dr. Large said, pulling the girl with him. After he had helped the poor girl, Larch became very popular with the unhappy women who needed him badly. He had a feeling that they followed him everywhere asking for help. Finally, he decided to return home. Wilbur Larch applied to the Maine State Board of Medical Examiners for a useful position in obstetrics. While they sought a position for him in some developing community, they liked his Harvard degree and made him a member of their board. Larch waited for his new appointment in his old hometown of Portland, in the old mayor's mansion where he had spent his childhood. Larch often thought about the orphans of the South End. In 189, less than half the mothers were married. According to the rules of the lying in hospital, only married or recently widowed women of good moral character could be admitted. But in truth, almost everyone was admitted. There were an astonishing number of women who said that they were widows. He wondered why there were no orphans, no children nor women in need in the tidy town of Portland. Wilbur Larch did not feel of much use there. He looked forward to getting a letter from the Maine State Board of Medical Examiners. But before the letter arrived, Wilbur Larch had another invitation. He was invited to Boston to have dinner with the family of Channing Peabody's and friends. Larch knew that Channing and Peabody were old Boston family names, but he was unfamiliar with the strange combination of the two. He felt uncomfortably dressed for the season, 
His only suit was a dark and heavy, and he hadn't worn it since the day of his visit off Harrison. When Larch lifted the big brass door knocker of the Channing Peabody house, he felt the suit was too hot. Mrs. Channing Peabody opened the door to receive him. Dr. Larch? Mrs. Channing Peabody asked. Yes, Dr. Larch, answered Larch and bowed to the woman with a tanned face and silver gray hair. You must meet my daughter, the woman said. And all the rest of us. She added with a loud laugh that chilled the sweat on Wilbur Larch's back. All the rest of them were named Channing or Peabody or Channing Peabody, and some of them had first names that resembled last names. Mrs. Channing Peabody's daughter was young and unhealthy looking. Her name was Missy. Missy? Wilbur Larch repeated. The girl nodded and shrugged. They were sitting at a long table, next to each other. Across from them, there was one of the young men. He looked angry. The girl looked unwell. She was pale, she picked at her food. The dinner was delicious but there was no subject for conversation. The old retired surgeon who was sitting on Wilbur's other side, he was either a Channing or a Peabody, looked disappointed when he learned that Larch was an obstetrician. The old man was hard of hearing and asked young Larch to speak louder. Their conversation was the dinner table's only conversation, they were talking about operations. Wilbur Larch saw that Missy Channing Peabody's skin was changing color from milk to mustard to spring grass green, and almost back to milk. Her mother and the angry young man took the girl to the fresh air. Wilbur Larch already knew what Missy needed. She needed an abortion. It was clear because of the visible anger of the young man, the old surgeon's interest in modern obstetrical procedure and the absence of other conversation. That was why he'd been invited, Missy Channing Peabody suffering from morning sickness, needed an abortion. Rich people needed them, too. Even rich people knew about him. He wanted to leave, but now his fate held him. He felt that he needed to perform the abortion. Mrs. Channing Peabody took him out into the hall. He let her lead him to the room that had been prepared for him. On the way she said, We have this little problem. Missy Channing Peabody had certainly been ready. The family had converted a small reading room into an operating theater. There were old pictures of men in uniform in many books. There was a table, and Missy herself was lying in the correct position. Someone had done the necessary homework. Dr. Larch saw the alcohol, the soap, the nail brush. There was a set of medical instruments. Everything was perfect, but Wilbur Larch could not forgive the loathing which the family felt for him. Mrs. Channing Peabody seemed unable to touch him. 
These people need me but they hate me, Larch was thinking, scrubbing under his nails. He thought that the Channing Peabody's knew many doctors but they didn't want to ask one of them for help with this little problem. They were too pure for it. Take her temperature every hour, Larch told the servant after he had finished operating. If there's more than a little bleeding, or if she has a fever. I should be called. And treat her like a princess, Wilbur Larch told the old woman and the young man. Don't make her feel ashamed. When he put his coat on, he felt the envelope in the pocket. He didn't count the money, but he saw that there were several hundred dollars. It was the servant's treatment, it meant that the Channing Peabody's were not going to ask him back for tennis or croquet. Larch handed about fifty dollars to the old woman who had prepared Missy for the abortion. He gave about twenty dollars to the young tennis player, who had opened the door to the yard to breathe a little of the garden air. Larch was going to leave. He looked for the old surgeon, but there were only servants in the dining room, still clearing the table. He gave each of them about twenty or thirty dollars. He found the kitchen and several servants busy in it, and gave away about two hundred dollars there. He gave the last of the money, another two hundred dollars, to a gardener who was on his knees in a flower bed by the main door. He tried to fold the envelope and pin it to the main door, the envelope kept blowing free in the wind. Then he got angry, made a ball out of the envelope and threw it into the grain lawn. On his way back to Portland, Wilbur Larch was thinking about the last century of medical history, when abortion was legal. By the time he got back to Portland, he had made a decision. He was an obstetrician, he delivered babies into the world. His colleagues called this the Lord's work. And he was an abortionist, he delivered mothers, too. His colleagues called this the devil's work, but it was all the Lord's work to Wilbur Larch. He decided to deliver babies. He decided to deliver mothers, too. In Portland, a letter from street clouds waited for him. The Maine State Board of Medical Examiners sent him to Street Clouds. In the first week spent in Street Clouds, Wilbur Larch founded an orphanage because it was needed, delivered three babies one wanted, two unwanted, one became another orphan, and performed one abortion his third. Dr. Larch educated the population about birth control. Over the years, there was one abortion for every five births. During World War I, when Wilbur Larch went to France, the replacement doctor at the orphanage did not perform abortions, the number of orphans doubled. But the doctor said to Nurse Edna and to Nurse Angela that he was put on this earth to do the Lord's work, not the devil's. Dr. Wilbur Larch wrote his good nurses from France that he had seen the real devil's work, the devil worked with weapon. The devil's work was gas bacillus infection. 
tell him, Larch wrote Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, the work at the orphanage is all the Lord's work, everything you do, you do for the orphans. And when the war was over, and Wilbur Larch came home to street clouds, Nurse Edna and Nurse Angela were already familiar with the language for the work of street clouds, the Lord's work and the devil's work, they called it, just to make it clear between themselves which operation was being performed. Wilbur Larch didn't mind, it was useful language, but both nurses agreed with Larch that it was all the Lord's work. It was not until 193 that they had their first problem. His name was Homer Wells. He went out into the world and came back to street clouds so many times that it was necessary to put him to work, by the time a boy is a teenager, he should be of use. After the Lord's work, or after the devil's, the waste basket contained the same things. In most cases, blood, cotton, gauze, placenta. Sometimes in the waste baskets that Homer Wells carried to the green major there were human fetuses. And that is how Homer Wells when he was 13 discovered that both the babies and the fetuses were delivered at street clouds. One day, walking back from the cremator, he saw a fetus on the ground, it had fallen from the waste basket, but when he saw it, he thought it had fallen from the sky. He looked for a nest but there were no trees. Holding the thing in one hand, Homer ran with it to Dr. Larch. Larch was sitting at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, he was writing a letter. I found something, Homer Wells said. Larch took the fetus from him and placed it on a clean white piece of paper on Nurse Angela's desk. It was about three months. What is it? Homer Wells asked. The Lord's work, said Wilbur Larch, that saint of street clouds because at that moment he realized that this was also the Lord's work, teaching Homer Wells, telling him everything, explaining what was good and what was bad. It was a lot of work, the Lord's work, Chapter 3 Here in Street Clouds, Dr. Larch wrote, We treat orphans like children from royal families. In the boys' division, after the bedtime reading Dr. Larch shouted his nightly blessing over the beds standing in rows in the darkness. In 193, soon after Homer Wells saw his first fetus, he began reading David Copperfield, as a bedtime story, to the boys, just twenty minutes every night no more, no less. Then the lights were switched off and Dr. Larch opened the door from the hall. Good night. He said in a loud voice. Good night, princes of Maine, kings of New England. Then the door closed, and the orphans were left in a new blackness. They were dreaming of their future. They imagined a royal foster families and princesses who loved them. For Homer Wells, it was different. The princes of Maine that Homer saw, the kings of New England that he imagined were at the court of street clouds, 
they traveled nowhere. But even to Homer Wells Dr. Large's benediction was full of hope. These princes of Maine, these kings of New England, these orphans of street clouds, they were the heroes of their own lives. Homer understood it clearly, Dr. Large, like a father, gave him that idea. You can behave like a prince or like a king even at street clouds, Dr. Larch meant. Homer Wells dreamed that he was a prince. He lifted up his eyes to his king, he watched Street Larch's every move. Homer couldn't forget the coolness of the fetus. Because it was dead, right? He asked Dr. Larch. That's why it was cool, right? Yes, said Dr. Larch. I can tell you, Homer, it was never alive. Never alive, said Homer Wells. Sometimes, Dr. Larch said, a woman just can't force herself to stop a pregnancy, she feels the baby is already a baby, and she has to have it, although she doesn't want it and she can't take care of it, and so she comes to us and has her baby here. She leaves it here, with us. She trusts us to find it a home. She makes an orphan, said Homer Wells. Someone has to adopt it. Someone usually adopts it, Dr. Large said. Usually, said Homer Wells. Maybe. Eventually, Dr. Large said. And sometimes, said Homer Wells. The woman doesn't want to have a baby, right? Sometimes, said Dr. Larch, the woman knows very early in her pregnancy that this child is unwanted. An orphan, from the start, said Homer Wells. You can say so, said Wilbur Larch. So she kills it said Homer Wells. You can say so, said Wilbur Larch. You can also say that she stops it before it becomes a child, she just stops it. In the first three or four months, the fetus, or the embryo I don't say, then, the child, it does not have a life of its own. It hasn't developed. It has developed only a little, said Homer Wells. It can't move, said Dr. Larch. It doesn't have a proper nose, said Homer Wells, remembering it. On the thing, which he found, there was no nose, it had the nostrils of a pig. Sometimes, said Dr. Larch, when a woman is very strong and knows that no one will care for this baby, and she doesn't want to bring a child into the world and try to find it a home, she comes to me and I stop it. Tell me again, what's stopping it called? Asked Homer Wells. An abortion, Dr. Large said. Right, said Homer Wells. An abortion. And what you held in your hand, Homer, was an aborted fetus, Dr. Large said. An embryo, about three to four months. An aborted fetus, an embryo. About three to four months, 
said Homer Wells, who usually repeated the last words of sentences. And that's why, Dr. Larch said patiently, some of the women who come here don't look pregnant. The embryo, the fetus, is very small. But they all are pregnant, said Homer Wells. All the women who come here either going to have an orphan, or they're going to stop it, right? That's right, Dr. Larch said. I'm just the doctor. I help them have what they want. An orphan or an abortion. An orphan or an abortion, said Homer Wells. Nurse said Nutty's Dr. Larch about Homer Wells. You have a new shadow, Wilbur, she said. God, forgive me, wrote Dr. Larch. I have created a disciple, I have a 13-year-old disciple. By the time, Homer was 15, his reading of David Copperfield was so successful that some of the older girls in the girls' division asked Dr. Larch to tell Homer to read to them. Shall I read just to the older girls? Homer asked Dr. Larch. Certainly not, said Dr. Larch. You'll read to all of them. In the girls' division, Homer asked. Well, yes, Dr. Larch said. All the girls can't come to the boys' division. Right, said Homer Wells. But should I read to the girls first or to the boys first? The girls, Larch said. The girls go to bed earlier than the boys. Do they? Homer asked. They do here, Dr. Larch said. And should I read them the same book? Homer asked. But Dr. Larch decided that girl orphans should hear about girl orphans. He also believed that boy orphans should hear about boy orphans, and so he told Homer to read aloud Jane Eyre 1 to the girls. It struck Homer that the girls were more attentive than the boys. It surprised Homer, because he found Jane Eyre not as interesting as David Copperfield. He was sure that Charles Dickens was a better writer than Charlotte Bronte. The girls' division, Homer thought, had a different smell from the boys. On the one hand, it smelled sweeter, on the other hand, it smelled sicker, it was difficult for Homer to decide. When children went to bed, the boys and girls dressed alike, undershirts and underpants. Every time when Homer arrived at the girls' division, the girls were already in their beds with their legs covered, some of them were sitting, some of them were lying. One of the girls was both bigger and older than Homer Wells. Her name was Melanie. Melanie always looked at Homer Wells when he was reading. She was bigger than Mrs. Grogan, she was too big for the girls' division. She was too big to be adopted. She's too big to be a girl, thought Homer Wells. Bigger than Nurse Edna, bigger than Nurse Angela, almost as big as Dr. Larch. She was fat, but her fat looked solid. 
Homer Wells also knew that Melanie was strong. While reading aloud from Jane Eyre, Homer needed to keep his eyes off Melanie. He was afraid that she could feel how he liked her heaviness. After reading to the girls, Homer hurried to the boys' division. The boys were waiting for him. Some of the smaller ones had fallen asleep. The others were lying with open eyes and open mouths, like baby birds. Homer felt he was rushing from nest to nest. His voice was feeding them and they always cried for more. His reading, like food, made them sleepy, but it often woke Homer up. He usually lay awake after the nightly benediction. There were different irritating noises. Little Fuzzy Stone had a constant dry cough. He had wet, red eyes. He slept inside a humidified tent. There was a special water wheel with a battery and a fan to distribute the vapor. It worked all night. Fuzzy Stone's chest sounded like a tiny, bad motor. The water wheel, the fan, Fuzzy Stone's dramatic gasps combined in Homer's mind. Dr. Large told Homer that Fuzzy Stone was allergic to dust. A child with chronic bronchitis was not easily adoptable. Who wants to take home a cough? When Fuzzy Stone's coughing was too much for Homer Wells, he quietly went to the baby room. Nurse Angela or Nurse Edna was always there, usually awake. Sometimes, when the babies were quiet, even the nurse on duty was sleeping, and Homer Wells tiptoed past them all. One night he saw one of the mothers standing in the baby room. She was standing in her hospital gown in the middle of the baby room, her eyes were closed. She was absorbing the smells and sounds of the baby room. Homer was afraid that the woman would wake up Nurse Angela, who was sleeping on the duty bed. Slowly, he led the woman back to the mother's room. The mothers were often awake when he came to have a look at them. Sometimes he brought someone a glass of water. The women who came to street clouds for the abortions rarely stayed for the night. They needed less time to recover than the woman who had delivered. So Dr. Larch discovered that they were very comfortable if they arrived in the morning and left in the early evening, just after dark. In the daytime, the sound of the babies was not so clear because the noise that the older orphans made, and the talk among the mothers and the nurses, confused everything. Dr. Larch noticed that the sound of the newborn babies upset the women who had the abortions. At night, only the crying babies and the owls made sounds at street clouds. If one of those women spent the night, it was never in the room with the mothers. Homer Wells saw that the expressions on their faces were troubled when they were sleeping. Homer Wells tried to imagine his own mother among the women. Where did she go after the childbirth? Or was there no place she wanted to go? And what, when she was lying there, was his father thinking, 
If he even knew he was a father. If she even knew who he was. These are the things the women usually asked him, are you a medical student? Are you going to be a doctor when you grow up? Are you one of the orphans? How old are you? Hasn't anyone adopted you yet? Do you like it here? And he usually answered, maybe I will become a doctor. Of course Dr. Larch is a good teacher. That's right, I am one of the orphans. I am almost 16. Adoption wasn't for me. I wanted to come back. Of course I like it here. One of the women with a huge belly asked him, Do you mean if someone wanted to adopt you, you wouldn't go? I wouldn't go, said Homer Wells. Right. You wouldn't even think about it? The woman asked. Well, I guess I'd think about it, Homer Wells said. But I'd probably decide to stay, as long as I can be of use here. The pregnant woman began to cry. Be of use, she said. She put her hands on her great belly. Look at that, she whispered, do you want to be of use? Right, said Homer Wells, who held his breath. No one wanted to put his ear against my belly and listen, the woman said. You shouldn't have a baby if there's no one who wants to feel the baby, or listen to it. I don't know, said Homer Wells. Don't you want to touch it or put your ear down to it? The woman asked him. Okay, said Homer Wells, putting his hand on the woman's hot, hard belly. Put your ear down against it, too, the woman advised him. Right, Homer said. He touched his ear very lightly to her stomach but she strongly pressed his face against her, she was like a drum. She was a war engine. No one should have a baby if there's no one who wants to sleep with his head right there, the woman whispered, patting the place where she held Homer's face. Right where? Homer wondered, because there was no comfortable place to put his head. He found it hard to imagine that the woman was carrying only one baby. Do you want to be of use? The woman asked him, crying gently now. Yes. Be of use, he said. Sleep right here, the woman told him. He pretended to sleep with his face against the noisy belly, where she held him. Nurse Angela called. Homer Wells Angelic, and Nurse Edna spoke of the boy's perfection and of his innocence, but Dr. Larch worried about Homer's contact with the damaged women who needed the services of street clouds. What impression did they make on the boy? Homer Wells had a good, open face. It was not a face that could hide feelings and thoughts. He had strong hands and kind eyes. Dr. Larch was worried about the life stories Homer had to hear. He was worried not about the dirty details, 
but about the dirty philosophy. There were no curtains at street clouds. The hospital dispensary was a corner room, it had a south window and an east window. Nurse Edna thought that the east window made Dr. Larch such an early riser. The white hospital bed always looked untouched, Dr. Larch was the last one who went to bed and the first one who rose, so there was a rumor that he never slept at all. If he slept, he slept in the dispensary. He did his writing at night, at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office. The nurses had long ago forgotten why this room was called Nurse Angela's office, Dr. Larch had always used it for his writing. Since the dispensary was where he slept, perhaps Dr. Larch felt the need to say that the office belonged to someone else. The dispensary had two doors one leading to a toilet and shower. With a window on the south end and on the east wall, and a door on the north and on the west, there was no wall one could put anything against, the bed was under the east window. The closed and locked cupboards with their glass doors formed a strange labyrinth in the middle of the room. The labyrinth of cabinets blocked the bed from view of the hall door, which, like all the doors in the orphanage, had no lock. The dispensary afforded Larch some privacy for his ether tricks. He was not always conscious of the moment when his fingers lost their grip on the mask and the cone fell from his face. He could usually hear voices outside the dispensary, calling him. He was sure that he always had time to recover. Dr. Larch? Nurse Angela or Nurse Sedna? or Homer Wells, called, which was all Larch needed to return from his ether voyage. I'm coming. Larch answered. I was just resting. It was the dispensary, after all, the dispensaries of surgeons always smell of ether. And for a man who worked so hard and slept so little if he slept at all, it was natural that sometimes he needed a nap. But Melanie suggested to Homer Wells that Dr. Larch had a bad habit. What's the strange smell he has? Melanie asked. It's ether, said Homer Wells. He's a doctor. He smells like ether. Are you saying this is normal? Melanie asked him. Right, said Homer Wells. Wrong, Melanie said. Your favorite doctor smells like he's got ether inside him. Like he's got ether instead of blood. One day in the spring, Melanie said to Homer Wells, Your favorite doctor knows more about you than you know. And he knows more about me than I know, maybe. Homer didn't say anything. Do you ever think about your mother? Melanie asked. Looking at the sky. Do you want to know who she was, why she didn't keep you, who your father was? Right, said Homer Wells. I was told I was left at the door, Melanie said. Maybe it is so, maybe not. 
I was born here, said Homer Wells. So you were told, Melanie said. Nurse Angela named me, Homer answered. Homer, Melanie said. Just think about it, if you were born here in St. Clouds, they must have a record of it. Your favorite doctor must know who your mother is. He knows her name. It is written down, on paper. It's a law. A law, Homer Wells said. It's a law that there must be a record of you, Melanie said. They must have your history. History, said Homer Wells. He imagined Dr. Large sitting at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, if there were records, they were in the office. If you want to know who your mother is, Melanie said, find your file. And find my file, too. I'm sure they are more interesting than Jane Eyre. In fact, Dr. Large's papers included family histories, but only of the families who adopted the orphans. Contrary to Melanie's belief, no records were kept of the orphans' actual mothers and fathers. An orphan's history began with its date of birth, its sex, its length in inches, its weight in pounds, its name. Then there was a record of the orphan's sicknesses. That was all. A much thicker file was kept on the orphan's adoptive families. Any information about those families was important to Dr. Larch. Here in Street Clouds, he wrote, My first priority is an orphan's future. It is for his or her future, for example, that I destroy any record of the identity of his or her natural mother. The unfortunate women who give birth here have made a very difficult decision, they should not, later in their lives, make this decision again. And in almost every case the orphans should not look for the biological parents. I am thinking only of the orphans. Of course, one day they will want to know. But how does it help anyone to look forward to the past? Orphans, especially, must look ahead to their futures. And what if his or her biological parent, in later years, feels sorry for the decision to give birth here? If there were records, it would always be possible for the real parents to trace their children. That is the storytelling business. That is not for the orphans. So that is not for me. That is the passage from a brief history of street clouds that Wilbur Large showed to Homer Wells when he caught Homer in Nurse Angela's office studying his papers. I was just looking for something, and I couldn't find it, Homer said to Dr. Larch. I know what you were looking for, Homer, Dr. Larch told him, and it can't be found. I don't remember your mother. I don't even remember you when you were born, you didn't become you until later. I thought there was a law, Homer said. He meant a law of records, or written history, but Wilbur Larch was the only historian and the only law of street clouds.
It was an orphanage law, an orphan's life began when Wilbur Larch remembered it. That was Larch's law. Homer knew that his simple note written to Melanie cannot be found would never satisfy her, although Homer had believed Dr. Larch. What does he mean, cannot be found? Melanie screamed at Homer, they were on the porch. Is he playing God? He gives you your history, or he takes it away. If that's not playing God, what is? Homer Wells didn't answer. Homer thought that Dr. Larch played God pretty well. Here in Street Clouds, Dr. Larch wrote, I have the choice of playing God or leaving practically everything up to chance. It is my experience that practically everything is left up to chance much of the time, men who believe in good and evil, and who believe that good should win, should wait for those moments when it is possible to play God. There won't be many such moments. God damn him. Melanie screamed. But Homer Wells didn't react to this remark, either. Homer, Melanie, said, we've got nobody. If you tell me we've got each other, I'll kill you. Homer kept silent. If you tell me we've got your favorite Dr. Larch, or this whole place, she said. If you tell me that, I'll torture you before I kill you. Right, said Homer Wells. God damn you. She screamed, at Dr. Larch, at her mother, at street clouds, at the world. Why aren't you angry? She asked Homer. What's wrong with you? You're never going to find out who did this to you. Don't you care? I don't know, said Homer Wells. Help me, or I'm going to run away, she told him. Help me, or I'm going to kill someone. Homer realized that it was not easy for him, in the case of Melanie, to be of use, but he tried. Don't kill anyone, he said. Don't run away. Why should I stay? She asked. You're not staying, I mean that someone will adopt you. No, they won't, Homer said. Besides, I won't go. You'll go, Melanie said. I won't, Homer said. Please, don't run away, please don't kill anyone. If I stay, you'll stay, is that what you're saying? Melanie asked him. Is that what I mean? Thought Homer Wells. But Melanie, as usual, gave him no time to think. Promise me you'll stay as long as I stay, Homer, Melanie said. She moved closer to him. Promise me you'll stay as long as I stay, Homer, she said. Right, said Homer Wells. I promise, Homer said. You promise me, Homer. She screamed at him. You promised you wouldn't leave me. As long as I stay. 
You stay. I promise. He said to her. He turned away and went to see Dr. Larch. Dr. Larch was not in Nurse Angela's office, where Homer had expected to find him. Homer went to the dispensary to see if Dr. Larch was there. Wilbur Larch was on his hospital bed in the dispensary with a gauze cone saturated with ether. Dr. Larch Wilbur Larch took the deepest possible breath. His hand lost the cone, which rolled off his face and under the bed. Dr. Larch Homer Wells said again. The smell of ether in the dispensary seemed unusually strong to Homer, who passed through the labyrinth of medicine chests to see if Dr. Larch was on his bed. I'm sorry, Dr. Larch, said when he saw Homer beside his bed. He sat up too fast, he felt very lightheaded, the room was swimming. I'm sorry, he repeated. That's okay, said Homer Wells. I'm sorry that I woke you up. Sit down, Homer, said Dr. Larch, he was ready for the conversation. Listen, Homer, Dr. Larch said, you're old enough to be my assistant. Homer thought it was a funny thing to say and he began to smile. You don't understand it, do you? Larch asked. I'm going to teach you surgery, the Lord's work and the devil's, Homer. Larch said. Homer, Larch said, you're going to finish medical school before you start high school. This was especially funny to Homer, but Dr. Larch suddenly became serious. Well? Larch asked. It's not in David Copperfield. It's not in Jane Eyre, either, what you need to know, he added. Here, Larch said, handing Homer the old copy of Gray's Anatomy 1, look at this. Look at it three or four times a day, and every night. Here in Street Clouds, wrote Dr. Wilbur Larch. I have had little use for my Grey's Anatomy, but in France, in World War I, I used it every day. Larch also gave Homer his personal handbook of obstetrical procedure, his notebooks from medical school and from his internships, he began with the chemistry lectures and the standard textbook. He prepared a place in the dispensary for a few easy experiments in bacteriology. Homer was impressed with the first childbirth that he watched, not so much with any special skill of Dr. Larch. Homer was impressed by the natural rhythm of the labor and the power of the woman's muscles. He was shocked to see how unfriendly the child's new world was to the child. In the evenings, Homer continued the bedtime reading. One day, when he went back to the boys' division, Nurse Angela told him that John Wilbur was gone, adopted. It is a nice family, Nurse Angela told Homer happily. When someone was adopted, Dr. Larch changed the traditional benediction to the boys in the darkness. Before he addressed them as princes of Maine, 
As kings of New England, he made an announcement. Let us be happy for John Wilbur, Wilbur Large said. He has found a family. Good night, John, Dr. Large said, and the boys said after him, Good night, John. Good night, John Wilbur. And Dr. Large paused before saying the usual, Good night, Princes of Maine, Kings of New England. Homer Wells read Gray's Anatomy before he tried to go to sleep. Something was unusual that night. It took Homer some time to detect what was absent, the silence finally informed him. Fuzzy Stone and his noisy apparatus had been taken to the hospital. Apparently, Fuzzy required more careful monitoring, and Dr. Larch had moved him into the private room, next to surgery, where Nurse Edna or Nurse Angela could look after Fuzzy. Homer Wells thought that Fuzzy Stone looked like an embryo, like a walking, talking fetus. Dr. Larch told Homer that Fuzzy had been born prematurely, that Fuzzy's lungs had not developed. Homer couldn't sleep, he thought about Fuzzy Stone. He went down to the private room, next to surgery, but he couldn't hear the breathing apparatus. He stood quietly and listened but the silence really frightened him. Where is he? Homer asked Dr. Larch. Where's Fuzzy? Dr. Larch was at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, where he was almost every night. I was thinking how to tell you, Larch said. You said I was your apprentice, right? Homer asked him. Then you should tell me everything. Right? That's right, Homer, Dr. Larch agreed. How the boy had changed. Why hadn't Larch noticed that Homer Wells needed a shave? Why hadn't Large taught him to do that? I am responsible for everything, if I am going to be responsible at all, Large reminded himself. Fuzzy's lungs weren't strong enough, Homer, Dr. Large said. They never developed properly. He caught every respiratory infection. Homer Wells was growing up, he started to feel responsible for things. What are you going to tell the little ones? Homer asked Dr. Larch. Wilbur Larch looked at Homer, he loved him so much. He was proud as a father. What do you think I should say, Homer? Dr. Larch asked. It was Homer's first decision as an adult. He thought about it very carefully. In 193, he was almost 16. He was learning how to be a doctor at a time when most boys of his age were learning how to drive a car. Homer had not yet learned how to drive a car, Wilbur Larch had never learned how to drive a car. I think, said Homer Wells, that you should tell the little ones what you usually tell them. You should tell them that Fuzzy has been adopted. Larch knew that Homer was right. 
The next night, Wilbur Large followed the advice of his young apprentice. Perhaps because he was telling lies, he forgot the proper routine. Instead of the announcement about Fuzzy Stone, he gave the usual benediction. Good night, Princes of Maine, Kings of New England. Dr. Larch addressed them in the darkness. Then he remembered what he was going to say. Oh! He said aloud. He frightened the little orphans. What's wrong? cried a boy called Snowy. Nothing's wrong. Dr. Large said, but the whole room of boys was anxious. Large tried to say the usual thing. Let us be happy for Fuzzy Stone, Dr. Larch said in silence. Fuzzy Stone has found a family, Dr. Large said. Good night, Fuzzy. Good night, Fuzzy. Someone said. But Homer Wells heard a pause in the air. Not everyone was absolutely convinced. Good night, Fuzzy. Homer Wells said with confidence, and a few voices followed him. Good night, Fuzzy. Good night, Fuzzy Stone. After Dr. Larch had left them, Little Snowy started speaking. Homer? Snowy said. I'm here, said Homer Wells in the darkness. How could anyone adopt Fuzzy Stone, Homer? Snowy asked. Who could do it? said another little boy. Someone with a better machine, said Homer Wells. It was someone who had a better breathing machine than the one Dr. Larch built for Fuzzy. It's a family that knows all about breathing machines. It's the family business, he added, breathing machines. Lucky Fuzzy. Someone said. Homer knew he had convinced them when Snowy said, Good night, Fuzzy. Homer Wells, who was not yet sixteen, an apprentice surgeon, walked down to the river. The loudness of the river was a comfort to Homer more comforting than the silence in the sleeping room that night. He stood on the river bank. The boy was saying goodbye to his own childhood. Good night, Fuzzy, Homer said over the river. The main woods let the remark without an answer. Good night, Fuzzy. Homer cried as loud as he could. And then he cried louder, Good night, Fuzzy. He, the grown up boy, cried it again and again. Good night, Fuzzy Stone. Chapter 4 In other parts of the world, wrote Wilbur Larch, there is society. Here in street clouds we have no society, and there are no options. That's why an orphan is eager to become a member of any society. Wilbur Larch was thinking of Homer Wells when he wrote about options. Homer had no choice concerning his apprenticeship. What else could he learn if he didn't learn obstetrical procedure? By 194, 
Homer Wells who was not yet 20 years old had delivered many children himself, with Dr. Larch always present, but Larch had not allowed Homer to perform an abortion. It was understood by both Larch and Homer that Homer was able to perform one, but Larch believed that Homer should complete medical school, a real medical school, and serve an internship in another hospital before he performed the abortion. The operation was not complicated, but Larch believed that it should be Homer's choice. Larch thought that Homer should know something of society before he made the decision, by himself, whether to perform abortions or not. Wilbur Larch loved Homer Wells, he had never loved anyone as he loved that boy, and he could not imagine his own life at street clouds without Homer. But the doctor knew that Homer Wells had to encounter with society if the boy was going to choose his life. Larch dreamed that Homer would go out in the world and then choose to come back to street clouds. But who would choose such a thing? Maine had many towns, but there wasn't a place as charmless as street clouds. East of Cape Kenneth, the tourist trap, there was a pretty harbor town, the town of Hearts Haven. To the west of Hearts Haven there was another small town, the town of Hearts Rock. The people of Hearts Haven didn't like Hearts Rock, nearby Drinkwater Lake, and the summer cottages on its muddy shores. The lake was the only place where people from Hearts Rock could spend the summer. The summer camps and cottages on the lake shore were also used during the hunting season weekends in the fall. The lake was dirty. People didn't drink the water of Drinkwater Lake, and there were many jokes on that subject in Hearts Haven. Not all of Hearts Rock was so ugly. It was a town on quite open, neatly farmed land, it was fruit tree country. There were beautiful orchards. In 194, Ocean View Orchards, a big apple farm, on Drinkwater Road, which connected Hearts Rock to Hearts Haven was pretty and plentiful. The farmhouse had patios, there were rose bushes, the lawns spreading from the main house to the swimming pool were beautiful. The owner of Ocean View Orchards, Wallace Worthington, was from New York. He was not good at farming but he knew almost everything about money and had hired the right people to run Ocean View. They were the men who really knew apples. Worthington was a constant board member at the Haven Club. He was the only Hearts Rock resident who was a Haven Club member. Wallace Worthington employed half of the local people of Hearts Rock to work in his orchard so he was loved in both towns. Wallace would remind Wilbur Larch of someone who he met at the Channing Peabody's, where Dr. Larch went to perform his second abortion, the rich people's abortion, as Larch thought of it. To Homer Wells, Wallace Worthington would look like a real king of New England. Wallace Worthington's wife, Olive, looked like a queen but she had come from a miserable part of town. Olive Worthington grew up selling clams out of the back of a pickup truck. 
Her mother smoked a lot and died of lung cancer when Olive was still in high school. Cheerful Wallace Worthington was generous and kind. He adored Olive and everything about her, her gray eyes and her ash blonde hair, and her new British accent, which she had learned at college. Her brother, who was very successful as a well digger, had paid for Olive's education, and that was the reason why she tolerated his visits at Ocean View Orchards, when he walked around the house in his muddy boots. Wallace Worthington was a real gentleman, he was very kind to his workers he provided them with health insurance policies at his expense. But there was one problem, he seemed drunk all the time, so everyone in Hearts Haven and in Hearts Rock agreed that it was not easy to live with him. Yet no one doubted that Wallace Worthington was faithful to Olive. They had a son, who was twenty and one hundred ninety-four. The young man was as big and handsome and charming as his father, with his mother's grey eyes, he even had a bit of her new British accent. Wallace Worthington, Jr., was called Wally. From the day of Wally's birth, Wallace Worthington was called senior by everyone. If Dr. Larch spent some time around Senior Worthington, Larch might understand that the man was unfairly judged, of course, he drank too much. But Senior was not a drunk. He had the classic, clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, which were failure of memory, restlessness, hyperactivity and defective judgment. But the townspeople didn't know the difference between drunkenness and Alzheimer's disease. They misjudged Olive Worthington, too. She knew how to work. She saw, instantly, that Wallace Worthington was good about money but wasn't an expert in apples, and so she decided to help him. She found out who the knowledgeable foremen were and she paid them more money, she fired the others, and hired a younger, more reliable crew. She baked apple pies for the families of the workers who pleased her, and she taught their wives the recipe, too. She went to the university and learned how to plant a new tree orchard. She learned more about the new chemicals than the foreman knew, and then she taught them. She took the farm out of seniors' careless hands and she ran it very intelligently for him. There are things that the societies of towns know about you, and things that they don't see. Senior Worthington was puzzled by his own state, he also thought that it was the result of the evils of drink. When he drank less, and still couldn't remember in the morning what he'd said or done the evening before, still hopped from one activity to the next, leaving a jacket in one place, a hat in another, his car keys in the lost jacket, when he drank less and still behaved like a fool, this confused him so much that he began to drink more. He was a victim of both Alzheimer's disease and alcoholism. In this one respect, Hearts Haven and Hearts Rock were like street clouds, nothing could save Senior Worthington from what was wrong with him, and nothing could save Fuzzy Stone. In 193, 
Homer Wells began Gray's Anatomy, at the beginning. He began with a skeleton. He began with bones. In 194, he was making his third journey through Gray's Anatomy. Heart is a hollow muscular organ of conical form, enclosed in the cavity of the pericardium. Homer Wells could recite from Gray's Anatomy. By 194 Homer had looked at each of the hearts in the three dead bodies, or cadavers, that Dr. Larch had gotten for him. The cadavers were female which was necessary in the process of educating Homer Wells in obstetrical procedure. There was always a problem getting a body. Homer remembered the three cadavers very well. By the time he got the third body, he had developed enough of a sense of humor to give the body a name. He called her Clara after David Copperfield's mother, that poor, weak woman who was tyrannized by the terrible Mr. Murdstone. Body number two gave Homer the essential practice that prepared him for his first caesarean section. When Dr. Larch was at the railroad station arguing with the station master about the documents for the unfortunate Clara, Homer Wells was at Street Cloud studying body number two. He was going to consult his greys, but just then, Nurse Sedna rushed into the room with a scream. Oh, Homer! She cried, but she couldn't speak. Finally, she pointed Homer in the direction of the dispensary. He ran there as quickly as he could, and found a woman lying on the dispensary floor. Her eyes were staring wildly. Then the woman began to move, her face, which had been flushed turned a shiny blue-black, her heels struck the floor with such force that both her shoes flew off. Her mouth and chin were wet with froth. Eclampsia, Homer Wells said to Nurse Edna. Dr. Large is at the railroad station, Homer told Nurse Sedna calmly. Someone has to call him. You and Nurse Angela should stay to help me. When Nurse Sedna returned to the delivery room with Nurse Angela, Homer instructed the nurses to give morphine to the patient. Homer himself injected some magnesium sulfate into a vein to lower blood pressure at least temporarily. In the interval between her last and her next convulsion, he told Nurse Sedna and Nurse Angela to take the necessary tests. He asked the woman how many convulsions she had already suffered but she couldn't remember the number of convulsions. She only remembered their beginnings and their after effects. She also said she was expecting her baby in a month. The woman's stay was very dangerous. At the start of her next convulsion, Homer gave the woman a little ether, hoping to help her. But it didn't work though the woman's motion was slower. In the next interval, while the woman was still relaxed under the ether sedation, Homer examined the woman, labor hadn't begun. He was afraid to make the decision to start the operation, he wondered why Dr. Larch didn't come. 
an orphan had been told to find large at the railroad station, the boy returned and announced that Dr. Larch had boarded the train to Three Mile Falls, in order to follow the dead body that the station master had forwarded to the next stop. The station master had simply refused to accept the cadaver. Larch, in a rage, had taken the next train after it. Oh, oh, Nurse Edna said. Homer gave his patient her first dose of digitalis, which helped prevent the development of fluid in the lungs. While he waited with the woman for her next fit, he asked her if this was a baby that she wanted very much, or one that she didn't want. Do you mean it's going to die? The woman asked. Of course not. Homer said and smiled like Dr. Large. But he thought that the baby would die if he didn't deliver it soon, and the woman would die if he rushed the delivery. The woman said that she didn't want to keep the baby, but that she wanted the baby to live. Right, Homer said. You look very young, the woman said. I'm not going to die. Am I? She asked. No, you're not, said Homer Wells, using Dr. Larch's smile again. But in twelve hours, when the woman was suffering her seventh fit on the operating table, Homer Wells did not smile. He looked at Nurse Angela who was trying to help him hold the woman, and he said, I'm going to start her labor. I'm sure you know what's best, Homer, Nurse Angela said. Twelve more hours passed, the contractions started. Homer Wells could never remember the exact number of convulsions the woman had in that time. He was beginning to worry more about Dr. Larch than about the woman, and he had to fight with his fear in order to concentrate on his job. Ten hours later a boy was born, in good condition. The mother felt better very soon. There were no more fits, and her blood pressure returned to normal. In the evening, Wilbur Larch, together with the rescued cadaver, soon called Clara, returned tired and triumphant to street clouds. He had followed the body to Three Mile Falls, but the station master there had been so frightened that the body was not unloaded from the train, it had traveled further and Larch had traveled after it, arriving at the next, and at the next station. No one wanted Clara. And so Clara went from Three Mile Falls to Misery Gore, to Moxie Gore, to East Moxie and so on. Larch had a terrible row with the station master in Harmony, Maine where Clara had scared everyone before she had been sent further. That was my body. Larch screamed. It is for a student of medicine who is training with me in my hospital in St. Clouds. It's mine. Larch yelled. Why are you sending it in the wrong direction? Why are you sending it away from me? It came here, didn't it? The station master said. It wasn't taken at St. Clouds. 
the station master in St. Clouds is crazy. Larch shouted. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't, said the station master in harmony. All I know is, the body came here and I send it on. Idiots! Larch shouted, and took the train. In Cornville where the train didn't stop, Wilbur Larch screamed out the window at a couple of potato farmers who were waving at the train, Maine is full of morons. In Skohegan, he asked the station master where the body was going. Bath, I suppose, the Skohegan station master said. It came from Bath, and if nobody wants it at the other end, it's going back to Bath. I want it! Screamed Wilbur Larch. The body had been sent to the hospital in street clouds from the hospital in Bath, a woman had died there and the pathologist at Bath Memorial Hospital knew that Wilbur Larch was looking for a fresh female. Dr. Larch caught Clara in Augusta, where the station master simply saw that the body was going the wrong way. Of course it's going the wrong way. Wilbur Larch cried. The station master was surprised. Don't they speak English there? They don't hear English. Larch yelled. On the long ride back to Street Clouds with Clara, Dr. Larch didn't calm down. In each of the towns that offended him, he offered his opinions to the station masters while the train paused at the stations. Marinville, he told the station master in harmony. Tell me one thing which is harmonious here, one thing. Marinville. Larch shouted out the window as the train pulled away. Idiotsburg. To his great disappointment, when the train arrived in street clouds, the station master was not there. He's having lunch, someone told Dr. Large, but it was early evening. Do you mean supper? Dr. Large asked. Perhaps the station master doesn't know the difference, he said unkindly. He hired two men to bring Clara to the boys' division. He was surprised by the disorder in which Homer Wells had left body number two. Larch went shouting through the orphanage, looking for Homer. Here I am running after a new body for you, and you leave a mess like that. Homer. Dr. Larch yelled. God damn it, he muttered to himself, a teenager can't become an adult soon, a teenager can't accept adult responsibilities, he can't do an adult's job. He went muttering all over the boys' division, looking for Homer Wells, but Homer had been on Larch's bed in the dispensary and had fallen into the deepest sleep. He had been awake for nearly forty hours with the patient, delivering her and her child. Nurse Angela stopped Dr. Larch before he could find Homer Wells and wake him up. What's happening around here? Larch wanted to know. Is no one interested in where I've been? 
And why has that boy left the body looking like a war casualty? And Nurse Angela told him everything. Homer did this. Larch asked Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, he was reading the report, he had examined the mother, who was fine, and the baby boy, who was normal and healthy. He was almost as calm as you, Wilbur, Nurse Edna said. You can be proud of him. He is an angel, in my opinion. Nurse Angela said. He did everything just right, Nurse Sedna added. He was as sure as snow, Nurse Angela said. He did almost everything right, Wilbur Larch was thinking, it was amazing. Larch thought that it was a small error that Homer hadn't recorded the exact number of convulsions during the childbirth. It was minor criticism. But Wilbur Larch was a good teacher, Homer Wells had performed all the hard parts correctly, his procedure has been perfect. He's not even twenty, is he? Larch asked. But Nurse Sedna had gone to bed, she was exhausted. Nurse Angela was still awake, in her office, and when Dr. Larch asked her why the baby had not been named, she told Larch that it was Nurse Edna's turn and Nurse Edna had been too tired. Well, it doesn't matter said Wilbur Larch. You name it, then. But Nurse Angela had a better idea. It was Homer's baby, he had saved it, and the mother. Homer Wells should name this one, Nurse Angela said. Yes, you're right, he should, Dr. Larch replied, filling with pride in his wonderful creation. He had slept almost through the night. He woke only once on the dispensary bed, Larch was in the room probably looking at him, but Homer kept his eyes closed. He felt that Larch was there because of the sweet scent of ether and because of Larch's breathing. Then he felt Larch's hand, passing very lightly over his forehead. Homer Wells, not yet twenty years old and as knowledgeable as almost any doctor lay very still, pretending to sleep. Dr. Larch bent over him and kissed him, very lightly, on his lips. Homer heard Larch whisper, Good work, Homer. He felt a second, even lighter kiss. Good work, my boy, the doctor said, and then left him. Homer Wells felt his tears coming silently. He cried more than the last time when Fuzzy Stone had died and Homer had lied about Fuzzy to Snowy and the others. He cried and cried, but he didn't make a sound. He cried because he had received his first fatherly kisses. Of course, Melanie had kissed him, Nurse Edna and Nurse Angela had kissed him but they kissed everyone. Dr. Larch had never kissed him before, and now he had kissed him twice. Homer Wells cried because he'd never known how nice a father's kisses could be. Dr. Larch went to look at the eclampsia patient and at her tiny child. Then Larch went to the familiar typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, 
but he couldn't write anything. Oh God, thought Wilbur Larch, what will happen to me when Homer has to go? The next day Homer Wells gave names to body number three and his first orphan. He named the new body Clara, and the baby boy David Copperfield. It was an easy decision. Young Wally Worthington thought that he'd been in love twice before he was 20 years old, and once when he was 21, now, in 194 he was just three years older than Homer Wells, Wally fell deeply in love for the fourth time. He didn't know that this time would be for life. The girl, whom Wally loved, was a lobsterman's daughter. Her father, Raymond Kendall, wasn't an ordinary lobsterman, he was the best lobsterman. Other lobstermen watched him through binoculars. When he changed his mooring lines, they changed theirs. When he didn't go to sea but stayed at home, other lobstermen stayed home, too. But they couldn't match him. He was not just an artist with lobster, he also was an expert at fixing things, at keeping everything that anyone else would throw away. Raymond Kendall didn't like to introduce himself as a lobsterman, he was prouder of his qualities as a mechanic. There was a rumor that Kendall had more money than Senior Worthington, there was almost no evidence of his spending any, except on his daughter. Like the children of the Haven Club members, she went to a private boarding school, and Raymond Kendall paid a lot for a Haven Club membership, not for himself he went to the club only on request, to fix things but for his daughter, who'd learned to swim in the heated pool there, and who'd taken her tennis lessons on the same courts visited by young Wally Worthington. Kendall's daughter had her own car, too. It looked out of place in the Haven Club parking lot. It was a mishmash of the parts from other cars. It had a Ford symbol on its hood and a Chrysler emblem on the trunk, and the passenger side door was sealed completely shut. However, its battery never went dead in the Haven Club lot. Some of Raymond Kendall's fabulous money was paid him as salary by Olive Worthington, in addition to his lobstering. Ray Kendall looked after the vehicles and machinery of the Ocean View Orchards. Olive Worthington paid him a full foreman's salary because he knew almost as much about apples as he knew about lobsters and he was the best farms mechanic, but Ray refused to work more than two hours a day. Despite the fact that Ray Kendall worked two hours every day at Ocean View, he was never seen to eat an apple. His beautiful daughter, Candace, or Candy, was named after her mother, who had died in childbirth. She was a great and natural beauty, she was at once friendly and practical. She was well-mannered and energetic. Everyone liked her. Even Olive Worthington liked her, and Olive was suspicious of the girls who went out with Wally. She questioned what they wanted from him. She was afraid of girls who were more interested in the ocean view life than they were interested in Wally. Olive knew that Candy wasn't looking for money. In truth, 
Olive Worthington thought that Candy Kendall might be too good for her son. In her own bedroom, Candy kept the picture of her mother when her mother had been Candy's age. She looked just like Candy. The picture was taken the summer she met Trey, an older boy, strong and determined to fix everything. Candy had her mother's blondness, it was darker than Wally's blondness. She had her father's dark skin and dark brown eyes, and her father's height. Ray Kendall was a tall man. Candy Kendall and Wally Worthington fell in love with each other in the summer of 194. Everyone in Hearts Haven and in Hearts Rock thought that they were perfect for each other. Even grumpy Raymond Kendall approved. Ray thought that Wally wasn't lazy, and he could see that the boy was good-hearted. Ray also approved of Wally's mother. And Candy thought that Olive Worthington would be a perfect mother-in-law. It was understood that Wally would finish college first, and that Candy would finish college before they got married. However, there were possible causes for a change of plans. After all, it was 194, there was a war in Europe, there were many people who thought that America would be involved soon. But Olive had a mother's wish to keep war out of her mind. Wilbur Larch had the war in Europe very much in his mind. He had been in the last war, and he foresaw that if there was another war, Homer well could go to the army. But the good doctor had already taken some steps to save Homer Wells from going to a war. Larch was, after all, the historian of street clouds, he wrote the only records that were kept there, he wrote fiction, too. In the case of Fuzzy Stone and in the other, very few cases of orphans who had died Wilbur Larch hadn't liked the actual endings of those small lives. Wasn't it fair if Larch invented happy endings? In the case of the few who had died, Wilbur Larch made up a longer life for them. For example, the history of F. Stone was like the history that Wilbur Larch wished for Homer Wells. After Fuzzy's most successful adoption every member of the adoptive family was scrupulously described and successful treatment and cure of Fuzzy's respiratory disease, the young man got an education at Bowdoin College Wilbur Large's own alma mater and then studied medicine at Harvard Medical School following Large's footsteps to internships at the Boston Lying Inn. Large intended to make a devoted and skilled obstetrician out of Fuzzy Stone, the orphan's fictional history was as carefully done as everything Wilbur Large did. He had also made a slight modification in the history of Homer Wells. He was very pleased with himself for this slight fiction that he had so skillfully blended with the actual history of Homer Wells. Wilbur Larch had written about Homer Wells that the boy had a heart defect, a heart that was damaged and weakened from birth. Larch was thinking of war, the so-called war in Europe, Larch and many others, feared that the war wouldn't stay there. I'm sorry, Homer, 
Large imagined telling the boy. I don't want to worry you, but you have a bad heart, it just wouldn't stand up to a war. In fact, the doctor's own heart would never stand up to Homer Wells's going to war. In an earlier entry in the file on Homer Wells, an entry that Dr. Larch removed, he had written, I love nothing or no one as much as I love Homer Wells. Thus, Wilbur Larch was more prepared for how a war could change important plans than Olive Worthington was prepared for it. The other and more probable cause for a change in the wedding plans of her son and Candy Kendall, had been foreseen by Olive. It was an unwanted pregnancy. But it was not foreseen by either Candy or Wally. Thus, when Candy got pregnant, she and Wally were much upset, but they were also surprised. They simply couldn't believe it. They were not ashamed or unable to tell their parents, they were simply shocked by the prospect of destroying their perfect plans. We're not ready, are we? Candy said to Wally. Do you feel ready? I love you, Wally said. He was a brave boy, and true, and Candy loved him, too. But it's just not the right time for us, is it, Wally? Candy asked him. I want to marry you, any time, he said truthfully, but he added something that she hadn't thought of. He had thought of the war in Europe. He said, what if there's a war? What if what? Said Candy, truly shocked. I mean, if we were at war, I'd go, Wally said. Only, if there was a child, I couldn't go to a war. When would it be right to go to a war, Wally? Candy asked him. Well, I mean, I'd just have to go, that's all, if we had a war, he said. I mean, it's our country and besides, for the experience, I couldn't miss it. She slapped his face and started to cry, in a rage. For the experience. You'd want to go to war for the experience. Well, not if we had a child, Wally said. What about me? Candy asked, with or without a child, what would it be like for me if you went to a war? Well, it's all what if, isn't it? Wally asked. It's just something to think about, he added. I think we should try not to have the baby, Candy told him. But we need a real doctor, Wally said. Of course, she agreed. But are there any real doctors who do it? I haven't heard of them, Wally admitted. But Wally Worthington hoped to get advice about an abortionist. He knew that the archerdmen at Ocean View liked him and that they could be trusted to keep Wally's secret. He went first to the only bachelor on the archard crew, supposing that bachelors might have more use for abortionists than married men. Wally approached a member of the Apple crew named Derb Fowler, a man only a few years older than Wally. 
Herb Fowler's present girlfriend was younger than Herb, just a local girl, about Candy's age, her name was Louise Toby, and the men called her Squeeze Louise, which was okay with Herb. It was said that he had other girlfriends, and he always carried lots of condoms, at all times of the day and night, and when anyone said anything about sex, Herb Fowler reached into his pocket for a rubber and threw it at the speaker. He usually said, Do you see these? They keep a man free. Wally had already had several rubbers thrown at him, and he was tired of the joke, but he thought that Herb Fowler was the right sort of man to ask. Hey, Herb, Wally said to him. Yes, that's my name, Herb said. Herb, Wally said. If a girl is pregnant, what should one do about it? Herb Fowler disappointed Wally. All he knew was something suspicious about a butcher, and five hundred dollars. Maybe Meanie Hyde knows about it, Herb added. Why don't you ask Meanie? Herb Fowler smiled at Wally. Meanie Hyde was a nice man. He'd grown up with a lot of older brothers who beat him. His brothers called him Meanie, probably just to confuse him. Meanie was friendly, he had a friendly wife, Florence. There had been so many children that Wally couldn't remember all their names, or tell one from the other, and so he didn't think that Meanie Hyde even knew what an abortion was. Meanie listens to everything, Herb Fowler told Wally. So Wally went to find Meanie Hyde. Meanie was waxing the press boards for the cider press. Wally watched Meanie Hyde waxing. Say, Meanie, Wally said, after a while. I thought that you forgot my name, Meanie said cheerfully. Meanie, what do you know about abortion? Wally asked. I know it's a sin, Meanie Hyde said, and I know that Grace Lynch has had an abortion, and in her case, I sympathize with her, if you know what I mean. Grace Lynch was Vernon Lynch's wife, Wally, and everyone else, knew that Vernon beat her. They had no children. Who needs an abortion? Wally? Meanie Hyde asked. A friend of a friend, Wally said. That's a shame, Wally, Meanie said. I think you should speak to Grace about it, just don't speak to her when Vernon's around. And don't tell Grace I told you to ask her. So Wally went looking for Grace Lynch. Grace was cleaning one of the shelves of the pie oven when Wally found her, he startled her, and Grace made a little cry and banged one of her elbows against the oven. I am sorry that I scared you, Grace, Wally said. I've got a problem. She stared at him as if this news frightened her more than anything anyone had ever told her. She looked quickly away and said, I'm cleaning the oven. Wally suddenly realized that all his secrets were entirely safe with Grace Lynch. Candy is pregnant, 
Wally said. She looked at Wally again with her eyes as round as a rabbit's. I need advice. Please just tell me what you know, Grace, Wally said. St. Clouds, she whispered. Wally thought that it was someone's name, the name of a saint? Or was it a nickname for an evil abortionist, Street Clouds? I don't know the doctor's name, Grace said, not looking at Wally. The place is called St. Clouds, and the doctor's good, she whispered. But don't let her go alone, okay, Wally? Grace said. No, I won't let her go alone, of course, Wally promised her. You will ask for the orphanage when you get off the train, Grace said. She climbed back in the oven before he could thank her. Grace Lynch had gone to street clouds alone. Vernon hadn't even known she was going. Grace had arrived in the early evening, just after dark. She'd been so nervous that Dr. Large's sedation had not affected her very much and she'd been awake during the night. There had been no complications. There had never been any serious complications following any abortion Dr. Large had ever performed. But still Grace Lynch hated to think of street clouds. It was because of the atmosphere of the place in the long night she'd stayed awake. The disturbed river smelled like death, the cries of the babies were frightening, there was a sound of a machine the typewriter. That night Wally sat on Ray Kendall's dock with Candy and told her what he knew about street clouds. I knew it was an orphanage, Candy said. That's all I knew. It was clear to them both that they couldn't explain their absence during the night, so Wally arranged to borrow Senior's Cadillac, so that they could leave very early in the morning and return in the evening of the same day. Wally told Senior it was the best time of year to explore the coast. I know it's a work day, Wally told Olive. But it's only one day off, Mom. It's just to have a little journey with Candy. Ray Kendall knew that Candy would be happy to take a drive with Wally. Wally was a good driver, and the Cadillac was a safe car. The night before their trip, Candy and Wally went to bed early, but each of them was awake through the night. Wally worried that an abortion would make Candy unhappy or even uncomfortable with sex. Candy wondered if Wally would love her after all this was over. That same night Wilbur Large and Homer Wells weren't sleeping either. Large sat at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, through the window, he saw Homer Wells walking around outside, with an oil lamp in the darkness. What is the matter now? Large wondered, and went to see what Homer was doing. I couldn't sleep, Homer told Larch. What is it this time? Dr. Larch asked Homer. Maybe it's just a owl, said Homer Wells. The wind was strong, which was unusual for street clouds. When the wind blew out the lamp, 
The doctor and his assistant saw the light shining from the window of Nurse Angela's office. It was the only light for miles around, and it made their shadows gigantic. Larch's shadow reached the black woods. Homer Wells's shadow touched the dark sky. Only then, both men noticed, Homer had grown taller than Dr. Larch. Larch spread his arms so that his shadow looked like a magician. Larch flapped his arms like a big bat. Look, he said to Homer. I'm a wizard. Homer Wells, the wizard's apprentice, flapped his arms, too. The wind was very strong and fresh. The stars shone bright and cold. Feel that wind, said Homer Wells. Maybe the wind didn't let them sleep. It's a wind coming from the coast, Wilbur Larch said. It was a rare sea breeze, Larch was sure. Wherever it's from, it's nice, Homer Wells decided. Both men stood sniffing the wind. Each man thought. What is going to happen to me? Chapter 5 Before this morning, Homer Wells had not had an occasion to think about the soul. A study of the soul had not been a part of his training. Dr. Larch had asked Homer to prepare a fetus for an autopsy. A woman had been stabbed or she had stabbed herself, the pregnancy of the woman was nearly full term. Dr. Larch had attempted to rescue the child but the child, or, rather, the embryo, nearly nine months, had also been stabbed. Like its mother, the baby the boy had died. Dr. Larch had asked Homer to help him determine the cause of death. Homer cut the little body. He had never looked inside a fetus before. What was the life of the embryo but a history of development? Homer turned to the section in Gray's devoted to the embryo. It was a shock for him to remember that the book did not begin with the embryo, it ended with it. The embryo was the last thing, which was considered. In Gray's Homer saw the profile view of the head of a human embryo at 27 days old. It didn't look like human, it had a face of a fish. But in eight weeks the fetus has a nose and a mouth. It has an expression, thought Homer Wells. And with this discovery, that a fetus has an expression, Homer Wells felt the presence of a soul. He put the little dead body in a white enamel examining tray. The tiny fingers of its hands were slightly open. The color of the dead baby was gray. Homer turned to the sink and vomited in it. When he turned on water to clean the sink, the old pipes vibrated and howled. He thought that the room was trembling because of the pipes. He wasn't thinking about the wind from the coast, how strong it was. Homer wasn't blaming Dr. Larch. If Wilbur Larch was a saint to nurse Angela and to nurse Sedna, he was both a saint and a father to Homer Wells. Larch knew what he was doing, and for whom. 
However, Homer had his own opinion. You can call it a fetus, or an embryo, thought Homer Wells, but it's alive. And if you perform an abortion, you kill it. He looked at the little dead body. If it's a fetus to Dr. Large, that's fine. But it's a baby to me, thought Homer Wells. If Larch has a choice, I have a choice, too. He picked up the tray and carried it into the hall, like a proud waiter carrying a special dish to a favorite guest. Soon Homer was at the door of Nurse Angela's office, which was open. He could see Dr. Larch at the typewriter. The doctor wasn't writing, there wasn't even any paper in the machine. Dr. Larch was just looking out the window. The state of a dream was so clear on Wilbur Larch's face that Homer Wells paused in the doorway, he almost turned around and took the baby away with him. Homer hesitated. Then he stepped forward and put the metal tray on top of the typewriter. Dr. Larch? Homer Wells said. Larch looked away from his dream, he stared over the baby at Homer. The source of the bleeding was the pulmonary artery, which was slashed, as you see, Homer said. As Larch looked down at the baby. Goddamn! said Wilbur Larch, staring at the artery. I have to tell you that I won't perform an abortion, not ever, Homer Wells said. This followed, logically, from the severed artery, in Homer's mind, it followed. But Dr. Larch looked confused. You won't? Larch said. You what? Homer Wells and Dr. Larch just stared at each other, the baby was between them. Not ever, Homer Wells said. Do you disapprove? Dr. Larch asked Homer. I don't disapprove of you, Homer Wells said. I disapprove of it, it's not for me. Well, I've never forced you, Dr. Larch said. And I never will. It's all your choice. Right, said Homer Wells. And if it's all the same to you, Homer Wells said to him, I'd like permission to not be there, when you do what you have to do. I want to be of use in any other way, and I'm not disapproving of you, Homer said. If it's okay, I just don't want to watch it. I'll have to think about that. Homer, Dr. Large said. For the last three hours, Candy Kindle and Wally Worthington had maintained an awkward silence. It had still been dark when they left the coast at Hearts Haven and went inland, away from the wind, although the wind was still surprisingly strong. Candy's honey blonde hair was all around her face. Wally glanced at the unread book in Candy's lap. The book was Little Door at One by Charles Dickens. It was required summer reading for all the girls in Candy's class. Candy had begun it four or five times but she had no idea what the book was about. Wally, who was no reader, 
didn't notice the name of the book, he just watched the same page and thought about candy. He was also thinking about street clouds. He was already in his mind through the abortion, Candy was recovering nicely, the doctor was telling jokes, all the nurses were laughing. There were enough nurses to win a war, in Wally's imagination. All of them were young and pretty. And the orphans were amusing children. In the trunk of Senior Worthington's Cadillac, Wally had three apple boxes full of sweets for the orphans. In the spring, there weren't any fresh apples, and there wasn't any cider, but Wally had loaded the Cadillac with jars of jelly and honey. Candy closed her book and returned it to her lap again and Wally felt he had to say something. How's the book? He said. I don't know, Candy said, and laughed. Soon they were in street clouds. Little Dora dropped from Candy's lap. Please, Wally whispered to her, you don't have to do this. You can have the baby. I want the baby, I want your baby. It would be fine. We can just turn around, he begged her. But she said, no, Wally. It's not the time for us to have a baby. She put her face down. The car stood still. Are you sure? Wally whispered to her. You don't have to. But Candy Kendall was more practical than Wally Worthington, and she had her father's stubbornness. Mrs. Grogan, across the road in the girls' division entrance, observed the Cadillac. There was a small crowd around the Cadillac. The trunk was open and the handsome young man was giving presents to the orphans. Sorry it's not the season for apples, kids, Wally was saying. Or cider. You could all use a little cider. He said cheerfully. Handing out the jars of honey and jelly. A boy named Smokey Fields had opened his jar of apple cider jelly and was eating it out of the jar with his hand. It's really good on toast, in the morning, Wally said cautiously, but Smokey Fields stared at Wally in surprise. Smokey Fields intended to finish the jar of jelly on the spot. A girl called Mary Agnes dropped a jar of the apple jelly at Candy's feet. Oops, Candy said, bending to pick up the jelly for her. When she stood up and handed the girl her jar of jelly, Candy felt a little dizzy. Some adults were coming out of the hospital entrance, and their presence helped Candy compose herself. I've not come here to play with children, she thought. I'm Dr. Large, the old man was saying to Wally, who looked shocked by the determination with which Smokey Fields was eating the jelly. Wally Worthington, Wally said, shaking Dr. Large's hand, handing him a jar of honey. It's fresh from Ocean View Orchards. That's in Hearts Rock, but we're very near the coast, we're in Hearts Haven, almost. Hello, 
Candy said to Homer because he was the tallest person, he was as tall as Wally. I'm Candy Kindle, she said to him. And do you work here? Or are you one of? Was it polite to say them, she wondered. Not exactly, Homer mumbled, thinking, I work here, in exactly, and I am in exactly one of them. His name's Homer Wells, a boy told Candy. He's too old to adopt. I can see that. Candy said, feeling shy. I should talk to the doctor, she thought. I'm in the apple business, Wally was saying to Dr. Larch. It's my father's business. Actually, he added, my mother's business. What does this fool want? Thought Wilbur Larch. Oh, I love apples. Nurse Edna said. You should have your own apples, Wally said. Look at that hill, he said. You ought to plant it. I could even get you the trees. In six or seven years, you'd have your own apples, you'd have apples for more than a hundred years. What do I want with a hundred years of apples? Thought Wilbur Larch. Wouldn't that be pretty, Wilbur? Nurse Edna asked. And you could get your own cider press, Wally suggested. Give the kids fresh apples and fresh cider, they'd have lots to do. They don't need things to do, thought Dr. Larch, they need places to go. They're from some charity, thought Nurse Angela cautiously. They're too young to give their money away, thought Wilbur Larch. Bees. Wally was saying. You should keep bees, too. It's fascinating for the kids, and a lot safer than most people think. Have your own honey, and give the kids an education, bees are a model society, a lesson in teamwork. Oh shut up, Wally, Candy was thinking. Dr. Larch looked around at the children stuffing themselves with honey and jelly. Have they come here to play with the orphans for a day and to make everyone sick, he wondered. Candy felt helpless, no one understood why she was standing there. Then Homer Wells looked at her, their eyes met. Candy thought that he had seen her many times before, that he'd watched how she grew up, had seen her naked. It was shocking to Homer he had already fallen in love with Candy to see in her eyes an unwanted pregnancy. I think you'd be more comfortable inside, he murmured to her. Yes, thank you. Candy said, not able to look in his eyes now. Large saw the girl walking toward the hospital entrance and thought suddenly, Oh, it's just another abortion, that's all. He turned to follow the girl and Homer, just as Smokey Fields finished the jar of jelly and began to eat a jar of honey. Homer led the way to Nurse Angela's office, at the threshold, he saw the dead baby's hands reaching above the edge of the white tray, 
which was still a nurse Angeles typewriter. Homer's reflexes were quick enough, he pushed Candy back into the hall. This is Dr. Large, Homer said to Candy, introducing them on the way to the dispensary. Wilbur Large did not remember that there was a dead baby on top of the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office. I'll deliver the woman from Damaris Cotta, Homer said in a low voice to Dr. Large. Well, don't hurry, Large, answered. I mean I won't help this one, Homer whispered looking at Candy. I won't even look at her, do you understand? Dr. Large looked at the young woman. He thought he understood, a little. She was a very pretty young woman, even Dr. Large could see that, and he'd not seen Homer so excited before. Homer thinks he's in love, thought Dr. Large. Or he thinks that he'd like to be. Have I been very insensitive? Large wondered. Wally introduced himself to Homer Wells. If I could have just a moment's peace with Miss Kendall, said Wilbur Large. We can all meet each other another time. Edna will assist me with Miss Kendall, please, and Angela, would you help Homer with the Damaris Cotta woman? Homer, Dr. Large explained to Wally and to Candy, is an excellent midwife. You are? Wally said to Homer enthusiastically. Wow. Homer Wells maintained silence. Nurse Angela touched Homer's arm very gently and said to him, I'll help you. Please do it, then, Dr. Large said. If I could just have a moment alone with Miss Kendall, he repeated, but he saw that Homer was unaware that he was staring at Candy. If I could just explain a little of the process to Miss Kendall, Wilbur Large said to Wally it was hopeless to address Homer. I'd like her to know about the bleeding, later, for example, Large chatted. Is someone going to cut her? He asked Homer pathetically. Homer caught Wally's arm and pulled him abruptly away. He got him outdoors so quickly that Wally didn't throw up until the two of them were behind the boys' division. The two young men walked up and down and across the hill. Homer, politely, explained the procedure that Candy would undergo, but Wally wanted to talk about apple trees. This hill is perfect for your garden, Wally said. If she's in the first three months, Homer noted, there is no need to cut. I'd recommend different sorts of apple trees, Wally said. There will be some bleeding, we call it spotting, actually, because it's usually not very heavy bleeding, Homer told Wally, Dr. Larch knows how to use ether, so don't worry, she won't feel a thing. Of course, she'll feel something afterward, admitted Homer. Dr. Large calls that psychological discomfort. You could come back to the coast with us, Wally told Homer. We could load a truck full of baby trees, 
and in a day or two we could come back here and plant the orchard together. It wouldn't take too long. It's a deal, said Homer Wells. The coast, he thought. I want to see the coast. And the girl. I want to ride in that car with that girl. A midwife, Wally said. Are you going to be a doctor? I don't think so, said Homer Wells. I don't know yet. Well, apples are my family's business, Wally said. I'm going to college, but I really don't know why I bother. College, thought Homer Wells. Candy's father is a lobsterman, Wally explained, but she's going to go to college, too. Lobster, thought Homer Wells. The bottom of the sea. From the bottom of the hill, Nurse Angela was waving to them. The woman is ready. She called to Homer Wells. I have to deliver someone's baby, Homer told Wally. Wally didn't want to leave the hill. I think I'll stay up here. I don't think I want to hear anything, he added, he gave Homer a smile. Oh, there's not much noise, Homer said, he wasn't thinking of the Damaris Cotta woman, he was thinking of Candy. He left Wally on the hill and went toward Nurse Angela, he looked back at Wally once and waved. Wally was his age and his size. They were the same height, although Wally was more muscular, from sports, Dr. Large had guessed. He has the body of a hero, Dr. Large thought, remembering the heroes he had tried to help in France, in World War I. Lean but well muscled. That was a hero's body, and full of holes, thought Wilbur Larch. He didn't know why Wally's body reminded him of this. Wilbur Larch was thinking about Wally's face. It was handsome in a finer way than Homer's face, which was also handsome. Although Wally's body was stronger, his bones were more delicate. There wasn't a trace of anger in Wally's eyes, they were the eyes of good intentions. He had the body of a hero, and the face dot 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 the face of a benefactor. Concluded Wilbur Large, performing an abortion on candy. The beauty in her face. Larch thought, was like she was free of guilt. It surprised Larch. Wally is a benefactor, thought Wilbur Larch. Homer has met his benefactor. Homer Wells was thinking about the same. I have met a prince of Maine, he was thinking. I have seen a king of New England, and I am invited to his castle. I am going to the coast. Thought Homer Wells. Push, he said to the woman from Damariscotta. Is Damariscotta on the coast? He asked the woman, who held Nurse Angela's hand in a grip. Near it. The woman cried, and shoved her child forth into street clouds, 
Its head was captured perfectly in the palm of Homer's confident right hand. His left hand lifted the baby's bottom as he guided the baby outdoors as Dr. Larch usually said, it was a boy. Homer decided to name him Stareforth. The baby was his second solo delivery. Homer cut the cord and smiled to hear young Steerforth's healthy cry. Candy, coming out of ether, heard the baby's cries and shuddered, she felt some guilt. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked in a low voice. Only Nurse Edna heard her. Why is it crying? Candy asked. It was nothing, dear, Nurse Edna said. It's all over. I would like to have a baby, one day, Candy said. I really would. Why, of course, dear, Nurse Edna told her. You can have as many as you want. You will have princes of Maine. Dr. Large told Candy suddenly. You will have kings of New England. Wilbur Large listened to the cries of the Damaris Cotta woman's baby and thought that he mustn't be selfish, he must encourage Homer to make friends with this young couple. And people will always eat apples, he thought, it must be a nice life. A few minutes later Homer and Dr. Larch were talking. Dr. Larch was examining the baby that Homer Wells had delivered, young Stareforth. But they weren't talking about Stareforth. Wally said it would take just a couple of days, Homer Wells was saying. We'll have to load a truck, I guess. There's going to be 40 trees. And I'd like to see the coast. Of course, you should go, Homer, it's a great opportunity, Dr. Large said. I will be away just two days, Homer Wells said. Wilbur Larch shook his head. Maybe just two days, Homer, Dr. Larch said. You should be prepared to take advantage of the situation. And just two days are not enough. Homer stared at Dr. Larch. If this young couple likes you, Homer, and if you like them dot 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 well, Larch said, I think you'll be meeting their parents, too, and if their parents like you dot 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 well, said Dr. Larch, I think you should try to make their parents like you. He wasn't looking at Homer, who was staring at him. I think we both know it would do you good to get away for more than two days, Homer, Dr. Large said. You understand, I'm not talking about an adoption, I'm talking about the possibility of a summer job, for a start. Someone might invite you to stay away for more than two days, that's all I'm saying. Dr. Larch looked at Homer, they stared at each other. Right, Homer finally said. Of course, you might want to come back in two days. Larch said heartily, but they looked away from each other as they chose to look away from the possibility of that. In which case, Larch said, you know you're always welcome here. 
he left the room, and Homer with the baby. He left too quickly, again, for Homer to say how much he loved him. Then Wilbur Larch took Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna into the dispensary. Perhaps the etherized atmosphere of the dispensary helped Wilbur Larch say to his loyal nurses what he needed to say. I want to give Homer as much money as we can, said Wilbur Larch. I want to give him some decent clothes, too. Just for two days, Wilbur? Nurse Edna asked. How much money does the boy need for two days? Nurse Angela asked. It's an opportunity for him, don't you see? Dr. Larch asked. I don't think he'll be back here in two days. I hope he doesn't come back. At least, not so soon, said Wilbur Larch and remembered the story of Homer's weak heart. How could he tell him? Where and when? He crossed the hall to see how Candy was coming along. He knew that she and Wally wanted to leave as soon as possible, they had a long drive ahead of them. And if Homer Wells is leaving me, thought Wilbur Larch, he'd better leave me in a hurry. Homer had to leave in a hurry, now, because Dr. Larch needed to see if he would ever get over it. I don't think so, he thought. You're doing just fine, Dr. Larch told Candy. He was about to tell her that Homer could advise her about any cramps she suffered, but he wanted to leave Homer free of that responsibility. They're taking you? Curly Day asked Homer, when Curly saw Homer packing. They don't want to adopt me, Curly, said Homer Wells. I'll be back in just two days. They're taking you. Said Curly Day, his face looked so stricken that Homer had to turn away. Dr. Larch understood the power of information that is received indirectly. For that reason, he told Candy and Wally about Homer's weak heart. I've never let him go before, not even for just two days, without saying just a little about his condition, Dr. Larch told Candy and Wally. A wonderful word, condition. The effect of the word in a doctor's mouth is truly astonishing. Candy forgot that she just had an abortion. The color came back to Wally's face. It's his heart, said Wilbur Larch. I've not told him about it because I haven't wanted to worry him, Dr. Larch said to these two good-hearted people, who gave him their full attention. He shouldn't do anything too strenuous and he shouldn't worry said Wilbur Larch, who had created a perfect history for someone who simply needed to stay out of danger. Larch had given his favorite orphan a history that would keep him safe. Homer Wells, at the moment, couldn't make up anything that would be soothing to Curly Day who buried himself under several pillows and a blanket and sobbed. What do you need to be adopted for? Curly cried. You're practically a doctor. 
It's just for two days, Homer Wells repeated, with each repetition, his promise sounded less and less convincing. They're taking you. I can believe it. Cried Curly Day. Nurse Angela came and sat beside Homer on Curly's bed. Together they looked at the sobbing heap under the blanket. It's just for two days, Curly, Nurse Angela said weakly. Dr. Large said that Homer was here to protect us. Curly cried. You're not the best one, Homer. Curly cried, under the blanket. Right, Homer said, he tried to pat Curly, but Curly stiffened and held his breath. I'll see you, Curly, Homer said. Traitor! Cried Curly Day. Homer left Curly with Nurse Angela and went to the operating room to clean the table. He knocked before he entered the operating room, where Candy had dressed herself, with Wally's help. You can relax now, said Homer Wells, not quite able to look at Candy's face. Maybe you'd like some fresh air. Then he added to Candy, You're feeling all right, aren't you? Oh, yes, she said and smiled reassuringly at Wally. Just then, Dr. Large came in. You two should get some fresh air, he said to Wally and Candy who took his suggestion for a command. They left the operating room. Homer Wells gave the operating table a thorough inspection, a final examination, a last look. He once more counted the money Dr. Large had given him. There was almost fifty dollars. He went to the boys' sleeping room. Nurse Angela was sitting there on the bed. She kissed Homer, Homer kissed her, and left her without a word. Nurse Edna went outside to see what the young people were doing. Wally was peering under the hood of the car and Candy was resting in the Cadillac's spacious back seat. The convertible top was down. Nurse Edna bent over Candy and whispered to her, You're as pretty as a picture. Candy smiled warmly. Nurse Edna could see how exhausted the girl was. Listen, dear. Nurse Edna, said to her. Don't be shy, Nurse Edna, said to her confidentially, if you have any peculiar cramps, speak to Homer about it. Promise me you won't be shy about it, dear, Nurse Edna said. I promise, Candy said, blushing. Melanie was struggling to inscribe the copy of Little Dorrit, which she had stolen for Homer when she heard Mary Agnes Cork throwing up in the bathroom. Shut up! Melanie called, but Mary Agnes went on retching. She'd eaten two jars of apple cider jelly and one jar of honey. Smoky Fields had already thrown up. He'd eaten all his jars and a jar belonging to one of the little Walshes. He lay miserably in his bed. To Homer Wells for the promise, 
You made me Melanie wrote. Love, Melanie Melanie added. Homer Wells walked into the operating room to say goodbye to Wilbur Larch. I love you, said Homer Wells. He knew he had to leave the room, and so he started to leave. I love you, too, Homer, said Wilbur Larch. He heard Homer say right, before he heard the door close. Right, Wilbur Larch repeated to himself. Outside, Homer Wells stuck his bag in the cattle X trunk, smiled at Candy in the back seat, helped while he raised the convertible's top. See you in two days. Nurse Edna said to Homer, too loudly. Two days, Homer repeated, too quietly. She pecked his cheek, he patted her arm. Nurse Edna then turned and walked to the hospital entrance. When she was inside the hospital, Nurse Edna went directly to the dispensary and threw herself on the bed. Dr. Large sat in his usual place, at the typewriter, the fetus displayed by Homer Wells didn't disturb him at all. Busy work, busy work, give me busy work, thought Wilbur Large. Just before night fell, he leaned forward in his chair enough to turn on the desk lamp. Then he settled back in the chair in which he had spent so many evenings. It was not yet dark but he could hear an owl outside, very distinctly. When it was still light, Melanie looked out her window and saw the cattle at pass and Melanie recognized Homer Wells in the passenger seat. Melanie knew that his promise was broken. She saw the beautiful girl with the long legs in the back seat of the car, and she had a longer, better look at the profile of Homer Wells. When she closed the stolen copy of Little Dorrit, the ink was still wet and her inscription was smudged. She threw the book against the wall. Melanie went straight to bed without her dinner. Mrs. Grogan went to Melanie's bed and felt her forehead, which was feverish, but Mrs. Grogan could not persuade Melanie to drink anything. All Melanie said was, he broke his promise. Later, she said, Homer Wells has left St. Cloud's. You have a little temperature, dear, said Mrs. Grogan, but when Homer Wells didn't come to read Jane Eyre aloud that evening, Mrs. Grogan started paying closer attention. She allowed Melanie to read to the girls that evening, Melanie's voice was passionless. Melanie's reading from Jane Eyre depressed Mrs. Grogan. Nurse Angela had hardly any more success, reading aloud to the boys' division from Dickens. Discancy in long description was too tiring for her and soon she saw that the boys were losing interest. Nurse Edna had to give the nightly benediction instead of Dr. Larch. He refused to leave Nurse Angela's office, he said he was listening to an owl, and he wanted to keep listening. Nurse Edna felt extremely uncomfortable with the benediction, which she'd never fully understood. She took it for a kind of private joke between Dr. Large and the universe. 
Good night, princes of Maine, kings of New England. Nurse Edna peeped. Where is Homer? Several voices whispered. Nurse Edna, extremely agitated by Dr. Larch's behavior, went to Nurse Angela's office. She was going to walk in and tell Dr. Larch that he should give himself some ether and then get a good night's sleep. But Nurse Sedna got shyer as she approached the light shining from the office. Dr. Larch was sitting at the typewriter, unmoving. He was composing in his mind the first of many letters he was going to write to Homer Wells. He was attempting to calm his thoughts. Please be healthy, please be happy, please be careful, Wilbur Larch was thinking. Chapter 6 For the first two weeks after Homer Wells had left Street Clouds, Wilbur Larch didn't answer the mail. Nurse Angela struggled with the longer sentences of Charles Dickens, and the boys listened to her every word, anticipating the errors. Mrs. Grogan suffered because of Melanie's interpretation of Charlotte Bronte. Near the end of Chapter 27, Mrs. Grogan could detect Jane Eyre's spirit in Melanie's voice. I care for myself, Melanie Reed. The more solitary, the more friendless I am, the more I will respect myself. Please be a good girl, thought Mrs. Grogan. She told Dr. Larch that Melanie should be encouraged, she should be given more responsibility. Nurse Angela said that she wanted to stop reading Dickens. Dr. Larch surprised them all. When Homer Wells had been gone for three weeks, Dr. Larch announced that he didn't care who read what to whom. He didn't care about the benediction, and so Nurse Edna had to continue the nightly salutation to the imagined princes of Maine, the dear little kings of New England. Melanie started reading Dickens to the boys. Her voice was too flat for Dickens, she made no mistakes but she presented sunshine with the same heavy speech she used for gloom and fog. Mrs. Grogan, who accompanied Melanie and listened to her reading, saw that Melanie was searching through Dickens for specific characteristics of Homer Wells. The boys were terrified of Melanie and their fears made them pay more attention to her than they had ever paid to Homer Wells. The little boys, lying frightened in their beds, felt that they were in Melanie's control. Nurse Edna suggested that nightmares in the boys' division were caused by Melanie's reading and that she should be removed from her responsibilities as reader. Nurse Angela disagreed. Mrs. Grogan was in favor of increasing Melanie's responsibilities, she felt that the girl was at the threshold of a change, she might either rise above her own bitterness or descend more deeply into it. Nurse Angela suggested to Dr. Larch that Melanie might be of use. Of more use, you mean? Dr. Larch asked. Right, Nurse Angela said, but Dr. Larch didn't like it when the speech habits of Homer Wells were imitated. He gave Nurse Angela such a look that she never said right again. 
He also didn't want to teach Melanie, he didn't want her to replace Homer. I don't have the patience to work with a teenager, anymore, Lart said peevishly. I think Melanie is 24 or 25, Mrs. Grogan said. How could someone of that age still be in an orphanage? Larch wondered. The same way that I can still be here, he answered himself. All right. Let's ask her if she's interested, Larch said. He was afraid of the meeting with Melanie, he blamed her for Homer's rebellion. Larch knew he was unfair, and this made him feel guilty, he began to answer the mail. There was a long letter from Olive Worthington, and a check, a big donation to the orphanage. Mrs. Worthington said that her son had been delighted by the good work at Street Clouds and she was happy that he'd brought one of Dr. Larch's boys home with him. It was fine with the Worthingtons that Homer stay for the summer. Olive Worthington wanted Larch to know that she and her husband thought that Homer was a fine boy polite and a good worker. She concluded that she hoped that Wally could even learn the value of a day's work from Homer. Olive also wrote that Homer had requested to be paid in the form of a monthly donation to Street Clouds. Since he shared a room with Wally and could fit into Wally's clothes, and since he ate his meals with the Worthington family, Olive said the boy's expenses were minimal. She was delighted that her son had such honorable company for the summer, and she was pleased to contribute to the comfort of the orphans of Street Clouds. Wally and Candy tell me you are doing great things there. They're so happy that they met you, wrote Olive. Wilbur Larch could inform Olive Worthington that she had a talented obstetrician caring for her apple trees, but he calmed himself and composed a warm, though formal, letter in response to Mrs. Worthington. Her donation was very gratefully received and he was glad that Homer Wells was representing his upbringing at Street Clouds in such a positive manner. Also, that it would be nice if Homer would write. Dr. Larch was glad that there was a healthy summer job for Homer, they would miss the boy at Street Clouds, where he had always been of use, but Larch was happy for Homer. He congratulated Olive Worthington on the good manners and the generosity of her son. He said he would welcome Wally and Candy back at Street Clouds, any time. Then Wilbur Larch wrote the most important part of the letter. There is one thing I must tell you about Homer Wells, Larch wrote. There is a problem with his heart, the doctor continued. He was more careful than he'd been when he discussed Homer's heart defect with Wally and Candy. His letter to Olive Worthington about Homer's heart was a kind of a warm-up exercise. He wanted Homer treated with kid gloves, as they say in Maine. Olive Worthington had mentioned that Homer was taking driving lessons from Wally and swimming lessons from Candy. The swimming lessons from that girl made Larch growl, 
and he concluded his advice about Homer's heart with the suggestion that Homer should take it easy with the swimming. Dr. Larch did not share Olive Worthington's opinion that every boy should know how to drive and swim, Dr. Larch could do neither. Here in Street Clouds, he wrote, to himself, it is necessary to have good obstetrical procedure. In other parts of the world, they learn how to drive and swim. He showed Olive Worthington's letter to Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, who both wept over it. They thought that Mrs. Worthington sounded charming and warm and intelligent, but Larch grumbled how it was strange that Mr. Worthington was so little in view, what was the matter with him? Why is his wife running the farm? Larch asked his nurses, who both scolded him for his readiness to assume there was something wrong when a woman was in charge of anything. They reminded him that he had an appointment with Melanie. Melanie prepared for her meeting with Dr. Larch. She was lying in her bed and reading over and over again the inscription she had written in the stolen copy of Little Dorrit, to Homer Wells for the promise you made me love, Melanie. Then she tried, again and again, to begin the book through her angry tears. She read, got lost, began again, got lost again. She grew angrier and angrier. Then she looked in her canvas bag of toilet articles and saw that the burette, which Mary Agnes had stolen from Candy, and which Melanie had snatched out of Mary Agnes's hair and taken for herself, had been stolen again. She went to Mary Agnes Cork's bed and found the elegant barrette under Mary Agnes's pillow. Melanie's hair was cut too short for her to use the barrette. Besides, she was not exactly sure how to use it. So she put it into her jeans pocket. This was uncomfortable because her jeans were very tight. She went into the girls' shower room, where Mary Agnes Cork was washing her hair, and she turned the hot water up so hot that Mary Agnes was nearly scalded. Mary Agnes jumped out of the shower, she lay on the floor, where Melanie twisted her arm behind her back and then stepped with all her weight on Mary Agnes's shoulder. Melanie didn't mean to break anything, but she heard the sound of Mary Agnes's collarbone cracking. Melanie stepped quickly away from the younger girl, whose naked body turned from very red to very white. She lay on the shower room floor, not daring to move. Get dressed and I'll take you to the hospital, Melanie said. You broke something. Mary Agnes trembled. I can't move, she whispered. I didn't mean to, Melanie said, but I told you not to touch my things. Your hair's too short, Mary Agnes said. You can't wear it, anyway. Do you want me to break something else? Melanie asked the girl. Mary Agnes tried to shake her head, but she stopped. I can't move, she repeated. When Melanie bent over to help her up, Mary Agnes screamed. Don't touch me. Do what you want, 
Melanie said, leaving her there. Just don't touch my things. In the lobby of the girls' division, on her way to her meeting with Dr. Larch, Melanie told Mrs. Grogan that Mary Agnes had broken something. Mrs. Grogan naturally assumed that Melanie meant that Mary Agnes had broken a lamp, or a window, or even a bed. Do you like the book, dear? Mrs. Grogan asked Melanie, who always carried Little Dorrit with her, she had read less than a page. It starts slowly, said Melanie. When she got to Nurse Angela's office, where Dr. Larch was waiting for her, she was slightly out of breath and sweating. What's the book? Dr. Larch asked her. Little Dort by Charles Dickens, Melanie said, she felt the barrette when she sat down. Where did you get it? Dr. Larch asked her. It was a gift, Melanie said. That's nice, said Wilbur Larch. Melanie shrugged. It starts slowly, she said. They looked at each other for a moment, cautiously. Larch smiled a little. Melanie tried to smile but she was unsure how this looked on her face, so she stopped. She shifted in the chair, the barrette in her pocket hurt her. He's not coming back, is he? Melanie asked Dr. Larch. He felt respect for her because she had read his mind. He has a summer job, Larch said. Melanie shrugged. He might go to school, I suppose, she said. Oh, I hope so. Larch said. I suppose that you want him to be a doctor, Melanie said. Larch shrugged. It was his turn to show indifference. If he wants to be, he said. I broke someone's arm, once, Melanie said. Or maybe it was something in the chest. The chest? Larch asked. When did you do that? Not too long ago. Melanie said. Recently. I didn't mean to. How did it happen? Dr. Larch asked her. I twisted her arm behind her back, she was on the floor, and then I stepped on her shoulder. Ouch, said Dr. Larch. I heard the crack, Melanie said. It was her arm or her chest. Perhaps her collar or bone, Larch suggested. Well, anyway, I heard it, Melanie said. How did that make you feel? Wilbur Larch asked Melanie, who shrugged. I don't know, Melanie said. Sick and strong, she added. Perhaps you'd like to have some more work to do? Larch asked her. Here? Melanie asked. Well, here, yes, Larch said. I could find more things for you to do here, more important things. Of course, I could also look for a job for you, outside, 
I mean. Away from here. So, you want me to go, or do more chores, is that it? I don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. You told me you didn't want to leave, once, and I'll never force you. I just think that you are looking for a change. You don't like how I read, huh? Melanie asked. Is that it? No. Dr. Large said. I want you to keep reading, but that's only one of the things you could do here. Do you want me to do what Homer Wells did? Homer did a lot of studying, Dr. Large said. Perhaps you could assist Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, and me. Perhaps you'd be interested in just observing, to see if you liked it. I think it's sick, Melanie said. Do you disapprove? Larch asked, but Melanie looked puzzled. What? She asked. You don't think that we should perform the abortions, right? Larch asked. You don't believe in terminating a birth, in aborting the fetus? Melanie shrugged. I just think it will make me sick, she repeated. Delivering babies is yucky, she said. And cutting babies out of people is yucky, too. Larch was confused. But don't you think it's wrong? He asked. What's wrong about it? She asked him. I think it's sick, Melanie said. It smells bad around here, she added, meaning the hospital air, the aura of ether, the scent of old blood. Wilbur Larch stared at Melanie and thought, she's just a big child. An aggressive baby. I don't want to work in the hospital, Melanie said flatly. I'll rake leaves, or do something like that, if you want me to work more, for my food. I want you to be happier than you are, Melanie, Dr. Large said cautiously. He felt miserable to see such a lonely creature. Happier. Said Melanie, she jumped in her chair and the stolen barrette dug into her. You're stupid, or crazy. Dr. Larch wasn't shocked, he nodded, considering the possibilities. He heard Mrs. Grogan calling him from the hall outside the dispensary. Dr. Larch. Dr. Larch. She called. Mary Agnes has broken her arm. Larch stared at Melanie, who smiled. You said this happened not too long ago? Larch asked her. I said recently, Melanie admitted. Larch went into the dispensary, where he examined Mary Agnes's cholera bone, which was broken, then he instructed Nurse Angela to prepare the child for x-ray. I slipped on the shower room floor, Mary Agnes moaned. It was really wet, Melanie. Dr. Large called. Melanie was in the hall. Melanie, 
Would you like to observe how we set a broken bone? Melanie walked into the dispensary, which was a small, crowded area, especially with Nurse Edna and Mrs. Grogan standing there, and with Nurse Angela leading Mary Agnes away for her X-ray. Seeing everyone together, Larch realized how old and weak he and his colleagues looked beside Melanie. Would you like to participate in the setting of a broken bone, Melanie? Larch asked the muscular young woman. No, Melanie said. I have got things to do. She waved the copy of Little Dord threateningly. And I have to look at what I'm going to read tonight, she added. She went back to the girls' division, to her window there, while Dr. Larch set Mary Agnes's collarbone. Melanie tried again to read and comprehend Little Dorrit. She daydreamed as she read and so she missed the transition between the passages. Suddenly, she discovered she was reading about the prison. A prison taint was on everything. She read. Like a well, like a tomb, the prison had no knowledge of the brightness outside. She stopped reading. She left Little Dorrit on her pillow. She took a pillowcase off a bed, and put into the pillowcase her canvas bag and some clothes. She also put there Jane Eyre. In Mrs. Grogan's room, Melanie found a purse. She robbed Mrs. Grogan of her money there wasn't much, and also took Mrs. Grogan's heavy winter coat in the summer, the coat would be useful if she had to sleep on the ground. Mrs. Grogan was still at the hospital, worrying about Mary Agnes Quark's collar or bone, Melanie wanted to say goodbye to Mrs. Grogan even after robbing her, but she knew the train timetable very well. At the train station, she bought a ticket only to Livermore Falls. She knew that even the stupid young station master would be able to remember that and he would tell Dr. Larch and Mrs. Grogan that Melanie had gone to Livermore Falls. She also knew that on the train she could buy a ticket to some place much farther away than Livermore Falls. She wanted to find Homer. She remembered Ocean View Orchard's inscription on the Cadillac that was on the coast, and the cattle I had a main license plate. It didn't matter to Melanie that there were thousands of miles of coastline in the state of Maine. As her train started moving away from street clouds, Melanie said to herself, I'm going to find you, Homer. Dr. Large tried to comfort Mrs. Grogan, she was sorry that there was so little money in her purse for Melanie. And my coat's not waterproof, Mrs. Grogan complained. She should have a real raincoat in this state. Dr. Large tried to reassure Mrs. Grogan. He said that Melanie was not a little girl. She's 24 or 25, Larch reminded Mrs. Grogan. I think her heart is broken, said Mrs. Grogan miserably. Dr. Larch said that Melanie had taken Jane Eyre with her, he thought that it was a hopeful sign. 
she will not be without love, without faith, she had a good book with her. The book that Melanie had left behind was a puzzle to both Mrs. Grogan and Dr. Larch. They read the dedication to Homer Wells, which touched Mrs. Grogan deeply. In the absence of Melanie and Homer, Dr. Larch resumed his responsibilities as the nightly reader to both the boys' and the girls' divisions. He attempted to read Little Door to the girls. Chapter 3 had an unfortunate title for Orphans, Home. He began the description of London on a Sunday evening. Melancholy Streets, in a penitential garb of soot, read Dr. Large, and then he stopped, we need no more melancholy here, he thought. Shall we read Jane Eyre again? Dr. Larch asked, the girls nodded readily. So Dr. Larch decided to write a letter to Olive Worthington, My dear Mrs. Worthington, here in street clouds, we depend on our few luxuries. If you would be so kind, please tell Homer that his friend Melanie has left us we don't know where she is and that she took with her our only copy of Jane Eyre. The orphans in the girls' division liked listening to the story, in fact, Homer used to read to them. If Homer could find a replacement copy, the little girls and I would be happy. In other parts of the world, there are bookshops. Thus, Larch knew, he had done two things. Olive Worthington would send him a new book of Jane Eyre, and Homer would receive the important message about Melanie. Larch thought that Homer should know this. It was really difficult to read Little Dorrit. Even Candy, who replaced her stolen copy, never finished the book. Little Dorrit reminded her of her discomfort on the long journey to and from street clouds, and of what had happened to her there. She remembered the ride back to the coast. Candy was grateful for Homer's presence because she didn't have to talk to Wally. She couldn't even hear what Wally and Homer were saying to each other. She worried about how much she was bleeding. Between street clouds and the coast, she asked Wally three times to stop the car. She kept checking her bleeding and changing the pads. She looked at the back of Homer's head. If it's worse tomorrow, she thought, I'll have to ask him. When Wally went to the men's room and left them alone in the car, Homer spoke to her, but he didn't turn around. You're probably having cramps, he said. You're probably bleeding, but if the stains on the pad are only two or three inches in diameter, that's okay. It's expected. Thank you, Candy whispered. The bleeding should decrease tomorrow, and get much lighter the next day. If you're worried, you should ask me, he said. Okay, Candy said. She felt so strange, that a boy her own age should know so much about her. I've never seen a lobster, said Homer Wells, to change the subject. Then you've never eaten a lobster, either, Candy, said cheerfully.
I don't know if I want to eat something that I've never seen, Homer said, and Candy laughed. She was laughing when Wally got back in the car. We're talking about lobsters, Homer explained. Oh, they're very funny, Wally, said, and all three of them laughed. Wait till you see one. Candy said to Homer. He's never seen a lobster. She told Wally. When they stopped laughing, Homer said, I've never seen the ocean, you know. Candy, did you hear that? Wally asked, but Candy was already asleep. You've never seen the ocean? Wally asked Homer. That's right, said Homer Wells. That's not funny, said Wally seriously. Right, Homer said. A little later, Wally said, Do you want to drive for a while? I don't know how to drive, Homer said. Really? Wally asked. And later Wally asked, Uh, have you ever been with a girl, made love to one, you know? But Homer Wells had already fallen asleep. Candy? Wally whispered. And a little later, he whispered, Homer? He liked the idea to be their guide through the night, and their protector. Well, buddy, Wally, said to the sleeping Homer Wells. It's high time you had some fun. Almost a month later Wilbur Large was still waiting to hear from Homer Wells, he was too proud to write the first letter. There in street clouds Larch wondered about the fun Homer was having. Swimming lessons He thought what do they wear for swimming in a heated pool? How do they heat the pool, and how much do they heat it? In 194, the pool at the Haven Club was the first heated swimming pool in Maine. Raymond Kendall had invented the heating system for the Haven Club pool. It was just an exercise in mechanics for Ray. Homer liked Candy's father, perhaps because surgery is the mechanics of medicine. He made friends with the machinery with which Ray Kendall worked both the apple farm equipment and the mechanisms for catching the lobsters. However Homer didn't like the creatures. They crammed the tank in Ray Kendall's lobster pound, crawling over each other. Homer knew he had seen a good reason for learning how to swim. If he ever fell in the sea, he wouldn't want to fall to the bottom where these creatures lived. Homer pulled lobster pots with Candy's father on Sundays. He didn't do that for money, he just wanted to be around Ray. Six days a week Homer worked with Wally in the orchards. The ocean was visible from only one of Ocean View's several orchards but the presence of the sea was felt throughout the farm. Homer liked watching the seagulls that occasionally perched in the trees. Among orphans, thought Homer Wells, seagulls are better than crows because seagulls possess freedom. So it occurred to Homer Wells that he was free. 
Wilbur Larch knew that freedom was an orphan's most dangerous illusion. When he finally received a letter from Homer, he was disappointed because of its lack of detail. But as for illusions, and all the rest, there was simply no evidence. I am learning to swim, wrote Homer Wells. I know. I know. Tell me about it. Thought Wilbur Larch. I am better at driving, Homer added. Mrs. Worthy Rigdon is very nice. She knows everything about apples. Candy's father is very nice, too, Homer Wells wrote to Dr. Larch. He takes me out on his lobster boat, and he is teaching me how an engine works. Do you wear a life jacket on the lobster boat? Wilbur Larch wanted to know. Do you think an engine is so special? I could teach you how the heart works, thought Wilbur Larch. Candy and Wally are wonderful. Homer wrote. I go everywhere with them. I sleep in Wally's room. I wear his clothes. It's great that we're the same size, although he is stronger. Candy and Wally are getting married, one day, and they want to have lots of children. Tell me about the swimming lessons, thought Wilbur Larch. Poor Mr. Worthington, everyone calls him Senior, Homer wrote. Aha! Thought Wilbur Larch. So something isn't perfect, is it? What's poor about Mr. Worthington? He asked Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna what they thought of the name Senior. They agreed that the name was strange. It sounds stupid to me, said Wilbur Larch. Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna told him he wasn't fair. They agreed that Homer's letter was late, but they said that this showed only how happy and how busy he was. You want him to be a doctor, Wilbur? Nurse Edna said, but it's his life. Do you expect him to be a writer, too? Nurse Angela said. And never get married? Nurse Edna asked dangerously. I expect him to be of use, thought Wilbur Large tiredly. And I want him to be here, with me, he knew that his last wish was unfair. In the dispensary, he rested from the summer heat. The ether fumes evaporated more slowly in the humidity. He was traveling both farther away and for longer in his ether dreams now. When he came out of the ether, he did it more slowly. I'm getting older, he repeated to himself. A beautiful and untouched copy of Jane Eyre arrived from Mrs. Worthington, and Wilbur Larch read more excitedly to the girls. Correspondence slowly developed between Wilbur Larch and Homer Wells. Homer wrote about the facts of his life in Hearts Rock and Hearts Haven. He sent Dr. Larch a page, maybe two pages once a week or every other week. 
To his letters Dr. Larch responded with questions what exactly is the matter with Mr. Worthington? And a flood of details about the daily life of street clouds. Dr. Larch provided Homer Wells with a calendar of hospital and social events. His letters to Homer Wells were longer than his longest passages in A Brief History of Street Clouds, and they were written and mailed the day after Dr. Larch had received a few lines from Homer. You can't expect the boy to compete with you. Nurse Angela said. What is wrong with this senior Worthington character? Dr. Larch asked. Homer said it was a drinking problem, Wilbur, Nurse Edna reminded him, but what Wilbur Larch expected from his young apprentice was, clinical analysis. The exact definition of characteristics associated with light, medium, or heavy drinking. Are we talking about a guy who makes a fool out of himself at parties? Wilbur Larch wondered. Or is this something chronic? Because Homer Wells had never seen a drunk before. He was easily deceived by Senior Worthington's appearance, and Homer was ready to accept Senior's degradation as the natural result of alcoholism. Senior became short-tempered, irritable, and sometimes even aggressive. Senior made terrible mistakes in any complex motor task. While cleaning the carburetor for the Cadillac, a simple job, which Ray Kendall had demonstrated for him many times, Senior inhaled the gas in the tubes he sucked in instead of blowing out. Senior had all the other symptoms, too. He was 55, he looked 70. He had periods of paranoia. Of confabulation. Senior's recent memory was so impaired that he wandered for an hour through his own bedroom unable to dress himself. Yet his long range memory was quite intact. He sang college songs to Olive, he told Wally stories of Wally as a baby. Sometimes Senior didn't drink for three days, and he observed that his silliness flourished, anyway. Homer Wells wanted that summer to last forever. His life at Ocean View made him happy. He loved the Worthington's carpets. At Street Clouds there were just bare wood walls and many layers of linoleum. Homer had not seen pictures on walls before, Homer even admired the oil painting of the cat in the flower bed in Wally's bathroom, and he liked the wallpaper with flowers, too. What did he know about wallpaper or art? He thought that all wallpaper was wonderful. He loved all his fellow workers. He loved Meanie Hyde the most, because Meanie was so friendly and had such a fondness for explaining how everything was done. At Street Clouds, growth was unwanted and the process of birth was often interrupted. Now he was engaged in the business of growing things. What he loved about the life at Ocean View was how everything was of use and that everything was wanted. Homer often imagined that Candy was sleeping beside him, and they were holding tightly each other in a grip of innocent affection. Candy smoked. 
but she was so mannered that she often dropped her cigarette in her lap, jumping up and furiously brushing away the sparks, always laughing. Oh, how clumsy I am! She cried. If so, thought Homer Wells, only when you're smoking. In all of Hart's Rock and Hart's Haven, there was nothing that reminded Homer of street clouds, nothing until the first rainy day, when they sent him, with a small crew of scrubbers and painters, to the cider house. It was a long, thin, one-story, shed-roofed building in the shape of an arm held at a right angle, in the elbow of the building, where there was a double door entrance, were the cider mill and the press. One wing of the building was occupied with refrigeration units, it was a cold storage room for the cider. In the other wing, there was a small kitchen, beyond which you could see two long rows of ironed hospital style beds each with its own blanket and pillow. Mattresses were rolled neatly on each of the more than twenty beds. Sometimes a blanket hanging on wire runners separated a bed, or a section of beds, which Homer Wells associated with a hospital ward. Unpainted shelves between the beds formed primitive wardrobe closets, which contained reading lamps wherever there was an electrical outlet. The furniture was shabby but neat. What is this place? Homer asked Meany Hyde. It's the cider house, said Meany. But who sleeps here, who stays here? Do people live here? Homer asked. It was remarkably clean, yet the atmosphere reminded Homer of street clouds. It's for the pickers, Meany Hyde said. During the harvest, the pickers stay here, the migrants. It's for the colored folks, said Big Dot Taft. Every year, we make it nice for them. We wash everything and we give everything a fresh coat of paint. Negroes? Homer Wells asked. Are the pickers Negroes? Some of them are as black as night, said Florence Hyde. They're okay. They're nice. Added Meany Hyde. Some of them are nicer than others, said Big Dot Taft. They are like other people that I know, Irene Titcomb said, giggling. They're nice because Mrs. Worthington is nice to them. Meany Hyde said. Deborah Pettigrew smiled at Homer over the bucket they were scrubbing together, he cautiously smiled back while asking where Wally was working today, in the rain. The building smelled like vinegar, old cider that had turned. It was a strong smell, but there was nothing stifling or unclean about it. That night Homer had his first date with Deborah Pettigrew, then they went to the drive-in movie with Candy and Wally. They all went in Senior's Cadillac. Homer and Deborah Pettigrew sat in the back seat. Homer didn't know that the purpose of drive-in movies was to make love in the back seats of cars. Homer's never been to a drive-in before, Wally announced to Deborah Pettigrew. 
I've never been to a movie before, Homer admitted. Gosh, said Deborah Pettigrew. She smelled nice, she was much neater and cleaner than she looked in her work clothes. She was nice looking, relaxed, friendly, hard working and not very smart. She was going to marry someone pleasant and not much older or smarter than she was. The drive-in movie in Cape Kenneth was new to Maine. It was amazing, this whole experience, for Homer Wells. What he was most unprepared for was the movie itself. The camera backed, or rather, lurched away. He saw something's head, a kind of horse. Thought Homer Wells. It was a camel, actually, but Homer Wells had never seen a camel, or a picture of one. He thought it was a horribly deformed horse, a mutant horse. On the camel, there was a black skinned man in white trapping bandages. Thought Homer Wells. Suddenly, music. Homer jumped. Words. The titles, the names of the actors were written in the sand by an invisible hand. What was that? Homer asked Wally. He meant the animal, its rider, the desert, the credits, everything. Some dumb Bedouin, I think, Wally said. A Bedouin? Thought Homer Wells. Is it a kind of horse? He asked. What horse? Asked Deborah Pettigrew. The animal, Homer said. Candy turned around in the front seat and looked at Homer with heartbreaking affection. That's a camel, Homer, she said. You've never seen a camel. Wally shouted. Well, where could he see a camel? Candy said to him. I was just surprised. Wally said defensively. I've never seen a Negro, either, Homer said. That was one, on the camel. A Negro Bedouin, I guess, Wally said. Gosh, said Deborah Pettigrew, who looked at Homer a little fearfully. Then the credits were over. The black man on the camel was gone, the desert was also gone. It was a pirate movie. Great ships were blasting each other with cannons, some bad men with uncut hair and baggy pants were doing terrible things to nicer looking men, who were better dressed. None of the men was black. Perhaps the camel's rider had been a kind of omen, thought Homer Wells. His experience of stories by Charles Dickens and Charlotte Bronte hadn't prepared him for characters who came from and traveled nowhere, or for stories that made no sense. The pirates stole a lot of coins and a blonde woman from another ship before they sank the ship and sailed away in their own vessel, on which they drank and sang. They enjoyed teasing the woman but some mysterious force kept them from actually harming her, for a whole hour, during which they harmed nearly everyone else and many of themselves. The woman, however, 
was reserved for more teasing. Homer was only partially aware that Wally and Candy were uninterested in the movie. Twice Homer heard her say, No, Wally, once with a firmness he had never heard in her voice before. Wally's frequent laughter continued at intervals, and he whispered and murmured. When Homer looked at Deborah, he was surprised to find her looking at him. Not critically but not very affectionately either. She looked really amazed. Once she touched his hand, he thought she wanted something, and turned to her politely. She just stared at him, he looked back at the movie. I think I've missed something, Homer Wells announced after more than an hour had passed. Candy sat up in the front seat and looked at him with great concern. When the movie was over, he realized he was crying, he realized that although he loved the place where he was, he loved Dr. Larch more than anyone else. At this point in his life, he still loved Larch more than he loved Candy, and he realized that he missed Larch, too, but at the same time he hoped he would never again set foot in street clouds. Deborah Pettigrew thought the movie had moved Homer to tears. There, there, she said in a mothering tone hugging him. Candy and Wally leaned over the front seat. Candy touched his head. It's okay. You can cry. I cry at lots of movies, she said. You dear boy, Candy thought, please don't forget about your heart. She put her cheek against Homer's cheek and kissed him near his ear. It was a very sudden surprise to her, how much she enjoyed that kiss of friendship, it surprised Homer Wells, too. It was a feeling that rushed him from nowhere, and he knew, looking at Wally's fond and handsome face that it was a feeling with nowhere to go. Was that love? So love came to him leaving him no options for its use. Homer wrote Dr. Large a long letter, his longest so far. He tried to tell Large about the drive-in movie, but the letter degenerated into a critique of the movie itself and so he tried to change the subject. Should he tell Larch that he had learned the real purpose of the drive-in? Should he tell Dr. Larch how he imagined he was falling in love, or already had fallen in love, with candy which he knew was forbidden? And how could he say, I miss you when he didn't want to come back? And so he ended the letter vaguely. I remember when you kissed me, he wrote to Dr. Larch. I wasn't really asleep. Yes, thought Dr. Larch, I remember that, too. He rested in the dispensary. Why didn't I kiss him more, why not all the time? He asked himself. In other parts of the world, he dreamed, they have drive-in movies. Dr. Larch always used more ether than he should have before the annual meeting of Street Cloud's Board of Trustees. He'd never quite understood what a Board of Trustees was for 
and his impatience with the routine inquiries was growing. In the old days, there'd been the main state board of medical examiners, they'd never asked him any questions. This year there were two new board members who'd never before seen the orphanage, and so the meeting had been scheduled to take place in street clouds the board usually met in Portland. The new members wanted to see the place. It was a perfect August morning, but Larch was irritable. I don't know exactly what a drive-in movie is, he said crossly to Nurse Angela. Homer doesn't say exactly. Nurse Angela looked frustrated. No, he doesn't, she agreed, reading the letter again and again. What do you do with your cars when you're watching the movie? Nurse Edna asked. I don't know, Dr. Large said. I assume that if you drive into something to see the movie, you must stay in your cars. But what do you drive into, Wilbur? Nurse Edna asked. That's what I don't know. Large shouted. Well, aren't we in a lovely mood? Nurse Angela said. Why would you want to bring your car to a movie in the first place? Nurse Edna asked. I don't know the answer to that, either, Dr. Large said tiredly. Unfortunately, he looked tired during the trustees' meeting, too. The two new members seemed in an awful hurry to demonstrate that they already understood everything, and Dr. Larch was really angry. The new woman on the board, Mrs. Goodhall, had been appointed for her abilities at fundraising, she was especially aggressive. She coldly expressed her respect for how much experience Larch and his assistants had with administering street clouds, perhaps they all could be invigorated by a younger assistant. You need a young intern with some new ideas in the obstetrical field, Mrs. Goodhall suggested. I keep up with the field, Dr. Larch said. And I keep up with the number of babies born here. Well, then, how about a new administrative assistant? Mrs. Goodhall suggested. I'm talking about someone who could handle the correspondence and the interviewing for you. I could use a new typewriter, Dr. Large said. Just get me a new typewriter. The new man on the board was a psychiatrist. He was rather new at psychiatry, which was rather new in Maine in 194. His name was Gingrich. The older members of the board, all men, all as elderly as large were intimidated by this new man who spoke in whispers and by this new woman who was so loud. In tandem, they seemed so sure of themselves. Oh dear, Nurse Edna thought. She knew that Wilbur Larch was protecting his ability to perform the abortions. How could he accept a new assistant without knowing the person's beliefs? Now, Dr. Large, Dr. Gingrich said softly, someone with all your responsibilities should have all the help he can get. 
someone with my responsibility should stay responsible, Larch said. With the pressure you must be under, said Dr. Gingrich, it's no wonder you find it hard to delegate even a little of that responsibility. I have more use for a typewriter than for a delegate, Wilbur Larch said. Let's see, Mrs. Goodhall said sharply. You're in your seventies, now, is that correct? Aren't you seventy-something? She asked Dr. Larch. Right, said Wilbur Larch. Seventy-something. And how old is Mrs. Grogan? Mrs. Goodhall asked suddenly. I'm sixty-two, Mrs. Grogan said bravely, and I'm as lively as a spring chicken. Oh, no one doubts you're not lively, said Dr. Gingrich. And Nurse Angela? Mrs. Goodhall asked, not looking up at anyone. I'm 58, Nurse Angela said. Angela is as strong as a ox. Mrs. Grogan said. We don't doubt it. Said Dr. Gingrich cheerfully. I'm 55 or 56, Nurse Edna said, before the question was raised. You don't know how old you are? Dr. Gingrich asked meaningfully. Actually, said Wilbur Larch, we're all so senile, we can't remember, we're just guessing. But look at you. He said suddenly to Mrs. Goodhall. She raised her eyes from her pad. I guess you have such trouble remembering things, Lart said, that you have to write everything down. I'm just trying to get the picture of what's going on here, Mrs. Goodhall said evenly. Well, Lart said. Listen to me, then. I've been here long enough to have the clear picture in mind. It's very clear what a wonderful job you're doing. Dr. Gingrich told Dr. Larch. It's also clear how hard the job is. Larch realized that someone would replace him soon. He looked at his calendar, he had two abortions to perform the next day, and three more at the end of the week. And what if they get someone who won't perform an abortion? He thought. But then, just in time, the new typewriter arrived, and it fitted into his plans for Fuzzy Stone. Thank you for the new typewriter, Larch wrote to the Board of Trustees. It had arrived just in time, he added, because the old typewriter had completely broken down. This was not true. He replaced the keys on the old typewriter, and it now typed differently and it typed letters from young Fuzzy Stone. Fuzzy wrote to Dr. Larch that he wanted to be a doctor when he grew up. I doubt that I will ever feel about abortion like you, young Fuzzy wrote to Dr. Larch. Certainly, it is obstetrics that interests me. And certainly your example is responsible for my interest, but I expect we shall never agree about abortion. And so on. 
The correspondence between Dr. Larch and Fuzzy Stone covered many years, Larch wrote into the future. He completed Dr. F. Stone's training he put him through medical school. And always Fuzzy Stone remained faithful to his beliefs. I'm sorry, but I believe there is a soul, and that it exists from the start, Fuzzy Stone wrote. Later young Dr. Stone proposed that he should replace Dr. Large, but not until you're ready to retire, of course. He wanted to demonstrate to Dr. Large that the law should be observed, that abortions should not be performed, and that a safe and informative view of family planning birth control and so forth could in time achieve the desired effect dot 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 without breaking the laws of God or man, wrote Fuzzy Stone. It exhausted Larch, but he put it all down, one typewriter for Fuzzy that was used for nothing else, and the new one for himself. He imagined that their correspondence ended, quite abruptly, when Large refused to accept the idea that anyone should replace him who was unwilling to perform abortions. I will go until I drop, he wrote to Fuzzy. Here in street clouds, I will never allow myself to be replaced by some reactionary religious fanatic. I am sorry you're a doctor. Larch ran it to poor Fuzzy. You are not the proper doctor for this orphanage, and you will get my job over my dead body. What he heard from Dr. Stone, after that, was a rather curt note in which Fuzzy said he needed to search his soul regarding his personal debt to Dr. Larch and his perhaps larger debt to society, and to all the murdered unborn of the future. It was hard, Fuzzy meant, to listen to his conscience and not turn in Dr. Larch. To the authorities, he added threateningly. What a good story! thought Wilbur Larch. It had taken him the rest of August of 194. He wanted to complete the thing when Homer Wells returned to Street Clouds from his summer job. So Wilbur Larch had created a replacement for himself. He had created someone with qualified obstetrical procedure, and, what could be better, an orphan familiar with the place from birth. He had also created a perfect lie, because the Dr. F. Stone whom Wilbur Larch had in mind would perform abortions, of course. At the same time, what could be better? He would have the reputation of a doctor who was against abortions. When Larch retired, he would already have available his most perfect replacement. Wilbur Larch lay in the dispensary. There's only one problem, he thought, dreaming. How can I persuade Homer to play the part? That night Homer Wells, gazing at the stars of Maine Owlie's window, remembered how he had yelled his echoless goodnight to Fuzzy Stone. Homer was listening to Wally's peaceful breathing. The problem is, Homer Wells thought, I am in love with Candy. And Candy suggested that he should not go back to Street Clouds. My father likes you so much, she told Homer. 
I know he'll give you a job on the boat, or in the pound. My mother likes you so much, Wally had added. I know she'll give you a job in the orchards. And she gets lonely every time I go back to college. She will be happy if you stay in my room. How can I not be in love with Candy? Homer wondered. And if I stay here, he asked himself, what can I do? And what can I do if I go back to Street Clouds? Chapter 7 In the cider house by the light switch, there was a piece of paper pinned to the wall. It was some kind of list, the bottom quarter of the page had been torn away. Homer wanted to throw the paper away but noticed the top line, which said, Cider House rules what rules. He wondered, reading down the page. The rules were numbered. Please don't operate the grinder or the press if you've been drinking. Please don't smoke in bed or use candles. Please don't go up on the roof if you've been drinking, especially at night. Please wash out the press cloths the same day or night they are used. Please remove the rotary screen immediately after you've finished pressing. Please don't take bottles with you when you go up on the roof. Please, even if you are very hot or if you've been drinking, don't go into the cold storage room to sleep. Please give your shopping list to the crew boss by 7 o'clock in the morning. There should be no more than half a dozen people on the roof at any one time. If there were a few more rules, Homer couldn't read them because the page had been ripped off. Homer handed the torn paper to Big Dot Taft. What's all this about the roof? He asked Deborah Pettigrew. You can see the ocean from the roof, Deborah said. That isn't it, said Big Dot Taft. At night you can see the carnival lights in Cape Kenneth. That's no big deal, said Homer Wells. It's no big deal to me, either, Big Dot Taft said but those black workers really like it. They sit up on the roof all night, some nights, Deborah Pettigrew said. They get drunk up there and fall off, some nights, Florence Hyde announced from the bedroom wing. They break bottles up there and cut themselves all up, said Irene Tintcombe. Well, not every night, they don't, said Big Dot Taft. And one night one of them got so drunk and sweaty, running the press, that he slept in the cold storage and woke up with pneumonia, Deborah Pettigrew said. You don't exactly wake up with pneumonia, said Homer Wiles. It's more complicated than that. Excuse me, Deborah said. Anyway, nobody pays attention to the rules, Big Dot Haft said. Every year Olive writes them, and every year nobody pays attention. Suddenly Wally arrived in the green van, he pumped the horn. Homer ran outside to see what he wanted. Get in! Wally shouted. 
We've got to rescue my stupid father, he's in trouble at Sanborns. For Homer Wells, who'd grown up in a world without fathers, it was a shock to hear that anyone who had a father would call his father stupid, even if it was true. Homer held the apples in his lap as Wally drove down Drinkwater Road to Sanborn's General Store. The shop owners, Mildred and Bert Sanborn, were Senior's oldest friends. He'd been a schoolboy with both of them and had once dated Millie before he'd met Olive, and before Millie had married Bert. Warren Titus, the plumber, was standing on the porch of the general store, not letting anyone inside, when Wally and Homer drove into Hearts Rock. It's good that you're here, Wally, Warren said, when the boys ran up to the porch. Your dad got crazy. In the store, Homer and Wally saw that Mildred and Bert Sanborn had cornered Senior in a niche of shelves reserved for baking goods. Senior had littered the floor and much of himself with all the flour and sugar within his reach. What's the trouble, Pop? Wally asked his father. Mildred Sanborn gave a sigh of relief to see Wally, but Bert wouldn't take his eyes off Senior. Trouble Pop, Senior said. He got in a rage when he couldn't find the dog food, Bert said to Wally, without looking away from Senior. What did you want to do with dog food, Pop? Wally asked his father. Dog food pop, Senior repeated. He doesn't remember, Wally, Bert Sanborn said. We told him that he didn't have a dog, Mildred said. I have to feed Blinky, Senior said. Blinky was his dog when he was a boy. Millie Sanborn told Wally. If Blinky was still alive, Senior, Bert Sanborn said, he'd be older than we are. Older than we are, Senior said. Let's go home, Pop, Wally said. Home, Pop, Senior said but he let Homer and Wally lead him to their van. I tell you, Wally, it's not alcohol, said Warren Titus, who opened the door of the van for them. It's not on his breath, not this time. It's something else, Wally, Bert Sanborn said. Who are you? Senior asked Homer. I'm Homer Wells, Mr. Worthington, Homer said. Mr. Worthington, Senior said. When they'd driven for almost five minutes, in silence, Senior shouted, Everyone just shut up. When they got to Ocean View, Olive met the van in the driveway, she ignored Senior and spoke to Wally. I don't know what he's had this morning, unless it's vodka, it wasn't on his breath when he left. I think it's something else, Mom, Wally said. With Homer's help, he led Senior to the bedroom, got his shoes off and asked him to lie down on the bed. Downstairs, Homer Wells told Olive and Wally that he thought it was something neurological. Neurological? Olive said. 
What does that mean? Wally said. Homer Wells, who had a habit of repeating the endings of sentences, knew that seniors' repetitions were insane. That habit was the first symptom he described in his letter about Senior Worthington to Dr. Larch. He repeats everything, he wrote to Dr. Larch. Homer also noted that Senior forgot the names of the most common things. Dr. Larch's letter to Homer Wells was so impressive that Homer immediately showed it to Mrs. Worthington. What you have described to me, Homer, sounds like some kind of evolving organic brain syndrome, Dr. Larch wrote. In a man of this age, there aren't a lot of diagnoses to choose from. I suppose the man has Alzheimer's personal dementia, it's very rare, I looked it up in one of my volumes of the New England Journal of Medicine. Please tell Mrs. Worthington that a neurologist should examine her husband. I know there is at least one in Maine. It's only my guess that it's Alzheimer's disease, added Dr. Larch. Alzheimer's disease? asked Olive Worthington. You mean it's a disease, what's wrong with him? Wally asked Homer. Wally cried in the car on the way to the neurologist. I'm sorry, Pop, he said. But Senior seemed delighted. When the neurologist confirmed Dr. Larch's diagnosis, Senior Worthington was excited. I have a disease. He yelled proudly, even happily. It was almost as if someone had announced that he was cured, what he had was quite incurable. What a relief it was to him to learn that he wasn't simply a drunk. It was such an enormous relief to Olive that she wept on Wally's shoulder, she hugged and kissed Homer with an energy that Homer had not known since he left the arms of Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna. Mrs. Worthington thanked Homer over and over again. It meant a lot to Olive although she had long ago fallen out of love with Senior, if she had ever truly loved him to know that this new information permitted her to renew her respect for Senior. She was very grateful to Homer and to Dr. Larch for restoring Senior's self-esteem, and for restoring some of her esteem for Senior, too. All this contributed to the special atmosphere that surrounded Senior's death at the end of the summer, shortly before the harvest, a sense of relief was far more prevalent than was a sense of grief. Of course, the residents of Hearts Rock and Hearts Haven had some difficulty with the term. Alzheimer was not a name familiar to the coast of Maine in 194. The workers at Ocean View had particular trouble with it, Ray Kendall, one day, made it easier for everyone to understand. Senior got Alzheimer disease, he announced. Alzheimer now there was a disease that anyone could understand. Just before the harvest, when Olive Worthington had typed her clean page of rules almost exactly the same rules from the previous years and had pinned them next to the light switch by the kitchen door, she offered Homer to stay. 
I always hate it when Wally goes back to college, Olive told Homer. And this year, without Senior, I'm going to hate it more. I would like it very much if you could be happy here, Homer, you could stay in Wally's room. I like having someone in the house at night, and someone to talk to in the morning. I'm not sure how Dr. Larch would feel about it, Homer said. Dr. Larch would like you to go to college one day, Olive said. And so would I. I know that Dr. Larch wants you to take all the sciences. Homer understood that she was recalling this from a letter from Dr. Larch. And Latin, said Olive Worthington. Latin, said Homer Wells. This was surely Dr. Larch's work. Dr. Larch wants me to be a doctor, Homer said to Mrs. Worthington. But I don't want to be. I think that he wants you to have the option of becoming a doctor, if you change your mind, Olive said. I think that he said Latin or Greek. So they often write to each other, thought Homer Wells, but all he said was, I really like working on the farm. Well. I certainly want you to keep working here, Olive told him. I need your help, through the harvest, especially. He wrote to Dr. Large, requesting Large's permission to stay at Ocean View. I'll take biology, Homer Wells wrote, and anything scientific. But do I have to take Latin? Nobody even speaks it anymore. Don't take Latin or Greek if you don't want to, Dr. Large wrote to Homer Wells. It's a free country, isn't it? Homer Wells was beginning to wonder. In the same envelope with Dr. Large's letter, there was a letter, which Dr. Large had forwarded to him from good old Snowy Meadows. In Wilbur Large's opinion, Snowy was a fool, but a persistent one. Hi, Homer, it's me, Snowy, Snowy Meadows began. He explained that his name was now Robert Marsh of the Bangor Marshes, we're the big furniture family, Snowy wrote. The furniture family? thought Homer Wells. Snowy went on and on about how he'd met and married the girl of his dreams, and how he'd chosen the furniture business, and how happy he was that he'd gotten out of street clouds. Snowy added that he hoped Homer had gotten out, too. And what do you hear from Fuzzy Stone? Snowy Meadows wanted to know. Old Larch says Fuzzy is doing well. I'd like to write a letter to Fuzzy, if you know his address. Fuzzy Stone's address thought Homer Wells. And what did Old Larch mean that Fuzzy is doing well? Doing well at what? Wondered Homer Wells, but he wrote to Snowy Meadows that Fuzzy was, indeed, doing well, that he had lost Fuzzy's address, and that he found that apple farming was healthy and satisfying work. Homer added that he had no immediate plans to visit Bangor, he would surely look up the furniture marsh as if he was ever in town. 
And, no, he concluded, he didn't agree with Snowy that a kind of reunion in street clouds was such a good idea. He said he was sure that Dr. Larch would never approve of such a plan. He confessed that he really missed Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, and of course Dr. Larch himself, but wasn't the place supposed to be left behind? Homer Wells asked Snowy Meadows. Then Homer wrote to Dr. Larch. What's this about Fuzzy Stone doing well, doing well at what? I know that Snowy Meadows is an idiot, but if you're going to tell him something about Fuzzy Stone, don't you think you should tell me, too? In time, in time, thought Wilbur Larch, he was stressed. Dr. Gingrich and Mrs. Goodhall had prevailed upon the Board of Trustees. The Board had requested Larch's follow up report on the status of each orphan's success or failure in each foster home. If this added paperwork was too tiresome for Dr. Larch, the Board recommended that Larch should accept an administrative assistant. Larch rested in the dispensary, he sniffed a little ether and composed himself. Gingrich and Goodhall, he said to himself. Jingall and Goodrich, he muttered. Richall and Jing Good. Gojing and Hallrich. He woke himself, giggling. Why are you so merry? Nurse Angela said sharply to him from the hall outside the dispensary. Good balls and ding dong. Wilbur Large said to her. He went to Nurse Angela's office. He had plans for Fuzzy Stone. He called Bowdoin College where Fuzzy Stone would successfully complete his undergraduate studies in Harvard Medical School where Larch intended Fuzzy to do very, very well. He told the registrar's office at Bowdoin that a sum of money had been donated to the orphanage at Street Clouds for the purpose of paying the medical school expenses of an exceptional young man or woman who would be willing to serve Street Clouds. Could Dr. Larch have access to the transcripts of Bowdoin's recent graduates who had gone on to medical school? He told a slightly different story to Harvard Medical School, he wanted access to transcripts, of course, but in this case, the sum of money had been donated to establish a training fellowship in obstetrics. It was the first traveling Wilbur Larch had done since he'd chased after Clara. The first time he'd slept in a place other than the dispensary since World War I, but he needed to familiarize himself with the transcript forms at Bowdoin and at Harvard Medical School. Only in this way could he create a transcript for F. Stone. He asked for a typewriter and some paper. One of your blank transcript forms will make it easier for me, and pretended to type out the names and qualifications of a few interesting candidates. I see so many who'd be perfect, he told them at Bowdoin and Harvard, but it's impossible to know if any of them could tolerate St. Cloud's. We're very isolated. He confessed, thanking them for their help, handing them back their transcripts. Fuzzy's transcript was already in the proper place. When he had returned to Street Clouds, 
Dr. Larch wrote to Bowdoin and Harvard, requesting copies of the transcripts of a few outstanding graduates, he had narrowed the choices down to these few, he told them. A copy of Fuzzy's transcript came in the mail with the others, when Larch had visited Harvard Medical School. He'd taken a Cambridge Post Office box in Fuzzy's name. Now he wrote to the postmaster there, requesting to forward the mail for F. Stone to Street Clouds. The P.O. box address would be useful, too, if young Dr. Stone had to go on mission abroad. Then he sent an empty envelope to the Cambridge address and waited for its return. When the letter came back to him, when he was sure that the system worked, he composed the rest of the history regarding F. Stone and his adoptive family named Deems and sent it along to the Board of Trustees, together with Fuzzy's address. He did not have to invent anything regarding Snowy Meadows and most of the others, although he had difficulty typing the furniture marshes without laughing out loud, and when he came to the case of Homer Wells, he thought very carefully about how to describe the problem with Homer's heart. Among the members of the board there wasn't a heart specialist or even a surgeon, there was a very old GP who, Dr. Larch felt sure, never read anything at all. Larch didn't count Dr. Gingrich as a doctor, he counted psychiatrists as nothing at all, and he felt confident that he could confuse Mrs. Goodhall by the slightest terminology. He confessed to the board isn't everyone flattered by a confidence that he had not said about Homer's heart to Homer as he was afraid that worrying the boy could contribute to his problem, and he wanted the boy to gain confidence in the outside world, yet he intended to tell Homer about it, shortly. Larch said he had informed the Worthingtons of the heart defect. He concluded that he thought the board's request for the follow-up reports had been a good idea and that he had enjoyed himself a lot in preparing them, so he didn't need an administrative assistant to perform such a service. It was Wally's last night home. He was going back to college in the morning. You'll look after candy for me, won't you, Homer? Wally asked Homer. Candy was going to finish her senior year at the girls' academy in Camden. She came home most weekends, but Wally stayed in or on except for Thanksgiving and Christmas and the longer vacations. Right, said Homer Wells. He was eager for the harvest to start, he was curious about meeting the migrants, about seeing the Negroes. He didn't know why. Were they like orphans? Because he loved Wally, he decided to keep his mind off Candy. It was a bold decision. And this evening there was a plan, Homer Wells liked every evening to have a plan, even if he was not very excited about this one. He drove Wally, in Senior's Cadillac to Kendall's Lobster Pound, where Candy was waiting. He left Candy and Wally there. Candy and Wally wanted a private goodbye together before Ray came home. In the morning, Wally left for the university in Orano. 
The next day, Candy left for Camden Academy. The day before the picking crew arrived at Ocean View, Homer Wells, the tallest and moldest boy at Gabe Kenneth High School, attended the first class meeting of senior biology. His friend Deborah Pettigrew had to lead him to the laboratory. The textbook for senior biology was B. A. Bensley's Practical Anatomy of the Rabbit. The book filled Homer Wells with longing. It was a shock for him to realize how much he missed Dr. Larch's old copy of Gray's. Homer, at first glance, was critical of Bensley, whereas Gray's began with the skeleton. Bensley began with the tissues. But the teacher of the class, Mr. Hood, pleased Homer Wells when he said it he, like Grace, would begin with the bones. Homer looked at the ancient yellow skeleton of a rabbit. The class was hushed. Wait till they get to the urogenital system thought Homer Wells, but this thought shocked him, too. He realized he was looking forward to getting to the poor rabbit's urogenital system. He had a view of the rabbit's skull, he tested himself with the naming of parts, it was so easy for him. How well he remembered Clara and the others who had taught him so much. As for Clara, she was finally buried in the cemetery in street clouds. It was the first burial when Wilbur Larch had wept, Mrs. Grogan knew that his tears were not for Clara. Larch decided to bury Clara because he thought that Homer Wells would never come back. Well, he's wrong, Nurse Angela, said. Even a saint can make a mistake. Homer Wells will be back. He belongs here. Dr. Larch had anticipated the letter that arrived for F. Stone, forwarded from Fuzzy's P. O. Box address. Is this a joke? Nurse Angela asked, turning the envelope around and around. I'll take that, please, Dr. Larch said. It was from the Board of Trustees, as he had expected. That was why they had wanted those follow-up reports from him and why they had requested the addresses of the orphans. They were checking him, Larch knew. The letter to Fuzzy began with good wishes, it said that the board knew a lot about Fuzzy from Dr. Larch, but they wished to know anything further about Fuzzy Street Cloud's experience, anything, naturally, that he wanted to share with them. The Street Cloud's experience sounded to Wilbur Larch like a mystical phenomenon. The attached questionnaire made him furious. The questions were really stupid but he took the business very seriously. He wanted Fuzzy Stone's answers to the questionnaire to be perfect. He wanted to be sure that the Board of Trustees would never forget Fuzzy Stone. There were five questions. Was your life at Street Clouds properly supervised? Have you ever felt that your treatment was especially affectionate or abusive? Did you receive adequate medical attention at Street Clouds? Were you adequately prepared for your new life in a foster home, 
And do you feel your foster home was carefully and correctly chosen? Would you suggest any possible improvements in the methods and management of street clouds? Do you think that a more youthful, energetic staff could improve the situation? Was any attempt made to integrate the daily life of the orphanage with the life of the surrounding community? What community? Screamed Wilbur Larch. We are on this earth to be of use, Wilbur Larch as Fuzzy Stone wrote to the Board of Trustees. It is better to do than to criticize wrote that young idealist, Fuzzy Stone. It is better to do anything than to stand by idly. You tell them, Fuzzy. Thought Dr. Larch. And so Fuzzy Stone told the Board of Trustees that the hospital at Street Clouds was a model of the form. Dr. Larch made me want to be a doctor, Fuzzy wrote. That old guy, Larch, he's an inspiration. You talk about energy, the guy is as full of energy like a teenager. You talk about affectionate, that's about our nurses. They're always hugging and kissing you. But they know how to shake some sense into you, too. You talk about supervised, Fuzzy Stone wrote. Nurse Edna and Nurse Angela don't miss a thing. And some of the girls used to say that Mrs. Grogan knew what they did before they did it, before they even knew they were going to do it. And you talk about community, wrote Fuzzy Stone. Street Clouds was something special. I just remember the people, coming and going, coming and going, they came to look at us, as if we were one of the marvels of Maine. Lar trusted in the dispensary. Nurse Edna looked in once. Wilbur Larch was one of the marvels of Maine to her, and she was worried about him. Larch was a little worried himself, when he woke. The problem is that I have to last, he thought. He could rewrite history but he couldn't touch time. Even if he could convince Homer Wells to go to a real medical school, it would take time. It would take a few years for Fuzzy Stone to complete his training, I have to last until Fuzzy is qualified to replace me, thought Wilbur Larch. When Homer Wells read the questionnaire, which was sent him by the Street Clouds Board of Trustees, he did not know why he felt anxious. Of course, Dr. Larch and the others were getting older, but they were always older to him. He asked himself what might happen to Street Clouds when Dr. Larch was too old. But this thought was so troubling that he tucked the questionnaire into his copy of Practical Anatomy of the Rabbit. Besides, it was the day the migrants arrived, it was harvest time at Ocean View, and Homer Wells was busy. He and Mrs. Worthington met the picking crew at the Apple Mart and led them to the cider house. More than half the crew had picked at Ocean View before and knew the way. The crew boss looked very young to Homer. His name was Arthur Rose, and he looked about Wally's age, he had been the crew boss for five or six years. 
author Rose had done a good job. He brought the right number of pickers, and very few of them ran off, or lost more than a day or two of good work because of too much drinking. And when there was an occasional child among them, the child behaved well. There were always pickers who fell off ladders, but there had been no serious injuries. There were sometimes small accidents around the cider press, but that was during late night work, when the men were tired or drinking a little. And drinking led to the rare accidents when some of the pickers fell off the cider house roof. Olive Worthington never called the crew boss Arthur, no one else called him Arthur, either. For reasons that were never explained to Homer Wells, he was Mr. Rose to everybody. When Olive introduced him to Homer Wells, her respect for the crew boss was clear. Homer, Olive, said, this is Mr. Rose. And this is Homer Wells, Olive added. Glad to know you, Homer, said Mr. Rose. Homer has become my good right hand, Olive said affectionately. Glad to hear that, Homer, said Mr. Rose. He shook Homer's hand strongly. He was no better dressed than the rest of the picking crew. But he wore a real silk necktie for a belt. His shoes were good, and good shoes were vital for farm work. They were old, but well oiled, comfortable looking and in good condition. His suit jacket had a watch pocket, and in it, there was a gold watch that worked. He was very clean shaven, his face was like a smooth brick of the darkest, bitter chocolate. Mr. Rose spoke and moved slowly and modestly. Yet he looked extraordinarily sure of himself. It was a hot, Indian summer day. Mr. Rose and Mrs. Worthington stood talking among the parked farm vehicles in the Apple Mart lot, the rest of the picking crew waited in their cars. There were seventeen pickers and a cook, no women nor children this year, to Olive's relief. Very nice. Mr. Rose said when he saw the flowers in the cider house. Mrs. Worthington touched the rules she had tacked to the wall by the kitchen light switch. And you'll show these to everyone, won't you, please? Olive asked. Oh yes, I'm good at rules, said Mr. Rose smiling. Come back and watch the first press, Homer, Mr. Rose said, as Homer held open the van door for Olive. You can watch us make a little cider. About a thousand gallons one, he added shyly. All we need is eight hours. And about three hundred bushels two of apples, said Mr. Rose. A thousand gallons, he repeated proudly. On the way, back to the apple mart, Olive Worthington said to Homer, Mr. Rose is a real worker. If the rest of them were like him, they could improve themselves. Mr. Rose was the fastest picker in the crew, and he never dropped fruit, he never bruised the apples by bumping his canvas picking bucket against the ladder. 
A little slower, George, he said. If you bruise that fruit, what can you do with it? It can be used just for cider, George answered. That's right, Mr. Rose said. Cider apples are only a nickel a bushel. Okay, George said. In the evening, Homer watched the glow of the cigarettes above the roof of the cider house. When he got cold, he went to watch them pressing and to have a little cider and rum. Mr. Rose was glad to see him. He gave Homer a drink with very little cider in it, and together they watched the orchestra of the pump and grinder. A man named Jack, who had a terrible scar across his throat, aimed the spout. A man named Orange slapped the racks in place, his name was Orange because he had tried to dye his hair once and it turned out orange, but there was no evidence of that color on him now. The rum had made Jack and Orange both savage about their business, yet Homer felt that Mr. Rose, who seemed sober, was still in control. He was the conductor of both the men and the machinery. Let's try to finish the work by midnight, Mr. Rose said calmly. In the other corner of the room, two men were bottling the cider. One of the men began to laugh, and his partner started to laugh with him so loudly that Mr. Rose called out to them, What's so funny? One of the men explained that his cigarette had fallen out of his mouth, into the vat. At this announcement, even Jack and Orange began to laugh, and Homer Wells smiled, but Mr. Rose said quietly, Then you'll have to fish it out. Nobody wants that bad cider. The men were quiet, now. Just the machinery went on with its screaming. Go on, Mr. Rose repeated. The man with the lost cigarette stared into the thousand-gallon vat, it was only half full, but it was still a swimming pool. He took off his rubber boots, but Mr. Rose said, not just the boots. Take off all your clothes, and then go to take a shower, and be quick about it. We have got work to do. What? The man said. I am not going to strip and wash just to go swimming in there. You're filthy all over, said Mr. Rose. Be quick about it. Hey, you can be quick about it, the man said to Mr. Rose. If you want that butt out of there, you can fish it out yourself. Then Orange spoke to the man. What business are you in? Orange asked him. Hey, what? The man asked. What business are you in, man? Orange asked. Say that you were in the apple business, man, Jack advised the man. Say what? The man asked. Just say that you were in the apple business, man, Orange said. At that moment, Mr. Rose took Homer's arm and said to him, Go and see the view from the roof, my friend. Mr. Rose very gracefully led Homer out of the room.
Do you know what business Mr. Rose is in, man? Homer heard Orange asking. He is in the knife business, man, he heard Jack say. Don't go in the knife business with Mr. Rose, Homer heard Orange say. Just stay in the apple business, man, Jack said. Homer was following Mr. Rose up the ladder to the roof when he heard the shower turn on. Except for their cigarettes, the men on the roof were hard to see. But Homer held Mr. Rose's hand and followed him until they found two good seats. You all know Homer, Mr. Rose said to the men on the roof. They greeted Homer. The man called Hero was up there, and the man called Branches, there was someone named Willie, and two or three people whom Homer didn't know and the old cook whose name was Black Pan. Someone handed Homer a bottle of beer, but the bottle was warm and full of rum. It stopped again, Branches said, and everyone stared toward the sea. The nightlife lights of Gate Kenneth were low along the horizon but the high ferris wheel blazed brightly. It was holding still, loading new riders, letting off the old. Maybe it stopped to breathe, Branches said, and everyone laughed at that. Then the Ferris wheel started again. There it goes again. Hero said. It's like a star, Black Pan, the old cook said. It looks cool, but if you get too close, it burns you. It's hotter than a flame. It's a ferris wheel, said Homer Wells. It a what? Willie said. A what wheel? Branches asked. A ferris wheel said Homer Wells. That's the Cape Kenneth Carnival, and that's the Ferris wheel. Mr. Rose nudged him in the ribs, but Homer didn't understand. No one spoke for a long time, and when Homer looked at Mr. Rose, Mr. Rose softly shook his head. I heard of something like that, Black Man said. I think that they had one in Charleston. It stopped again, Hero observed. It's letting off passengers, riders, said Homer Wells. It's taking on new riders. People ride that thing? Branches asked. Mr. Rose said, mildly, You are so uneducated, Homer's having a little fun with you. When the bottle of rum passed from man to man, Mr. Rose just passed it along. Doesn't the name Homer mean anything to you? Mr. Rose asked the men. I think I heard of it, the cook black man said. Homer was the world's first storyteller. Mr. Rose announced. Then he nudged Homer in the ribs again and said, Our Homer knows a good story, too. What kind of wheel do you call it, Homer? Branches asked. A ferris wheel, said Homer Wells. Yeah. Someone said. Everyone laughed. A ferris wheel. 
Hero said. That's pretty good. One of the men whom Homer didn't know rolled off the roof. Everyone waited until he was on the ground before they called down to him. Are you all right? Black Pen asked. Yeah, the man said, and everyone laughed. When Mr. Rose heard the shower start up again, he knew that his bottle man had found the cigarette and was washing the cider off himself. Willie and here go to bottle the cider now, said Mr. Rose. I bottled last time, Hero said. Then you are really good at it, said Mr. Rose. Homer sensed that he should leave the roof with Mr. Rose. They helped each other with the ladder, on the ground. Mr. Rose spoke very seriously to Homer. You have to understand, Mr. Rose whispered. They don't want to know what that thing is. What could it do them to know? Okay, said Homer Wells and walked back through the orchards to the Worthington house. When he saw the light under her bedroom door, he said, quietly, Good night, Mrs. Worthington. I'm back. Good night, Homer, she said. In the morning, Mr. Rose came up to Homer, who was working as a checker in the orchard. I want you to show me that wheel. Mr. Rose said, smiling. The Ferris wheel? Said Homer Wells. If you don't mind showing me, said Mr. Rose. But don't tell anyone about it. Right, Homer said. Then we should go soon before it gets colder and they close it for the season. I'm sure that it's very cold to ride it now. I don't know if I want to ride it until I see it, said Mr. Rose. Sure, said Homer. Mrs. Worthington let him take the van. Mr. Rose was quiet all the way to Cape Kenneth. The summer crowd was gone, some of the carnival events were already closed up. Don't be nervous, Homer said to Mr. Rose. The Ferris wheel is perfectly safe. I'm not nervous about the wheel, said Mr. Rose. Can you see a lot of people of my color around here? Homer had detected nothing hostile in the looks from the people, as an orphan, he always suspected that people stared at him. But now he noticed more of the looks. When they got to the Ferris wheel, there was no line of people. When the wheel stopped, Homer and Mr. Rose got on and sat together in one chair. We could each sit in our own chairs, if you prefer, said Homer Wells. No, said Mr. Rose. When the wheel began its rise, he was very still and straight and held his breath until they were nearly at the top. Over there is the orchard, pointed Homer Wells, but Mr. Rose stared straight ahead. What's so special about doing this? asked Mr. Rose. It's just for the ride, and the view, I guess, said Homer Wells. I like the view from the roof, Mr. Rose said. 
When they started the descent of the wheel turn, Mr. Rose said, It's good that I didn't eat much today. By the time they passed ground level and began their ascent again, a large crowd had formed, but they weren't standing in line for the next ride. When they were at the top of the wheel turn again, Homer realized that the crowd below them had formed to stare at Mr. Rose. They have come to see if niggers fly, Mr. Rose said, but I'm not going to entertain them. They have come to see if the machine is going to break down, trying to carry a nigger, or maybe they want to see me throw up. Just don't do anything, Homer Wells said. That's the advice I hear all my life, boy, Mr. Rose said. As they started their descent, Mr. Rose leaned out of the chair and vomited over the crowd below them. The crowd moved as one, but not everyone moved in time. When their chair was at the bottom of the descent again, the Ferris wheel was stopped so that the sick man could get off. The crowd had moved away, except for a young man who was especially splattered. As Homer Wells and Mr. Rose were leaving the Ferris wheel grounds, the young man came forward and said to Mr. Rose, you look like you wanted to do that. Who wants to get sick? Said Mr. Rose, he kept walking, and Homer kept up with him. The young man was about Homer's age. I think that you wanted to, the young man said to Mr. Rose, who stopped walking away then. What business are you in? Mr. Rose asked the boy. What? The young man asked, but Homer Wells stepped between them. My friend is sick, Homer Wells said. Please just leave him alone. Your friend. The boy said. Ask me what business I'm in, Mr. Rose said to the boy. What business are you in, Mr.? The young man shouted at Mr. Rose. Homer saw that Mr. Rose was standing, very suddenly, chest to chest with a boy. The boy seemed surprised that he was standing so close to Mr. Rose, and so suddenly, he was a little taller, and quite a bit heavier, than Mr. Rose, yet he looked unsure of himself. What business are you in, Mr.? The boy repeated, and Mr. Rose smiled. I'm in the throwing up business. Mr. Rose said in a humble manner. Someone in the crowd laughed, Homer Wells felt relieved, Mr. Rose smiled in such a way that allowed the boy to smile, too. I'm sorry if any of it got on you, Mr. Rose said nicely. No problem, said the young man, turning to leave. After taking a few steps, the boy turned in Mr. Rose's direction, but Mr. Rose had grasped Homer Wells by the arm and was already walking on. Homer saw shock on the boy's face. The young man's flannel jacket which was still zipped shut, was flapping wide open, a single slash had slid it from the collar to the waist, every button on the boy's shirt was gone. 
The boy gaped at himself, and then at Mr. Rose, who did not look back, and then the boy was pulled into the comfort of the crowd. How did you do that? Homer asked Mr. Rose, when they reached the van. Your hands have to be fast, Mr. Rose said. Your knife has to be sharp. But you do it with your eyes. Your eyes keep their eyes off your hands. The wide open jacket of the boy made Homer remember Clara and how a scalpel made no mistakes. Only a hand makes mistakes. His chest was cold, and he was driving too fast. When Homer turned off Drinkwater Road and drove through the orchards to the cider house, Mr. Rose said, You see, I was right, wasn't I? What good is it, to apple pickers, to know about that wheel? Am I right? Mr. Rose demanded. Right, said Homer Wells, Chapter 8 Wally came home for Thanksgiving. Candy had been home for several weekends in the early fall, but Homer had not known how to see her without Wally. Wally was surprised that Homer and Candy hadn't seen each other, and, from Candy's embarrassment with Wally's surprise, Homer detected that she had also wanted a meeting with him. But the turkey was ready, the table was set, and Olive was happy to have a full house again, there was no time to feel embarrassed. Homer volunteered to carve the turkey. He did such a good job that Olive said, You should be a surgeon, Homer. Wally laughed and Ray Kendall said, The boy's just good with his hands. If you've got good hands, if you do a thing, your hands won't forget how? That's like you, Ray, Olive said which moved the attention away from Homer's work with the knife. He carved every bit of meat off the bones as quickly as possible. Wally talked about the war. He said he'd thought about dropping out of college to go to flying school. So if there is a war, if we get into it, I mean then I'll already know how to fly. You won't do such a thing, Olive said to him. Why do you want to do such a thing? Candy asked him. I think you're selfish. What do you mean, selfish? Wally asked. A war is for your country. It's serving your country. To you, it's an adventure, Candy said. You won't do such a thing, anyway, Olive repeated. I was too young to go to the last war, Ray said, and if there's another one, I'll be too old. Lucky you. Olive said. That's right, Candy said. Ray shrugged. I don't know, he said. I wanted to go to the last one. I even tried to lie about my age. Now you know better, Olive said. I'm not so sure of that, Ray said. If there's the new one, there'll be lots of new weapons, they're building things which you can't even imagine. I try to imagine it, 
Wally said. I imagine the war all the time. Except the dying, Wally, Olive Worthington said, carrying the turkey carcass out to the kitchen. I don't think you've imagined the dying. Right, said Homer Wells, who imagined the dying all the time. Candy looked at him and smiled. Why didn't you visit me on the weekends, Homer? She said. Yeah, why didn't you? Wally asked him. Were you too busy with Deborah Pettigrew? Homer just shook his head. He was too busy with the practical anatomy of the rabbit. Olive called from the kitchen. The what? Wally said. But Olive was wrong. After three weeks of senior biology Homer realized that he knew more about the animal and its relation to human anatomy than his teacher, Mr. Hood. Soon Homer received a letter from Dr. Larch. My dear Homer, wrote Dr. Larch, the board of trustees is attempting to communicate with several former residents of street clouds in the form of a ridiculous questionnaire. Answer it, please. And you must be prepared for some other more troubling correspondence from them. It was necessary for me to be frank with them about the health of the orphans. Although I saw no reason to tell them I had lost Fuzzy Stone to a respiratory ailment, I told the board about your heart. I felt that if anything ever happened to me, there should be someone who knew. I apologize for not telling you about your condition. I am telling you now because I would never want you to hear about your heart from someone else first. Now, don't be alarmed. I would not even describe the problem, you had a heart murmur as a small child. But this had almost entirely disappeared when I last checked you, in your sleep. I have delayed even saying about your heart to you because I didn't want to worry you needlessly. Please don't worry. If you're interested in more details, I can provide them. For now. I just didn't want you to become upset by some foolish thing you might hear from that board of trustees. Please avoid any situation of extreme stress. Anyway, I want you to know that you can almost certainly lead a normal life. A normal life? Thought Homer Wells. I am in love with my best friend's girlfriend, but is that what Larch would call extreme stress? He liked the life at Ocean View. He wanted candy, and some life with her. When she went back to Camden, he tried not to think about her, and since he could not think of Wally without thinking of candy. He was relieved when Wally went back to Orano, although he had missed Wally all that fall. When an orphan is depressed, wrote Wilbur Larch, he is attracted to telling lies. A lie keeps you on your toes by making you suddenly responsible for what happens because of it. You must keep your lie a secret. Orphans are not the masters of their fates. But when you lie, 
it makes you feel in charge of your life. Telling lies is very seductive to orphans. I know, Dr. Larch wrote. I know because I tell them, too. I love to lie. When you lie, you feel as if you have cheated fate. And so Homer Wells answered the questionnaire, he sang a hymn of praise to street clouds. He wrote about the restoration of the abandoned buildings of street clouds as one of the many attempts to integrate the daily life of the orphanage with the life of the surrounding community. He wrote with calmness to Dr. Larch. He would appreciate further details about his heart disease. Did Dr. Larch think it necessary, for example, for Homer to have monthly checkups? Dr. Larch would think it unnecessary, of course. And were there ways that he could listen for his murmur? Stay calm, Dr. Larch would advise. One weekend in December, Candy came home from Camden and Homer's confusion about her increased. On the weekends when she came home, she took the train, then Ray drove her back, on Sunday. I'll visit her tomorrow, on Saturday. Homer thought. Homer saw Candy the next day. When she said that she wanted to see the Fred Astaire movie, which was on in Bath, Homer had no objections. I always wanted to see him, he said. Bath, after all, was less than an hour away. Homer and Candy had not found the Italian restaurant in Bath that Ray had recommended, they'd eaten some pizza in the van and had arrived at the movie early. At the ticket booth, Candy said that she would like to take a walk and Homer agreed. They turned away from the theater and walked downhill to the Kennebec. Candy faced the river and leaned against Homer Wells. He had never said the words, I am in love with you. What he felt was only love, but what he thought he felt was his heart. It was difficult to breath. He put both his hands to his chest. Candy turned to him and saw his face. Is it your heart? Candy asked him. Oh God, you don't have to say anything, please don't even think about it. My heart, he said. Do you know about my heart? Don't worry. Candy said. I love you, Homer Wells whispered. Yes, I know, don't think about it, Candy said. Don't worry about anything. I love you, too. You do? He asked. Yes, yes, and Wally too. She said. I love you and I love Wally, don't worry about it, don't even think about it. How do you know about my heart? Asked Homer Wells. We all know about it, Candy said. Olive knows, and Wally knows. Homer Wells felt his heart trace out of control again. Don't think about your heart, Homer. Candy said, hugging him tightly. Don't worry about me, 
or Wally. What should I think about? Asked Homer Wells. Only good things, Candy told him. Good things, said Homer Wells, holding the girl of his dreams. It was not a night for a musical. We can see Fred Astaire dance another time, Candy said philosophically. They drove the van back to Hart's Haven, nobody who knew them saw them come or go. Candy and Homer sat with their backs against opposite corner posts at the end of the dock. They could touch each other with the soles of their feet, but Candy sat with her knees slightly bent. Is it okay? Candy asked quietly. Is what okay? He asked. Your heart, she whispered. How could he tell? I guess so, he said. It'll be okay, she said. What will be okay? Asked Homer Wells. Everything, Candy said hurriedly. Everything, repeated Homer Wells. I love you, that's okay. And you love me, and Wally, that's okay, too? Right, he said. You have to wait and see, Candy said. Right. I don't know what to do, either, said Candy helplessly. We have to do the right thing, Homer Wells said. Wally wants to do the right thing, and Dr. Larch was doing what he thought was the right thing, too. If you could be patient enough to wait and see, the right thing must come itself, mustn't it? What else does an orphan do, anyway? But wait and see. I can be patient, said Homer Wells. Olive Worthington looked at the clock on her night table and turned out her reading lamp. Homer never stayed at so late with Deborah Pettigrew, she thought. Olive didn't imagine Candy's attraction to Homer Wells. Olive had the greatest respect for Homer's diligence. She had seen him be a better student than Wally had ever been, and she knew he was a reliable and friendly companion, too. Well, thank goodness, they are three nice people. She said aloud and her own voice in the empty house surprised her and completely woke her up. Some hot chocolate would be soothing, she thought, and when Homer comes home, he can have some with her. Soon Homer came home. She heard the van in the driveway and she called him. How's Candy? Olive asked at the table. Fine, said Homer Wells. They sipped their hot chocolate, like mother and son, both of them were thinking, and, at the same time, not like mother and son, they both thought. And how are you? Olive asked him, after a while. Just line, said Homer Wells, but what he thought was, I'm going to wait and see. On Sunday evening, Candy was returning to Camden with her father. Raymond Kendall was especially proud of the radio reception he had engineered for his Chevrolet. 
Candy and her father heard the news as soon as anyone in Maine heard it, and they heard it loud and clear. Olive always had the radio on, and so she was one of those people who needed to hear things several times before she really heard them. She was baking an apple pie, and only the unusual urgency in the announcer's voice caused her to pay attention to the radio at all. Homer Wells was in Wally's room, reading David Copperfield and thinking about Candy when Olive interrupted him. Homer Olive called upstairs. Where is Pearl Harbor? Homer Wells didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, he also didn't know what it was. I don't know. He called downstairs. Well, the Japanese have just bombed it. Olive called to him. Do you mean, with planes? asked Homer Wells. From the sky? Of course from the sky. Olive shouted. Come here and listen to this. Where is Pearl Harbor? Candy asked her father, said Raymond Kindle. If we just listen, maybe they'll say. Young Wally Worthington, who wanted so much to be a hero, danced out on the streets of Orano, where he heard the news. Wally wanted to fly a B-24 Liberator, a heavy bomber, four engines, used for bombing bridges, fuel depots, railroad tracks, and so forth. People in Hearts Haven and in Hearts Rock always said that Wally had everything, money, looks, goodness, charm, the girl of his dreams, but he had courage, too, and he had youth's most dangerous qualities, optimism and restlessness. He would risk everything he had to fly the plane that could carry the bomb. Wally joined the Army Air Corps before Christmas, but they allowed him to spend Christmas at home. It would take the Army Air Corps more than a year to teach Wally the arts of aerial warfare. By that time, he told Olive and Candy in the kitchen at Ocean View, all the fighting will probably be over. That would be just my luck. That would be lucky, Olive said. Candy nodded her head. Right. Said Homer Wells, from the other room. He was still thinking about Dr. Large's account of Homer's heart history. Physical examinations were given only to people who were Class I. Homer Wells was Class IV. According to his family physician, Homer had congenital pulmonic stenosis. Homer's family physician was Dr. Large whose letter to the local medical advisory board had been accepted as evidence enough for Homer's deferment, Larch was also a member of the local board. I asked her to marry me, but she refused, Wally told Homer in their shared bedroom. She said she would wait for me, but she wouldn't marry me. She said she would be my wife, but not my widow. Is that what you call waiting and seeing? Homer asked Candy the next day. Yes, Candy said. 
I was going to marry Wally. You came along second. I have to wait and see about you. And now comes the war. I have to wait and see about the war, too. But you made him a promise, said Homer Wells. Yes, Candy said. Isn't a promise like waiting and seeing? Did you ever make a promise, and mean it, and break it? Homer Wells suddenly remembered Melanie. They sent Wally to Fort Meade, Maryland, for the month of January. He was a faithful but terrible letter writer, he wrote to his mother, he wrote to Homer and to Candy, and even to Ray but he never explained anything, if there was a plan to what they were teaching him, Wally either didn't know it or couldn't describe it. He simply wrote in detail about the last thing that had occupied his mind before beginning the letter. Wally was sent to St. Louis, the Jefferson Barracks, Flight 17, 28th School Squadron It struck Homer Wells that the Army Air Corps had a similar structure to Gray's Anatomy. There were many categories and everything had a name. It was reassuring to Homer Wells, in his mind, this endless categorizing made Wally safer. But Homer couldn't convince Candy of this. He's safe one minute, and in another minute he's not safe, she said, shrugging. Look after Homer, look after his heart, Wally had written her. And who's looking after my heart? Yes, I'm still angry, she wrote him although he hadn't asked. But if she was angry with Wally, she was also loyal, she was keeping her promise, about the waiting and seeing. She kissed Homer when she saw him, and when they said goodbye, but she didn't allow him anything else. We're just good friends, she told her father. Ray hadn't asked. I can see that, Ray said. One day when Homer was working in an orchard, Vernon Lynch told him, If I was your age, I'd go to war. I'd do what Wally's doing. I can't, said Homer Wells. Is it because they don't take orphans? Vernon asked. No, Homer said. I have a heart defect. I was born with it. Vernon Lynch was not a gossip, but that was all that Homer needed to say. The workers at Ocean View not only forgave Homer for not joining the army, they even began to take care of him. And in the early spring, when it was time to mend the boxes for the beehives, Ira Titcomb rushed to assist Homer, who was struggling with a particularly heavy pallet. Don't strain yourself, Jesus. Ira said. I can manage, Ira. I'm stronger than you are. Homer said, not understanding, at first, Ira's concern. I have heard that your heart is not very strong, Ira said. On Mother's Day, Vernon Lynch taught him how to operate the sprayers. He insisted on giving Homer another lecture on the use of the respirator. 
you of all people, Vernon told him, should keep this thing on, and keep it clean. Even Deborah Pettigrew forgave him for his strange friendship with Candy. As the weather warmed up, they went parking again and gave each other kisses in the Pettigrew's unoccupied summer house on Drinkwater Lake. When Homer's kisses calmed down, Deborah grew impatient. When his were too passionate, Deborah said, Careful. Don't get too excited. It was spring. Wally was sent to Kelly Field, San Antonio, Texas, for Air Corps Cadet Training Squadron 2, Flight C and in the summer they moved him from San Antonio to Coleman, Texas. I wish someone would declare war on Texas, he wrote to Homer. That might be an excuse for being here. He wrote that he was flying in his undershorts and socks, that was all that any of them could wear in such heat. Where does he think he could go? Candy complained to Homer. Does he expect a perfect climate? He's going to a war. Homer was sitting opposite her on Ray Kendall's dock. In the cool classroom at Cape Kenneth High, Homer often unrolled the map of the world. He used the summer solitude to study the places of the world where Wally could go. Even the migrants were different that harvest, they were both older and younger, all the rest went to war, except for Mr. Rose. That harvest there was a woman whom Mr. Rose called Mama, although she wasn't old enough to be any of their mothers. She only obeyed Mr. Rose, Homer knew this because the woman did what she wanted to do, she cooked a little, but she was not the cook every night, and she was not everyone's cook. Some nights she even sat on the roof, but only when Mr. Rose sat there with her. She was a tall, heavy young woman, and she wore a nearly constant smile copied from Mr. Rose. It surprised Homer that she had her own bed, next to Mr. Rose but no attempt was made to separate their beds with curtains to construct a little privacy. Sometimes, when Homer drove by the cider house, he noted that everyone except Mr. Rose and his woman was either standing outside the house or sitting on the roof. They kept Wally in Texas, yet they moved him once more to Lubbock Flying School. The Army Air Corps had promised to send him home for Christmas. Soon I will be in the bosom of my family. He wrote to Candy, and Homer, and Olive, and even to Ray, who had contributed to the war effort by building torpedoes. He had hired some local boys who were still in school to help him keep his lobster business, and he worked on the vehicles at Ocean View on the weekends. He enthusiastically demonstrated the gyroscope on Olive's kitchen table to Olive and Homer Wells. Before a fellow can understand how the torpedo works, Ray liked to say, he has to understand the gyroscope. Homer was interested, Olive was polite, and what's more, completely dependent on Ray, if he didn't fix all the machinery at Ocean View, Olive was convinced that the apples would stop growing. K. 
Candy was cross much of the time, everyone's war effort depressed her, although she had volunteered to work long hours at Gabe Kenneth Hospital as a nurse's aide. She also convinced Homer that he could be a more useful nurse's aide than most. Right, Homer said. Homer soon found that he felt comfortable there, however, it was at times difficult to refuse to give his expert opinion on certain subjects and to play the role of a beginner. Even the nurses looked down on the nurses' aides, and Homer was irritated to see that the doctors looked down on everyone, most of all, on their patients. Candy and Homer were not allowed to give injections or medication, but they had to make beds, empty bedpans, give baths. They were given delivery room duties. For example, Homer was unimpressed with the obstetrical procedure he saw there. In street clouds, Homer had seen many patients who were so lightly etherized that they could talk throughout their own operations. In Cape Kenneth's recovery rooms, the patients looked awful. It especially angered Homer to see how they dosed the children, as if the doctors or the anesthetists were so uninformed that they didn't consider the patient's body weight. One day he sat with Candy on either side of a five-year-old boy who was recovering from a tonsillectomy. That was nurse's aid work. You sat with the patient coming out of ether, especially the children, especially the tonsillectomies, they were often frightened and in pain and sick when they woke. Homer said they would feel better if they had been given a little less ether. One of the nurses was in the recovery room with them, it was the one they liked a girl about their age. Her name was Carolyn, and she was nice to the patients and tough to the doctors. You know a lot about ether, Homer, Nurse Carolyn said. They overuse it here, in certain cases, Homer mumbled. Hospitals aren't perfect, Nurse Carolyn said. And doctors aren't perfect, either, they just think that they are. Right, said Homer Wells. The five-year-old boy's throat was very sore when he finally woke up, he vomited. One of the things the nurse's aides did was to be sure that the children, in such condition, didn't choke on their own vomit. Homer explained to Candy that it was very important that the child not aspirate, or inhale, any fluid such as vomit into the lungs. Aspirate, Nurse Carolyn said. Was your father a doctor, Homer? Not exactly, said Homer Wells. Nurse Carolyn introduced Homer to young Dr. Harlow. Oh, yes, Wells, our ether expert, Dr. Harlow said snidely. I grew up in an orphanage, said Homer Wells. I did a lot of helping out around the hospital. But surely you never gave an ether? said Dr. Harlow. Surely not, lied Homer Wells. As Dr. Larch had discovered with the Board of Trustees, it was especially pleasant to lie to unlikable people. Don't show off, Candy told Homer when they were driving back to Hearts Haven together.
It could get your doctor large in trouble. When did I show off? Homer asked. You really haven't shown off yet, Candy said. Just don't do it, okay? Homer sulked. And don't sulk, Candy told him. I'm just waiting and seeing, said Homer Wells. You know how that is. He let her out at the lobster pound, he usually came in with her and chatted with Ray. But Homer confused Candy's irritability with coldness toward him. She slammed the door and walked around to his side of the van before he could drive away. She asked him to roll down his window. Then she leaned inside and kissed him on the mouth. She banged her head on the window frame when she pulled herself back from him, her eyes were watery. Do you think that I'm having a good time? She asked him. Do you think that I'm teasing you? Do you think that I know whether I want you or Wally? He drove back to Cape Kenneth Hospital, he needed work more important than mousing. It was the mousing season again, how he hated handling the poison. He arrived at the same time with a sailor who was cut in a knife fight. The sailor's friends had driven him to the hospital. While driving they lost their way and went past several hospitals. The cut between the sailor's thumb and forefinger extended nearly to the sailor's wrist. Homer helped Nurse Caroline wash the wound with ordinary white soap and sterile water. Take his blood pressure, opposite arm, he said to Nurse Carolyn, and put the blood pressure cuff on over a bandage, to protect the skin, he added, because Nurse Carolyn was staring at him curiously. The cuff has to be on there for a half hour or more, said Homer Wells. I think I can give instructions to Nurse Carolyn, if you don't mind, Dr. Harlow said to Homer. Both the doctor and his nurse stared at Homer Wells in amazement. Very neat job, Wells, Dr. Harlow, said. The knife had entered on the side of the palm, observed Homer Wells. He remembered his grace, and he remembered the movie he had seen with Deborah Pettigrew, the cavalry officer with the arrow in his hand, the arrow that fortunately missed the branch of the median nerve that goes to the muscles of the thumb. He watched the sailor move his thumb. Dr. Harlow was looking. There's a very important branch of the median nerve, Dr. Harlow said slowly, to the sailor. You're lucky if that's not cut. The knife missed it, said Homer Wells. Yes, it did, said Dr. Harlow, looking up from the wound. How do you know? You are not only an ether expert, I see, said Dr. Harlow, still snidely. You know all about muscles, too. Just about that one, said Homer Wells. I used to read Gray's Anatomy, for fun, he added. For fun? said Dr. Harlow.
I suppose you know all about blood vessels, then. Why not tell me where all this blood is coming from? Despite Candy's certain disapproval, Homer answered. The blood vessel is a branch of the Palmer Arch, he said. Very good, said Dr. Harlow, disappointed. And what would you recommend I should do about it? Tie it, said Homer Wells. Precisely, said Dr. Harlow. You didn't get that from Grace. He pointed out to Homer Wells that the knife had also cut the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus 1 and the flexor digitorum sublimus 2. And where might they go? He asked Homer Wells. To the index finger, Homer said. Is it necessary to repair both tendons? asked Dr. Harlow. I don't know, said Homer Wells. I don't know a lot about tendons, he added. How surprising, said Dr. Harlow. It is only necessary to repair the profundos, he explained and then I'd recommend a pressure dressing on the palm, you'll want to curve the fingers a little bit around the dressing, Homer said. That's called the position of function, Dr. Harlow said. I don't know what it's called, Homer said. Were you ever in medical school, Wells? Dr. Harlow asked him. Not exactly, said Homer Wells. Do you plan to go? Dr. Harlow asked. It's not likely, Homer said. He tried to leave the operating room then, but Dr. Harlow called after him. Why aren't you in the service? He asked. I've got a heart problem, Homer said. I don't think you know what it's called, said Dr. Harlow. Right, said Homer Wells. He went and read some stories to the tonsillectomy patients. They were all stupid stories, children's books didn't impress Homer Wells. But the tonsillectomy patients wouldn't like to hear David Copperfield or Great Expectations. Olive was not home when Homer returned to Ocean View. Homer was alone in the house. I could learn a lot of things. He was thinking. And I can learn everything about apple farming. But what he already knew, he knew, was almost perfect obstetrical procedure and the much easier procedure, which was against the rules. He thought about rules. That sailor with the slashed hand had not been in a knife fight that was according to anyone's rules. In a fight with Mr. Rose, there would be Mr. Rose's own rules, whatever they were. Mr. Rose was an artist. The real cider house rules were Mr. Rose's. And what were the rules at Street Clouds? What were Large's rules? Which rules did Dr. Large observe, which ones did he break, or replace, and with what confidence? Clearly, Candy was observing some rules, but whose? 
And did Wally know what the rules were? And did Melanie obey any rules? Wondered Homer Wells. Wally had trouble coming back from Texas. There were a series of delays, and bad weather, the landing field was closed. When Homer and Candy picked him up in Boston, the first thing he told them was that he had only 48 hours. He was still happy, however. Second Lieutenant Worthington Wally announced to Olive. Everyone cried, even Ray. Homer wondered when Wally would want to be alone with Candy and how they would manage it. Surely, he wants to manage it, Homer thought. And Homer didn't know if she wanted to manage it, too. For Christmas Eve, everyone was together. Olive was home, and Ray wasn't building torpedoes or pulling lobster traps. And the day after Christmas, Candy and Homer had to take Wally back to Boston. Oh, Candy and Wally hugged and kissed a lot, everyone could see that. On Christmas night, in Wally's bedroom, Homer realized that he'd been so glad to see Wally that he'd forgotten to send Dr. Larch anything, not even a Christmas card. Ray went early to build the torpedoes, and Homer observed that Wally left Ocean View at about the same time. Homer spent the early morning with Olive. 48 hours is not what I'd call coming home, she said. He hasn't been here for a year, does he call this a proper visit? Does the army call it a proper visit? Candy and Wally came to pick up Homer before noon. Homer imagined that they had managed it. But how does one know such things without asking? Do you want me to drive? Homer asked. Why? Wally asked. Maybe you want to hold hands, Homer said, Candy looked at him. We've already held hands, Wally said, laughing. But thank you, anyway. Candy did not look amused, Homer thought. So you've done it, you mean? Homer Wells asked them both. Candy stared straight ahead, and Wally didn't laugh this time. What's that, old boy? He asked. I said, so you've done it, had sex, I mean, said Homer Wells. Jesus, Homer, said Wally. That's a fine thing to ask. Yes, we've done it, had sex, Candy said, still looking straight ahead. I hope you were careful, Homer said, to both of them. I hope you took some precautions. Jesus, Homer. Wally said. Yes, we were careful, Candy, said. Now she stared at him, her look was as neutral as possible. Well, I'm glad you were careful, Homer said, speaking directly to Candy. You should be careful, having sex with someone who's about to fly over Burma. Burma? 
Candy turned to Wally. You didn't say where you were going, she said. Is it Burma? I don't know where I'm going, Wally said irritably. Jesus, Homer, what's the matter with you? I love you both, said Homer Wells. If I love you, I've got a right to ask anything I want, I've got a right to know anything I want to know. It was, as they say in Maine, a real conversation stopper. They rode almost all the way to Boston in silence, except that Wally said, trying to be funny, I don't know about you, Homer. You're becoming very philosophical. I love you both, too, you know, Wally said, saying goodbye. I know you do, Homer said. On the way home, Candy said to Homer Wells, I wouldn't say philosophical, I would say eccentric. You're becoming very eccentric, in my opinion. And you don't have a right to know everything about me, whether you love me or not. You have to know for yourself if you really love him, Homer said. Do you love Wally? I've grown up loving Wally, Candy said. I have always loved Wally, and I always will. Fine, Homer said. That's all, then. But I don't even know Wally, anymore, Candy said. I know you better, and I love you, too. Homer Wells sighed. So we should wait and see again, he thought. And Wally went to Victorville, California, Advanced Flying School. U.S. Army Air Forces, that is what his envelopes said. Wally spent several months in Victorville. Shortly after apple blossom time Wally was sent to India. They made him a captain. Wally had won the best name for a plane competition. He named his own plane Opportunity Knox. The painted fist under the inscription looked very impressive. He flew the India, China route, over the Himalayas, over Burma. He carried gasoline and bombs and artillery and rifles and ammunition and clothing and aircraft engines and spare parts and food to China. He brought military personnel back to India. It was a seven-hour flight, about 500 miles. For six of the hours he wore an oxygen mask. They had to fly so high. Over the mountains, they flew high because of the mountains. Over the jungles, they flew high because of the Japanese. When he left Assam, the temperature was 40 degrees above zero. They wore just their shorts and socks. The heavily loaded transports needed to rise to 15,000 feet in 35 minutes. At 9,000 feet, Wally put on his pants. At 14,000, he put on the fleece line suit. It was 20 degrees below zero up there. They called that aerial route the lifeline. They called it flying over the hump. That summer of 194, they closed the Cape Kenneth Drive-In Theater, 
because it was necessary to use the minimum of shore lights. Mr. Rose informed Olive that he would be unable to provide a picking crew for the harvest. Considering the men who are gone, he wrote. Homer Wells was cutting the grass when the news came to him. He didn't hear what Candy was yelling when she jumped out of the van and ran to him. Olive was driving, her face was like a stone. Shot down. Candy was screaming. When Homer finally switched off the mower, he was shot down over Burma. Over Burma, said Homer Wells. He held the sobbing girl in his arm. Chapter 9 Two weeks after Wally's plane was shot down, Captain Worthington and the crew of Opportunity Knox were still listed as missing. A spokesman for the U.S. Army Air Forces paid a personal visit to Olive and told her that there was some reason to be optimistic. That the plane obviously had not exploded in the air meant that the crew might be alive. Homer supported Olive and Candy's view that Wally was not dead, that he was just missing. Privately, Homer and Ray Kendall agreed that there wasn't much hope for Wally. Just suppose that he didn't go down with the plane, Ray said to Homer. So then he's in the middle of the jungle, and what does he do there? He can't let the Japanese find him, but they're around, they shot down the plane, didn't they? There could be natives, said Homer Wells. Friendly Burmese villagers, he suggested. Or nobody at all, Ray Kendall said. Some tigers, and lots of snakes, he added. If your friend survived, wrote Wilbur Larch to Homer Wells, he's got to worry about all the diseases of Asia, lots of diseases. It was horrible to imagine Wally suffering, and even Homer's love for Candy could not allow him any comfort to think that Wally was already dead. Reality, for orphans is so often outdistanced by their ideals, if Homer wanted candy, he wanted her ideally. In order for candy to choose Homer, Wally had to be alive, and because Homer loved Wally, he also wanted Wally's blessing. Wouldn't any other way be compromising to them all? Wilbur Larch was flattered that Homer asked his advice, especially on a matter of romantic love. How should I behave with Candy? Homer had asked. Larch was so proud of what he had written to Homer that he showed his letter to his old nurses before sending it. Have you forgotten when life is like at street clouds? Dr. Larch asked Homer. Have you drifted so far away from us that you find a life of compromise to be unacceptable? Have you forgotten how to be of use? Don't think so badly of compromises. We don't always choose the ways we can be of use. You say that you love her, then let her use you. It may not be the way you had in mind, but if you love her, you have to give her what she needs. And what can she give you of herself? Only what she has left, 
And if that's not everything you had in mind, whose fault is that? Are you not going to accept her because she hasn't got 100% of herself to give? Some of her is over Burma, are you going to reject the rest? And do you call that being of use? Now Homer had a companion in sleeplessness. He and Candy preferred the night shift at Gate Kenneth Hospital. When there was a quiet period in their work, they were allowed to doze on the beds in the children's ward. Homer found that the music of the restless children soothed him. Their troubles and pains were familiar, their whimpers and outcries and night terrors were transporting him beyond his own anxieties. And Candy felt that the drawn, black curtains in the nighttime hospital were suitable for mourning. Homer Wells had spent many years wondering if his mother would ever return to take him if she even thought about him, if she was alive or dead. So he was better at accepting Wally's undefined status than the rest of them were. An orphan understands what it means that someone important is just missing. Olive and Candy, mistaking Homer's composure for indifference were occasionally short-tempered with him. I'm only doing what we all have to do, he said to Candy. I'm just waiting and seeing. A month after Wally's plane was shot down, they heard from the crew of Opportunity Knox. We were halfway to China, the co-pilot wrote when the Japanese attacked. Captain Worthington ordered the crew to bail out. The crew chief and the radio men jumped close together, the co-pilot jumped third. The top of the jungle was so dense that when the first man crashed through it, he could not see the other parachutes. The jungle itself was so thick that the crew had to search for the others, it took him seven hours to find the radio man. The rain was so heavy that none of the men heard the plane explode. The atmosphere was so rich with its own scents that the smell of the burning gasoline and the smoke from the fire never reached them. When they looked up, they could not see through the tree tops which everywhere glittered with bright green pigeons. In seven hours, the crew chief contacted thirteen leeches of various sizes, which the radio men removed. The crew chief plucked fifteen leeches off the radio man. They found that the best way to remove the leeches was to touch the lighted end of a cigarette to their ends, that way, they release their contact with the flesh. If you just pulled them, they kept breaking, their strong sucking mouths would remain attached. The radio men and the crew chief ate nothing for five days. When it rained, they drank the rain water that gathered in puddles in the big palm leaves. They were afraid to drink the other water they encountered. In some of the water, they saw crocodiles. Because the radio man was afraid of snakes, the crew chief did not point at the snakes he saw. The crew chief was afraid of tigers, and he thought that he saw one, once, but the radio men said that they only heard a tiger, or several tigers, or the same tiger, several times. 
The crew chief said that the same tiger followed them for five days. The leeches tired them out, they said. Although the roof of the jungle made the rain louder, it kept the rain from falling directly on the two men, yet the jungle was so saturated that the rain almost constantly dripped on them. The radio men and the crew chief had no idea where Wally and the co-pilot were. On the fifth day, they met up with the co-pilot, who reached a native village only a day ahead of them. Since he'd been traveling alone, he'd had no one to burn off the leeches he couldn't reach. In the middle of his back, there had been a lot of them. The natives were skillful at removing leeches. They used a lighted stalk of bamboo, like a cigar. The natives were Burmese, and friendly, although they spoke no English, they made it clear that they didn't like the Japanese invasion, and also that they knew the way to China. The Burmese let them know they were not safe to stay and wait for a Wally where they were. Some of the villagers were ready to lead the co-pilot, the crew chief, and the radio men into China. For that trip, they darkened their skin with mashed berries and tied orchids in their hair, they didn't want to look like white men. The trip took 20 days, walking. They traveled 225 miles. They cooked no food, at the end of the journey, their rice was moldy, there was so much rain. Each man lost about 40 pounds one. When they reached their base in China, they were hospitalized for a week. Then they were flown back to India, where the co-pilot was retained in the hospital for diagnosis and treatment of an amoeba. No one could say what amoeba it was. The crew chief had a colon problem, he was also retained. The radio man and his ringworm went back to work. They took all our things when they put us in the hospital in China, he wrote to Olive. When they gave it back to us, it was all lumped together. There were four compasses. There were just three of us, but there were four compasses. One of us jumped out of the plane with Captain Worthington's compass. In the radio men's opinion, it was better to crash with the plane than to land in that part of Burma without a compass. In August of 194, Burma officially declared war against Great Britain and the United States. Candy told Homer that she needed a new place to sit, to be left alone. The dock made her want to jump off, she'd sat too many times on that dock with Wally. I know a place, Homer told her. He meant the cider house. When it rained, Candy sat inside and listened to the drops on the tin roof. She wondered if the jungle sounded as loud as that, or louder. When the weather was clear, Candy sat on the roof. Some nights she allowed Homer Wells to tell her stories there and Homer Wells told Candy everything. Olive Worthington sat in Wally's room with the lights off, that way, if Homer looked into the house from the outside, he wouldn't see her sitting there. She knew that Homer and Candy were at the cider house, 
and she tried to tell herself that it was good. Homer was powerless to comfort Olive, in truth, Homer's presence now irritated Olive, but she criticized herself for this irritation. And she didn't consider Candy unfaithful. Olive knew that Candy could not give Wally up if there was a hope that he was alive. He doesn't feel dead. Olive thought. And it isn't Homer's fault that he is here and Wally is there, she reminded herself. That night in August, the trees were full, and the apples were a pale green going to pink. The grass in the rows between the trees was knee-high. That night there was an owl hooting. Candy and Homer also heard a fox bark. Foxes can climb trees, said Homer Wells. No, they can't, Candy said. Apple trees, anyway, Homer said. Wally told me. He's alive, Candy whispered. Homer saw her tears sparkle, her face was wet and salty when he kissed her. It was awkward to kiss on the cider house roof. I love you, said Homer Wells. I love you, too, Candy said. But he's alive. He isn't, Homer said. I love him, Candy said. I know you do, said Homer Wells. I love him, too. Candy lowered her shoulder and put her head against Homer's chest so that he couldn't kiss her. He held her with one arm while his other hand strayed to her breast, where it stayed. This is so hard. She whispered, but she let his hand stay where it was. There were distant flashes of light, out to sea. Homer Wells held Candy around her hips, to help her off the roof. It was dangerous to kiss on top of the cider house, it was more dangerous for them on the ground. They were standing together, arms loosely around each other's waists. His chin was touching her forehead. They leaned against each other as they walked to the cider house. They were careful not to let the door bang. They preferred the darkness, because they did not reach for the light switch in the kitchen. They didn't see the cider house rules that were tacked next to it. They went to the sleeping quarters, where the twin rows of iron beds stood with the old mattresses rolled in army barracks fashion at the foot of each bed. They unrolled one. Homer felt her hands grip him hard, she held him tight. The moan that escaped her then was sharper than the bed springs and nearly as loud as Homer's own sound. Candy Kendall clung to Homer Wells, oh, how she clung. The breath left them both. They could not move from their embrace. For one thing, the mattress was so narrow. It was only possible to share that mattress if they remained joined together, and for another, they had waited so long, they had anticipated so much. They shared both a love and a grief, because they were sure that Wally was dead. And, after lovemaking, their expressions were not so full of delight as the expressions of most lovers after lovemaking. 
Homer Wells, with his face pressed into Candy's hair, lay dreaming. The pulse in Candy's temple, which touched his own pulse, was soothing to Homer. There was a tear on Homer's face, he thanked Wally in his mind. And, in the darkness, a part of Candy was still over Burma. Their first night of passion, which had been so slowly building between them, ended in the haste, they took measures to avoid an unwanted pregnancy. I love you, Homer repeated. There were both passion and anger in Candy's goodnight kiss. Homer stood for a while in the parking lot behind the lobster pound. The night's heat was gone. A cool, damp fog rolled in from the sea. Nearly three months after Wally's plane was shot down, the harvest in ocean view began and Candy Kindle knew she was pregnant. After all, she was familiar with the symptoms, so is Homer Wells. There was a mixed crew of pickers that year, there were housewives and dwarbrites falling out of trees, and students dismissed from the local schools. Olive made Homer a crew boss of the high school kids whose methods of bruising the fruit were so various that Homer was kept very busy. Candy worked in the mart, she told Olive that her frequent fits of nausea were probably caused by the smell of diesel fuel that was constant around the farm vehicles. Oliver remarked that she thought the daughter of a mechanic and lobsterman would be less sensitive to strong odors. So she suggested that Candy should work in the fields, but Candy admitted that climbing trees also made her feel sick. I never knew that you were so delicate, Olive said. If I work as hard as I can, Candy told Homer, it's possible that I'll miscarry. It was not very possible, Homer Wells knew. What if I don't want you to miscarry? Homer asked her. What if? Candy asked. What if I want you to marry me, and to have the baby? Homer asked. We have to wait and see, Candy said. We don't have much time to wait, said Homer Wells. We don't have much time to see. I shouldn't marry you for a year, or more, Candy said. I really want to marry you, but what about Olive? We have to wait. The baby won't wait, Homer said. We both know where to go, not to have the baby, Candy said. Or to have it, said Homer Wells. It's my baby, too. When they sat on Ray Kendall's dock now, they sat close together. And they didn't sit for long, it was getting cold. Ray Kendall felt sorry for them, and it was because of Olive, he knew, that Homer and Candy were forced to feel miserable loving each other. You should just go away, Ray said out the window to Homer and Candy, he spoke very softly and the window was closed. Homer was afraid that if he insisted to Candy that she should marry him, insisted that she should have their baby, that he would force her to reject him completely. 
He also knew that Candy was afraid of Olive. Homer knew that Candy would marry him, and have their baby on the same day, if she thought she could avoid telling Olive the truth. Candy didn't want Olive to judge her harshly for her insufficient faith. Candy didn't believe that Wally was alive. Homer already knew that he loved Candy, and wanted her. Now he discovered that he wanted her child more than he wanted her. They were just another trapped couple, more comfortable with their illusions than they were with the reality of their situation. After the harvest, Homer said to Candy, We'll go to St. Cloud's. I'll say that they need me there. It's probably true, anyway. And because of the war, no one else is paying attention to them. You could tell your dad that it's just another kind of war effort. We could both tell Olive that we feel an obligation, to be where we're really needed, to be of more use. Do you want me to have the baby? Candy asked him. I want you to have our baby, said Homer Wells. And after the baby's born, and you're both recovered, we'll come back here. We'll tell your dad, and Olive, or we'll write them, that we've fallen in love and that we've gotten married. And that we conceived a child before we did any of that? Candy asked. We'll say that the baby is adopted, Homer said. We'll say that we felt a further obligation, to the orphanage. I really feel that, in a way, anyway. He added, Our baby is adopted? Candy asked. So we have a baby who thinks it's an orphan? No, Homer said. We have our own baby, and it knows it's ours. We just say it's adopted, just for Olive's sake, and just for a while. That's lying, Candy said. Right, said Homer Wells. That's lying for a while. Maybe, when we came back, with the baby, maybe we wouldn't have to say it was adopted. Maybe we could tell the truth then, Candy said. Maybe, Homer said. Maybe everything is waiting and seeing, he thought. He put his mouth on the back of her neck. If we thought that Olive could accept it, if we thought that she could accept, about Wally, Candy added, then we wouldn't have to lie about the baby, would we? Right, said Homer Wells. What is all this worrying about lying? He wondered, holding Candy tightly as she softly cried. Was it true that Wilbur Larch had no memory of Homer's mother? Was it true that Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna had no memory of his mother, either? Maybe it was true. But Homer Wells didn't blame them if they had lied, because they had done it only to protect him. And if they'd remembered his mother, and his mother was a monster, wasn't it better that they'd lied? To orphans, not every truth is wanted. Whatever is brought to me, whatever is coming, Homer thought. I will not move out of its way. Life was finally about to happen to him.
The journey back to street clouds was actually going to give him his freedom from street clouds. He would have a baby if not a wife, too. He would need a job. Of course I'll take the baby trees, and plant them, he was thinking, as if apple trees were what Wilbur Larch wanted from him. By the end of the harvest, the light grew grayer and the orchards were darker in the daytime, although more light passed through the empty trees. The ground was already frozen in street clouds. Homer thought that he would have to make a special trip for the baby trees in the spring. Homer and Candy worked only the night shifts at Gabe Kenneth Hospital now. The days when Ray was building the torpedoes were the days, which Homer could spend with Candy, in her room above the lobster pound. There was a freedom about their lovemaking, now that Candy was already pregnant. Although she could not tell him, not yet, Candy loved making love to Homer Wells. But she could not say aloud that anything was better than with Wally, although making love was better with Homer, she doubted that this was Wally's fault. She and Wally had never had the time to feel so free. The girl and I are coming, Homer wrote to Dr. Larch. She's going to have my baby, neither an abortion nor an orphan. It's a wanted baby. Nurse Angela said. We're going to have a wanted baby. And I suppose he's going to plant the damn trees, said Dr. Larch. What does he want a baby for? How can he have a baby and go to college, or to medical school? When was he ever going to go to medical school, Wilbur? Nurse Edna asked. I knew he'd be back. Nurse Angela shouted. Here is his home. That's true, said Wilbur Larch. Homer said to Olive Worthington, I don't want to go away, especially now when Christmas is coming, but I have to leave because there is something, and someone, I've been neglecting. It's St. Clouds. They always need the same things, and now that there's a war, and everyone is making an effort for the war, I think St. Clouds is more forgotten than ever. And Dr. Larch isn't getting any younger. I should be of more use than I am here. The harvest is over. I don't feel I have enough to do. At St. Clouds, there's always too much to do. You're a fine young man, said Olive Worthington. It was an early November morning in the kitchen at Ocean View. Olive had not done her hair or put her makeup on. Mrs. Worthington looked older to Homer. She was using the string of her tea bag to squeeze the last tea from the bag, and Homer could not raise his eyes from the knotted veins in the backs of her hands. She had always smoked too much, and in the morning, she always coughed. Candy is coming with me, said Homer Wells. Candy is a fine young woman, Olive said. It is most unselfish of you both to give comfort to unwanted children. 
The string across the tea bag was so taut that Homer thought it would cut the bag. Olive's voice was very formal. She was trying not to cough. I could never thank you enough for everything you've done for me, Homer said. Olive Worthington just shook her head, her shoulders were squared, her chin was up, her back was straight. I'm so sorry about Wally, said Homer Wells. There was the slightest movement in Olive's throat, but the muscles of her neck were rigid. He's just missing, Olive said. Right said Homer Wells. He put his hand on Olive's shoulder. She gave no indication that the presence of his hand was either a burden or a comfort, but after they remained like that for a while, she turned her face to rest her cheek on top of his hand, there they remained for a while longer. Olive insisted that Homer should take the white cattle egg. Well, Ray said to Candy and to Homer, I think it's good for you both that you stick together. As the cattle egg was leaving the parking lot, Ray called out to them, and try having some fun together. Somehow, he doubted that they had heard him. Who goes to street clouds to have fun? I have not really been adopted, thought Homer Wells. I am not really betraying Mrs. Worthington, she never said she was my mother. Even so, Homer and Candy did not talk a lot on the drive. When Homer drove to the hospital entrance of the boys' division, it was snowing. Larch and his nurses had argued about where Homer and Candy would sleep. Larch assumed that Candy would sleep in the girls' division and that Homer would sleep where he used to sleep, with the other boys but the women reacted strongly to this suggestion. Their lovers. Nurse Edner pointed out. Surely they sleep together. Well, surely they have slept together, Larch, said. That doesn't mean that they have to sleep together here. Homer said he was going to marry her, Nurse Edner pointed out. He is going to, grumbled Wilbur Larch. I think it would be nice to have someone sleeping with someone else here, Nurse Angela said. It seems to me, said Wilbur Larch that we're doing the job because there's too much sleeping together. They're lovers. Nurse Edna repeated angrily. And so the women decided that Candy and Homer would share a room with two beds on the ground floor of the girls' division, how they arranged the beds was their own business. Mrs. Grogan said that she liked the idea of having a man in the girls' division. Occasionally, the girls complained of an intruder, having a man around at night was a good idea. Besides, Mrs. Grogan said, I'm all alone over there, you three have each other. We all sleep alone over here. Dr. Larch said. Well, Wilbur, Nurse Edna said, don't be so proud of it. Nurse Edna had tried to keep a little supper warm for Homer and Candy. Mrs. Grogan, who was praying in the girls' division, did not see the cattle at come up the hill. 
Nurse Angela was in the delivery room, preparing a woman for giving birth. Homer and Candy passed by the empty dispensary. They peeked into Nurse Angela's empty office. From the dormitory, they could hear Dr. Large's reading voice. Although Candy held tightly to his hand, Homer Wells was in a hurry, in order not to miss the bedtime story. Homer and Candy enjoyed the life of a young married couple that winter in street clouds. There was no chore, which the lovely and growingly pregnant young woman refused to do. Dr. Larch devoted himself to teaching Homer more about pediatrics, since Homer's obstetrical procedure was perfect and since Homer didn't want to participate in the abortions. The rigidity of his position puzzled even Candy, who was fond of saying to Homer, Just explain it to me again how you're not disapproving of the procedure, but you refuse to perform it. Right, said Homer Wells, he had no doubts. There's nothing else to explain. I think that an abortion should be available to anyone who wants it, but I never want to perform the operation. What's hard to understand about that? Nothing, Candy said, but she kept asking him about it. You think that it's wrong, yet you think that it should be legal, right? Right, said Homer Wells. I think that it's wrong, but I also think that it should be everyone's personal choice. In Candy's fifth month, they began sleeping in separate beds, but they drew the beds together. It was the best Christmas ever in street clouds. Olive sent so many presents, and Candy's example, as the first happily pregnant woman, was a present to them all. They had a turkey, and Dr. Larch and Homer Wells had a carving contest, which Homer won. Secretly, Larch was very pleased with Homer's knife work. Homer had never been happier. He was of use, he was in love, and was loved and he was expecting a child. In April Candy was so huge that she hardly slept at all. The morning when the hill was already without snow, Homer Wells tested the ground. He was afraid to wait any longer before the trip to Hearts Rock for the trees. He didn't want to be away when Candy delivered. Olive was surprised to see him, and by his request to give him one of the pickup trucks to transport the baby trees. I want to plant a standard for a by 40 orchard one, Homer told Olive. Olive asked him how Candy was and why she hadn't come with him. He told her that Candy was too busy. Everyone liked her, and the kids just hung on her. It would be hard to leave, when the time came, Homer confided to Olive, they were so needed. Well, it's really hard to find even one day off, like this, Homer said. You mean you won't spend the night? Olive asked. I'm too busy, Homer said, but we'll both be back in time to put out the bees. That'll be about Mother's Day, Olive said. Right, said Homer Wells.
he kissed Olive, whose skin was cool and smelled like ash. Meanie Hyde and Herb Fowler helped him load the pickup. When Homer returned, Dr. Larch helped him unload the trees. They're very thin, aren't they? Larch asked. They won't give much fruit for eight or ten years, Homer said. Then I doubt that I'll eat any of it, said Wilbur Larch. Well, Homer said, even before there are apples on the trees, the trees will make the hill beautiful. It was the middle of April before Homer could dig the holes and plant the 40 by 40 orchard. He did it in three days, his back was so stiff at night that he slept as restlessly and uncomfortably as candy. It was the first warm night of the spring, candy felt the start of giving birth. Homer helped her to the hospital entrance of the boys' division. Nurse Edna prepared candy while Homer went to talk to Dr. Large, who was waiting in Nurse Angela's office. I deliver this one, Large said. Fathers are a bother in the delivery room. If you want to be there, just mind your own business. Right, said Homer Wells. He was nervous, and Dr. Larch smiled at him. Nurse Edna was with Candy, while Nurse Angela was preparing the delivery room. Homer had already put his mask on when he heard a commotion from the boys' sleeping room. He left the mask on when he went to investigate. One of the boys had got up and gone outside to pee. This had disturbed a large raccoon, and it scared the boy. Homer tried to calm down the children, he wanted to get back to the delivery room. Be quiet. Candy's having her baby, now, Homer said. What's she having? One of the boys asked. Either a boy or a girl, said Homer Wells. What will you name it? Another one asked. Nurse Angela named me, Homer said. Me, too. Several of them said. If it's a girl, I'll name her Angela, said Homer Wells. And if it's a boy? If it's a boy, I'll name him Angel, Homer said. That's really just Angelo without the last hay. Angel? Someone asked. Right, said Homer Wells and kissed them all good night. As he was leaving, someone asked him, And will you leave it here? No, Homer said and went to the delivery room. When Nurse Angela heard that the child would be named after her, she wept. When the baby was born, Nurse Sedna announced to Candy, It's an angel. After the placenta was born Dr. Large said, Perfect. Then, as he had never done before, he kissed Candy. Angel Wells was 8 pounds, 7 ounces 1 and neither an orphan nor an abortion. Every two days there was a ritual weighing of Angel Wells. It was always conducted in the dispensary, Nurse Angela kept the record, 
Dr. Large and Homer checked Angel's belly and looked into Angel's eyes. Admit it, Nurse Edna said to Candy and Homer at one such weighing in ceremony. You like it here. That day, in street clouds, it was about zero degrees, the wet snow, with which the morning had begun, had turned to freezing rain. That day, in Hearts Rock, Olive Worthington had her own secret. She didn't want to share the news through the telephone. Olive sent them her secret in a telegram, that gave everyone a little more time. Candy saw the telegram first. She was nursing Angel in the girls' division, when Mrs. Grogan brought her the telegram. The telegram was an obvious shock to Candy. She quite abruptly handed Angel to Mrs. Grogan, although Angel didn't have enough milk yet. It astonished Mrs. Grogan that Candy, in spite of the weather, ran outdoors and across to the hospital entrance of the boys' division. At the time, Homer was asking Dr. Larch if he Larch thought that an X-ray of his Homer's heart might be informative to Homer. Wilbur Larch was thinking very carefully about his answer when Candy rushed in. A hundred and five pounds, said Homer Wells. Alive, Candy whispered. Paralyzed. Nurse Angela, said. Encephalitis, said Wilbur Larch. How could his temperature be 92 degrees, Wilbur? Nurse Edna asked. Dr. Larch didn't know. It was another one of those details the clarification of which would take quite a long time. For Captain Worthington, who had abandoned his plane over Burma, about ten months ago, the clarification of many such details would take years. It was raining so heavily when he jumped that it seemed to Wally that his parachute had to push against the rain to open. He landed in a teak tree, a branch of which separated his shoulder. The pain in his shoulder caused him to lose consciousness. It was dark when he woke up, and since he couldn't see how far below the ground was, he didn't dare to free himself from the shoot cords until morning. Then he gave himself too much morphine, for his shoulder, and lost the syringe in the dark. In his haste to abandon the plane, he'd not had time to find a machete, in the morning he had to cut through the shoot cords using only his bayonet. When he got to the ground, he sprained his ankle. What was worse? he discovered that his compass was gone. Wally had no idea where China was. China was east of Wally, but Wally went south. After three days, the jungle was thinning out. It was also getting warmer. There were so many leeches that he gave up removing them. Every night he climbed a tree and slept in its crotch. One day he saw a python. It was lying on a rock, swallowing something like a monkey, although Wally couldn't remember if he had seen any monkeys. He had seen monkeys, of course, but he'd forgotten them, he had a fever. 
He tried to take his temperature, but the thermometer in his first aid kit was broken. One day he saw a tiger and noticed the mosquitoes. The climate was changing, the forest was changing, too. He caught a fish with his hands and ate its raw liver. He cooked frogs as big as cats. Another day he ate something like a mango. The fruit had no taste, and for a whole day, he vomited. Then he saw a river turning into a bigger river. Wally decided to build a raft with bamboo and vines. The green bamboo was very heavy. He noticed more mosquitoes, especially when the river broadened and the current slowed down, and he just drifted. He had no idea how many days he drifted, or when he first knew for certain that he had a fever. One day he remembered waving to the women in the rice paddy fields, they looked so surprised to see him. So he had gone into the heart of Burma, he was much nearer to Mandalay than he was to China, and the Japanese held Mandalay. But Wally had a fever of 104, he just drifted. A Burmese man carried Wally off the raft and gave him a shelter. The man and his wife took care of Wally. They were very nice people. They gave him rice and tea and lots of things with curry. When his fever went down, Wally ate Banthana's noodles and chicken and Gasak Ken curried fish balls. When his temperature was normal and he stopped vomiting, when the headaches were over and the shaking chills were gone, then he noticed the paralysis. Wally's arms and legs stuck straight out and he couldn't move them. He was delirious for two or three weeks and when he tried to talk, his speech was slow. He had trouble eating because of the tremors in his lips and tongue. He couldn't empty his bladder and the natives had to catheterize him with a tiny, rough bamboo shoot, in order for him to urinate at all. It is a shame that they weren't more careful when they catheterized him. The bamboo shoot wasn't always clean, the catheter's roughness hurt him and made him bleed, but it was the dirtiness that gave him the infection. The infection of Epididymus made him sterile. Months later, he heard bombing. They were bombing the oil fields along the Irrawaddy. Wally knew where he was. He used to bomb those fields, too. Before he heard the bombing, he was taken to a doctor in Mandalay. They had disguised Wally as a woman. Wally was a woman and an invalid then, which made him an untouchable. They had made him look Eurasian and it also made him an outcast. The doctor had trouble explaining to Wally what was wrong with him. He said the following in English, Japanese be mosquito. By the time he heard the bombing of the Irrawaddy, the paralysis had left his upper extremities, his legs were still paralyzed. His bladder was okay, his sexual function felt normal. There are no autonomic effects to encephalitis, Wilbur Large explained to Candy and to Homer Wells. What does that mean? Candy asked. 
It means that Wally can have a normal sex life, said Homer Wells, who didn't know about Wally's epididymis. Wally could have a normal sex life, but he could never make his own baby. At the time, none of them knew that Wally had been sterilized, they knew only about the encephalitis. Wally caught it from the mosquitoes. It was called Japanese bee encephalitis, and it was quite common in Asia during the war. Homer Wells sent a telegram to Olive, God bless you and Wally stop when will we see him stop candy and I home soon stop I have adopted a baby boy stop love Homer candy telephoned her father. Wally will be here in a few weeks, or maybe months, Ray told her. He has to gain some weight before he can travel so far, and there's still a war on, don't forget. At her end of the phone, Candy just cried and cried. Tell me how you are, darling, Ray Kendall said. Instead of telling the truth, Candy said, Homer's adopted one of the orphans. After a pause, Raymond Kendall said, Just one of them? He's adopted a baby boy, Candy said. Of course, I'll help, too. It's like we've adopted a baby together. You have? Ray said. His name is Angel, Candy said. Bless his heart, Ray said. Bless you both, too. Candy cried some more. Adopted, huh? Ray asked his daughter. Yes, said Candy Kendall. One of the orphans. She quit the breastfeeding. Angel disliked his conversion to formula milk, and for a few days, he displayed a cranky temperament. Candy displayed a cranky temperament, too. Homer showed signs of strain, too. He was impatient with Dr. Large's suggestion that Homer's future lay in the medical profession. Larch insisted on giving Homer a brand new copy of Gray's Anatomy. He also gave him the standard Green Hills Office Gynecology and the British Masterpiece Diseases of Women. Jesus Christ, said Homer Wells. I'm a father, and I'm going to be an apple farmer. You have near perfect obstetrical procedure, Larch told him. Maybe I'll end up a lobsterman, Homer said. And I'll send you a subscription to the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Larch said. You're the doctor, said Homer Wells tiredly. How do you feel? Candy asked Homer. Like an orphan, Homer said. They held each other tightly, but they did not make love. How do you feel? Homer asked. I won't know until I see him, Candy said honestly. What will you know then? Homer asked. I will know if I love him, or you, or both of you, she said. Or else I won't know any more than I know now. It's always wait and see, isn't it? 
Homer asked. You don't expect me to tell him anything when he's still over there, do you? Candy asked. No, of course I don't expect that, he said softly. She held him tighter, she began to cry again. Oh, Homer, she said. How can he weigh only a hundred and five pounds? I'm sure he'll gain some weight, Homer said, but his entire body shivered suddenly, Wally's body had been so strong. It was Sunday when Homer brought Candy home. Candy told Homer that she could not see Olive until the next morning, but she was gripped by an unforeseen panic when Homer drove off with Angel. Although her milk was gone, she knew she would still wake up in the night. The next day Candy would tell Homer, we've got to find a way to share him. I mean, even before we tell Olive we both have to take care of him, we both have to be with him. I just miss him too much. I miss you, Homer Wells told her. He was an orphan who'd had a family for less than a month of his life, and he was not prepared not to have a family again. When he and Angel arrived at Ocean View, Olive greeted Homer very warmly, she threw her arms around him and kissed him, and wept. Show me the baby, oh, he's darling. She cried. Why did you do that? You're so young, and you're all alone. Well, the baby was all alone, too, Homer, mumbled. And Candy will help me with him. Of course, Olive said. I will help you, too. She carried Angel to Wally's room, where Homer saw a crib, and more baby things, and just one baby, than there were in both the boys' and girls' divisions in Street Clouds. I think that you and Angel should have Wally's room, Olive said, she had obviously planned everything. Wally won't be able to climb stairs, so the dining room will be made into a bedroom, we can always eat in the kitchen. And a ramp will be built from the terrace to the patio around the pool, for the wheelchair. As Homer was holding her while she was crying, a new guilt surrounded him, like the nightfall. When Homer was out in the field, either Olive or one of the Apple Mart women looked after Angel, but most of the time Candy looked after her baby. We adopted him together, in a way, she explained. She said it so often that Olive, as a kind of joke, gave Candy a Mother's Day present, too. One day, after Candy and Homer had made love in the cider house, which had not yet been cleaned for use in the harvest, Candy asked Homer, what if it all just goes on, the way it is? The way it is said Homer Wells. Yes, she said. Just suppose that we wait, and we wait. How long could we wait? She asked. I mean, after a while, suppose it gets easier to wait than to tell? We'll have to tell, sometime said Homer Wells. When? 
Candy asked. When Molly comes home, Homer said. When he comes home paralyzed and weighing less than I weigh, Candy said. Should we tell him then? She asked. We have to know where we're going, said Homer Wells. But what if we don't know? Candy asked. What if we know only how we want to stay? What if we wait and wait? Do you mean that you won't ever know if you love him or me? Homer asked her. It may depend on how much he's going to need me, Candy said. Don't you think I'll need you, too? He asked her. She turned her back to him. We'll have to wait and see, she said. Past a certain point, I won't wait, said Homer Wells. What point is that? Candy asked. When Angel is old enough to know who his parents are, Homer said. That's the point. I don't want Angel to think that he's adopted. I want him to know who his mother and father are. I'm not worried about Angel, Candy said. Angel will get lots of love. I'm worried about you and me. And Wally, Homer said. We'll go crazy, Candy said. We won't go crazy, Homer said. We've got to take care of Angel and make him feel loved. But what if I don't feel loved, or you don't, what then? Candy asked him. We'll wait until then, said Homer Wells. We'll just wait and see, he said. It was not until the summer when Candy first heard directly from Wally. She got a letter. Wally had spent six weeks in hospital, in Salon. They had not wanted to move him from there until he'd gained 15 pounds, until his muscle tremors had ceased and his speech had become better. He wrote the letter from another hospital, in New Delhi, after a month in India, he had gained 10 pounds. He said that he'd learned to put cinnamon in his tea. They promised him that they would allow him to start the long trip home when he weighed 140 pounds. He wrote about his perfectly normal sexual function. Wally still didn't know he was sterile, he knew he'd had a urinary tract infection, and that the infection was gone. And how is Homer? How I miss him. Wally wrote. But that was not the part of the letter that devastated Candy. Candy was so devastated by the beginning of the letter that the rest of the letter was simply a continuing devastation to her. I'm so afraid that you won't want to marry a cripple, Wally began. Chapter 10 for 15 years, Homer Wells had taken responsibility for the writing of the Cider House Rules. Every year, it was the last thing he attached to the wall after the fresh coat of paint had dried. Some years he wrote funny rules, other years he wrote in a neutral tone, 
Perhaps it had been Olive's tone and not the rules themselves that had caused some offense. The rules did not change much. And the migrants still sat on the roof and drank too much and fell off, and Homer Wells still asked or told them not to. Rules, he guessed, never asked, rules told. But he tried to make the cider house rules seem friendly. He phrased the rules in a confiding voice. There have been some accidents on the roof, over the years, especially at night, and especially in combination with having a great deal to drink while sitting on the roof. We recommend that you do your drinking with both feet on the ground, Homer wrote. But every year, the piece of paper itself became worn and used for other things. A kind of grocery list, for example. Every summer Mr. Rose wrote to Wally and Wally told Mr. Rose how many pickers he needed, and Mr. Rose wrote the day when they arrived. No contract ever existed, just the short, reliable assurances from Mr. Rose. Some summers he came with a woman, large and soft and quiet, with a baby girl. By the time when the little girl could run around and get into trouble, she was about the age of Angel Wells, Mr. Rose stopped bringing her or the woman. Every year when the woman and the daughter didn't come, Homer Wells always asked Mr. Rose, How's your little girl? She is growing, like your boy, Mr. Rose always answered. And how's your lady? Homer asked. She's looking after the little girl, Mr. Rose said. Only once in fifteen years Homer Wells talked to Mr. Rose about the cider house rules. I hope they don't offend anyone, Homer began, I'm responsible, I write them, every year, and if anyone takes offense, I hope you'll tell me. No offense, said Mr. Rose, smiling. They're just little rules, Homer said. Yes, said Mr. Rose. They are. But it really concerns me that no one pays attention to them, Homer finally said. Mr. Rose, whose face was unchanged by the years and whose body had remained thin and lithe looked at Homer mildly. We got our own rules, too, Homer, he said. Your own rules, said Homer Wells. About lots of things, said Mr. Rose. About how we can behave with you, for example. With me? Homer said. With white people, said Mr. Rose. We have our rules about that. I see, Homer said, but he didn't really see. And about fighting, said Mr. Rose. Fighting, said Homer Wells. With each other, said Mr. Rose. One rule is that we can't cut each other badly. Not for hospital, not for police. We can cut each other, but not badly. I see, Homer said. No, you don't, said Mr. Rose. You don't see, 
that's the point. We can cut each other only so badly that you never see, you never know we were cut. You see? Right, said Homer Wells. Can you say something else? Mr. Rose asked, smiling. Just be careful on the roof, Homer advised him. Nothing too bad can happen up there, Mr. Rose told him. Worse things can happen on the ground. Homer Wells was going to say right, again, when he discovered that he couldn't talk. Mr. Rose had seized his tongue between his index finger and his thumb. A vague taste, like dust, was in Homer's mouth, Mr. Rose's hand had been so fast, Homer had never seen it, he never knew before that someone could actually catch hold of someone's tongue. I've caught you, said Mr. Rose. Smiling, he let Homer's tongue go. Homer managed to say, You're very fast. Right, said Mr. Rose. There's no one faster. Wally complained to Homer about the yearly damage of the cider house roof. Every two or three years, they had to retain the roof. They have their own rules, but why can't they pay attention to ours? Wally asked Homer. I don't know, Homer said. Write him a letter and ask him. But no one wanted to offend Mr. Rose, he was a reliable crew boss. He made the picking and the pressing go well every harvest. Candy, who managed the money at Ocean View, claimed that all the expenses for repairs to the cider house roof were more than compensated by Mr. Rose's reliability. He does a good job, Candy said. Let him have his own rules. Homer Wells looked away, he knew that rules, for candy, were all private contracts. Fifteen years ago, they had made their own rules, or, really, candy had made them before Wally came home. They stood in the cider house after Angel was born, on a night when Olive was looking after Angel. They had just made love, but not happily, something was wrong. That night Candy had said, let's agree to something. Okay, Homer said. Whatever happens, we share Angel. Of course, Homer said. I mean... You will always get all the father time you want to have, and I will always get all the mother time I need, Candy said. Always, said Homer Wells, but something was wrong. I mean, regardless of what happens, whether I'm with you, or with Wally, Candy said. Homer was quiet for a while. So you're leaning toward Wally? He asked. I'm not leaning anywhere, Candy said. I'm standing right here, and we're agreeing to certain rules. I didn't know that they were rules, said Homer Wells. We share Angel. Candy said. We both should live with him. We are his family. Nobody ever moves out. 
even if you're with Wally? Homer said, after a while. Remember what you told me when you wanted me to have Angel? Candy asked him. Homer Wells was cautious, now. Remind me, he said. You said that he was your baby, too, that he was ours. That I couldn't decide, all by myself, not to have him, that was the point, Candy said. Yes, Homer said. I remember. Well, if he was ours then, he's ours now, whatever happens. Candy repeated. In the same house? Asked Homer Wells. Even if you go with Wally? Like a family, Candy said. Like a family, said Homer Wells. It was a word that gripped him. An orphan is a child, forever. An orphan detests change, an orphan hates to move, an orphan loves routine. For fifteen years, Homer Wells knew that there were possibly as many cider house rules as there were people who had passed through the cider house. Even so, every year, he posted a fresh list. For 15 years, the board of trustees had tried and failed to replace Dr. Large. They couldn't find anyone who wanted the job. There were people dying to throw themselves into unrewarded service, but there were more exotic places than street clouds where their services were needed, and where they could also suffer. The Board of Trustees couldn't manage to tempt a new nurse into service there, either, they couldn't hire even an administrative assistant. Then, all of a sudden, a new nurse came to Street Clouds. Nurse Carolyn, they called her, she was constantly of use. Homer Wells had sent her from the hospital in Cape Kenneth. Homer Wells knew that Nurse Carolyn believed in the Lord's work, and he had persuaded her to go where her devotion would be welcome. Nurse Carolyn was really like an angel. Larch had trouble with the word angel since Homer Wells and Candy had taken their son away from street clouds. Larch had trouble with the whole idea of how Homer was living. For 15 years, Wilbur Larch had been amazed that the three of them, Homer and Candy and Wally, had managed it. He wasn't at all sure what they had managed, or at what cost. He knew, of course, that Angel was a wanted child, and well loved. But how had they arranged their life together? Larch looked out the window at the apple orchard on the hill. That summer of 195, the trees were thriving, the apples were mostly pale green and pink, the leaves were of dark green color. The trees were almost too tall for Nurse Edna to spray with the Indian pump. I should ask Nurse Carolyn to take care of them, Dr. Large thought. He wrote a note to himself and left it in the typewriter. The heat made him sleepy. He went to the dispensary and stretched himself out on the bed. In the summer, with the windows open, he could risk a slightly heavier dose of ether, he thought. 
The last summer that Mr. Rose was in charge of the picking crew at Ocean View was the summer of 195, when Angel Wells was 15. All that summer, Angel had been looking forward to the next summer, when he would be 16, old enough to have his driver's license. He hoped to save enough money from his summer jobs in the orchards and from his contribution to the harvests, to buy his first car. His father, Homer Wells, didn't own a car. When Homer went shopping in town or when he worked at the hospital in Cape Kenneth, he used one of the farm vehicles. The old Cadillac which had been equipped with a hand-operated brake and accelerator so Wally could drive it, was often available. Candy had her own car, a yellow Jeep, in which she had taught Angel to drive. I taught your father how to swim, Candy told Angel. I guess I can teach you how to drive. Of course, Angel knew how to drive all the farm vehicles, too. He knew how to mow, and how to spray. The driver's license was simply necessary, official approval of something Angel already did very well on the farm. And, for a 15-year-old, he looked much older. He was going to be taller than his boyish, round-faced father they were of the same height as the summer began, even the trace of a beard was on Angel's face. The shadows under his eyes were not unhealthy looking, they only accented the vivid darkness of his eyes. It was a joke between father and son that the shadows under Angel's eyes were inherited. You get your insomnia from me, Homer Wells often told his son, who still thought he was adopted. You've got no reason to feel adopted, his father had told him. You've got three parents, really. Candy had been like a mother to him, and Wally was a second father, or the favorite, eccentric uncle. The only life Angel had known was a life with all of them. At 15, he'd never suffered so much as a change of rooms, everything had been the same since he could remember it. He had the room which Wally had shared with Homer. Angel had been born into a real boy's room, he'd grown up surrounded by Wally's tennis and swimming trophies, and the pictures of Candy with Wally when Wally's legs worked, and even the picture of Candy teaching Homer how to swim. Homer's room down the hall had been Olive's room and the room where Senior had died. Olive herself had died in Cape Kenneth Hospital before the war was over, even before they'd sent Wally home. It was an inoperable cancer, which spread very quickly. Homer and Candy and Ray had taken turns visiting her. One of them was always with Angel but Olive was never alone. Because of Wally's state, they decided not to tell Wally of Olive's cancer, that was how Olive had wanted it, too. In the end, Olive thought that Wally had come home. She was pumped so full of painkillers that she must took Homer for Wally in their last few meetings. Homer had often read to her, from Jane Eyre, from David Copperfield, and from Great Expectations, 
but he gave that up when Olive's attention began to wander. The first few times Olive confused Homer with Wally, Homer couldn't be sure whom she thought she was addressing. You must forgive him, Olive said. Her speech was unclear. She took Homer's hand. Forgive him? said Homer Wells. Yes, Olive said. He loves her very much, and he needs her very much. To Candy, Olive was clearer. She said, he's going to be crippled. And he's going to lose me. If he loses you, too. Who's going to look after him? I'll always look after him, Candy said. Homer and I will look after him. It's not right to hurt or deceive someone who's already been hurt and deceived, Candy, Olive said. With the drugs, she was taking Olive felt a perfect freedom. It was not for her to tell them that she knew what she knew, it was for them to tell her what they were keeping from her. Until they told her, she could keep them guessing about what she knew. To Homer, Olive said, he's an orphan. Who is? Homer asked. He is, she said. Don't forget how needy an orphan is. He'll take everything. He has come from having nothing, when he sees what he can have, he'll take everything that he sees. My son, Olive said, don't blame anyone. Blame will kill you. Yes, said Homer Wells who held Olive's hand. When he bent over her, to hear how she was breathing, she kissed him. Blame will kill you, he repeated to Candy, after Olive had died. He's coming home. And he doesn't even know his mother's dead, Candy said, then she stopped talking. Candy and Wally were married less than a month after Wally returned to Ocean View. Wally weighed 147 pounds, and Homer Wells pushed the wheelchair down the church aisle. Candy and Wally occupied the converted bedroom on the ground floor of the big house. Homer Wells had written to Wilbur Larch. Shortly after Wally had come home, Olive's death had fixed things for Candy and Wally more strongly than Wally's paralysis, or than any sense of betrayal and guilt. Candy's right, don't worry about Angel, Wilbur Larch had written to Homer Wells. Angel will get enough love. He won't feel like an orphan. If you're a good father to him, and Candy's a good mother to him, and if he's got Wally who loves him, too, do you think he's going to start missing his so-called real father? The problem won't be Angel's problem. It will be yours. You will want him to know you're his real father, because of you, not because he will need to know. The problem is that you will need to tell. You and Candy. You will be proud. It will be for you, and not for Angel, that you will want to tell him that he's no orphan. And to himself or as an entry in a brief history of street clouds, 
Wilbur Larch wrote, Here in street clouds we have just one problem. His name is Homer Wells. He's a problem, wherever he goes. Aside from the darkness in his eyes and the faraway look, Angel Wells resembled his father very little. He never thought of himself as an orphan, he knew he had been adopted, and he knew he came from where his father came from. And he knew he was loved, he had always felt it. He called Candy Candy, Homer Dad and Wally Wally. This was the second summer that Angel Wells had been strong enough to carry Wally, up some steps, or into the surf, or out of the shallow end of the pool and back into the wheelchair. Homer had taught Angel how to carry Wally into the surf, when they went to the beach. Wally was a better swimmer than any of them, but he needed to get into deep water. There were some rules regarding Wally there were always rules, Angel had observed. Wally was never allowed to swim alone. And Angel Wells was Wally's lifeguard when Wally swam. And Wally was not allowed to drive alone, even though the cattle I cut hand operated controls, someone else had to put the wheelchair in or take it out of the back of the car. So Angel had often been the passenger in the Cadillac and Wally had taught Angel to drive the Cadillac. When the time came, it never occurred to Candy that Angel had been so easy to teach because he'd been driving the Cadillac for years. Some rules are good rules, kiddo, Wally often told the boy kissing him which Wally did a lot. But some rules are just rules. You just have to break them carefully. It's dumb that I have to be 16 before I get a driver's license, Angel told his father. Right, said Homer Wells. They should make an exception for kids who grow up on farms. Sometimes Angel played tennis with Candy, but more often, he hit balls back to Wally, who maintained his good strokes even sitting down. It's actually better practice for you than for me, kiddo, Wally often told Angel. At least, I'm not getting any better. Angel got a lot better, he was so much better than Candy that it sometimes hurt his mother's feelings when she saw how boring it was for Angel to play with her. Homer Wells didn't play tennis. And Homer Wells had no hobbies, he just followed his son like an oil dog. Angel and Homer had pillow fights in the dark, they kissed each other goodnight, and then found excuses to repeat the ritual, and found new ways to wake each other in the mornings. Homer had continued his volunteer work for Cape Kenneth Hospital, in a sense, he had never stopped his war effort, his service as a nurse's aide. And he was an experienced reader of medical literature. The Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine were piled up on the tables and in the bookcases of the Ocean View House. Candy objected to the illustrations in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I need a little intellectual stimulation around here, 
Homer Wells said when Candy complained about the graphic nature of this material. I just don't think that Angel has to see it, Candy said. He knows that I am interested in medicine, Homer said. But I object to the pictures, Candy said. There's no reason to mystify the subject for the child, Wally said, taking Homer's side. There's no need to make the subject grotesque, either, Candy argued. I don't think it's either a mystery or grotesque, Angel said, that summer he was 15. It's just interesting. You're not even going out with girls, yet, Candy said, laughing, and taking the opportunity to kiss him. But when she bent over him to kiss him, she saw in her son's lap the illustration from an article on vaginal operations. Homer Candy shouted. Homer was upstairs in his bedroom. The interior was very simple, by his bed, he had a picture of Wally in his uniform where Wally was posing with a crew of opportunity knocks. And in the bathroom Homer had tacked up the blank questionnaire, the extra copy. The one he'd never sent to the Board of Trustees of Street Clouds. The paper was old but each question had remained readable and idiotic. Candy called to him. Please come and see what your son is reading. That was the way they all talked. Candy said your son to Homer. And that's how Wally spoke, too, and Angel always said Dad or Pop when he addressed his father. It had been an uninterrupted, 15-year relationship Homer and Angel upstairs, Wally and Candy in the former dining room downstairs. The four of them ate their meals together. We are a family. Isn't that the main thing? Candy used to ask Homer Wells. Angel has a family, a really wonderful family. Yes, that's the main thing, Homer agreed. Sometimes Wally told Candy how happy he was. Those were the nights when Candy couldn't sleep thinking of Homer Wells, who was awake, too. Some nights they met in the kitchen and had some milk and apple pie. Some nights, when it was warm, they sat by the swimming pool not touching each other. The way they sat by the pool reminded them both of how they used to sit on Ray Kendall's dock, before they'd sat closer together. Raymond Kendall had died shortly after Wally and Candy were married. He was killed when the lobster pound blew up, his whole dock was blown apart, and his lobster boat sank and two old heaps of automobiles were destroyed. Ray was doing something with his torpedo when it exploded. Ray's death brought out the guilt in Candy, she regretted that she'd not told her father about Homer and Angel Wells. She thought that Ray already knew everything but she also felt that he wanted to hear it from her. In 195, Wilbur Larch was 90-something. Sometimes his face held so still under the ether cone that the mask stayed in place after his hand had dropped to his side, only the force of his exhalations made the cone fall. 
he had lost a lot of weight. In a mirror, or traveling with his beloved ether, he had the impression that he was becoming a bird. That summer, Mr. Rose wrote that he and the daughter might arrive a day or so ahead of the picking crew. He hoped that the cider house would be ready. It's been a long time since we've seen the daughter, Wally remarked, in the Apple Mart office. Everett Taft was outside, oiling Wally's wheelchair for him, so Wally was sitting on the desk, his thin legs were swinging limply. Candy was playing with the adding machine. I think the daughter is about Angel's age, she said. Right, said Homer Wells, and Wally suddenly hit Homer. Because Homer had been leaning on the desk and Wally had been sitting up straight, the strike caught Homer completely by surprise and he fell on the floor. Wally Candy said I'm so sick of it. Wally shouted Can't you learn a new word, Homer? Wally said Jesus, Wally, Candy said I'm okay, Homer said, but he remained sitting on the office floor. I'm sorry, Wally said. It just gets on my nerves, you're right all the time. I'm sorry, buddy, Wally said and put his head on Homer's shoulder. Homer did not say right. Candy went to get a piece of ice and a towel for Homer's face, and Homer said, It's okay. Wally. Everything's okay. For fifteen years, Candy and Homer thought that Wally knew everything, that he accepted everything, but that he didn't like their fear to tell the truth. At the same time, Homer and Candy imagined that it was a relief to Wally that he didn't have to admit that he knew everything. What new, uncomfortable position could they put him in by telling him now? The main thing was that Angel did not know, not until Candy and Homer told him. The main thing was that Angel shouldn't hear it from anyone else. Whatever Wally knew, he would never tell Angel. If Homer was surprised, he was surprised that Wally had never hit him before. What was that all about? Candy asked Homer when they were alone that night by the swimming pool. I guess it is irritating how I say right all the time, Homer said. Wally knows, Candy said. That's what you've thought for fifteen years, said Homer Wells. Do you think that he doesn't know? Candy asked. I think that he loves you, and you love him, Homer said. I think that he knows we love Angel. I think that Wally loves Angel, too. But do you think he knows that Angel is ours? Candy asked. I don't know, Homer said. I know that one day Angel has to know that he's ours. I think that Wally knows I love you, he said. And that I love you? Candy asked. Does he know that? You love me sometimes, Homer said. 
not very often. I wasn't talking about sex, Candy whispered. I was, said Homer Wells. They had been extremely careful. Since Wally had come home from the war, Homer and Candy had made love only 270 times, an average of only 18 times a year, only one and a half times a month. Candy said that for Wally's sake and for Angel's they should never be caught. If anyone ever saw them, they would stop, forever. That was why they hadn't told Wally. Wally would accept that they'd thought he was dead and that they had needed each other, and that they'd wanted Angel, too. Who couldn't accept what had happened? What was happening now was what they knew Wally wanted to know, and they couldn't tell him. They had another thing to be careful about. Candy was afraid to become pregnant because Wally already knew that he was sterile. Candy made Homer promise that he would give her an abortion if she got pregnant. She could not fool Wally about another trip to Street Clouds, she did not want to fool him, she said. Homer Wells knew that there was no reason for Candy to get pregnant. But he wrote to Dr. Large to request the proper medical equipment for performing an operation. Dr. Large sent the instruments promptly. For 15 years, Homer had told her, You won't get pregnant. You can't. Do you have everything you need, if you need it? She always asked him. Yes, he said. That July, it was one hot and lazy Saturday afternoon, Homer was swimming in the pool, he had been working in the orchards all morning. Angel had been working with him. And now Angel was out of the pool, he was tossing a baseball back and forth with Wally. Wally was sitting on the lawn, and Angel was standing on the deck. Candy came down to the pool from the Apple Mart office. She was wearing her work clothes, jeans, a shirt, with oversized pockets work boots, a red baseball cap. I know that the men are out of the fields at noon on Saturday, she said with her hands on her hips, but the women are working in the mart until three. Homer stopped swimming, he stood in the pool, looking at Candy. Wally looked over his shoulder at her. And then he threw the ball to Angel, who threw it back. Please hold the ball, while I'm trying to say something, Candy said. Wally held the ball. What are you trying to say? He asked. I think that on Saturdays, as long as there are people working at the mart, you shouldn't play at the pool, everyone can hear you, and I think it's not good. You play, and they have to work, Candy said. Did you see what I mean, Homer? Candy asked him. Homer allowed himself to sink, he held his breath for a while, and when he came up for air, Candy was going through the kitchen door. The door banged. And then, all of a sudden, Homer said it. 
Homer spat out some water and said to Angel, Go and tell your mother that if she changes her clothes, we'll take her to the beach. Angel was halfway to the house before Homer realized what he'd said, and Wally said to Angel, Tell her to change her mood, too. When Angel was in the kitchen, Wally said, I don't think he even noticed what you said, old boy. It's just that she is such a mother to him, I can't help thinking of her that way, Homer said. I'm sure that it's hard, Wally said, not to think of her any way that you want. What? Homer asked. She certainly is manipulative, isn't she? Wally asked him. Homer put his head under water again, it was a cool place to think. Manipulative? He said, when he surfaced. Well, someone has to know what to do, Wally, said. Someone has to make the decisions. When Angel and Candy came out of the house, they were ready to go to the beach. Homer watched his son closely, to see if Angel had noticed that Homer had referred to Candy as your mother. There were no changes in Angel's face, and Homer couldn't tell if Angel had heard the slip. Homer didn't know if he should tell Candy that Wally had heard it. They took Candy's jeep. Candy was behind the wheel. All the way to the beach, Wally was just looking out the window intently. That was the first time when Homer knew for certain that Candy was right. He knows. Homer thought. Wally knows. Once, that summer, returning from the beach, they had stopped the car at the playground of the elementary school in Hearts Haven. Wally and Angel wanted to play. Angel was very nimble, and Wally's arms were well developed. They were hooting like monkeys at Homer and Candy, who waited in the car. Our two children, Homer had said to the love of his life. Yes, our family, Candy had said, smiling, watching Wally and Angel climb and swing, climb and swing. It's better for them than watching television said Homer Wells, who always thought of Wally and Angel as children. Homer and Candy shared the opinion that Wally watched too much television, which was a bad influence on Angel, who liked to watch it with him. Wally was so fond of television that he had even given a TV to Homer to take to Street Clouds. Every Christmas, Homer Wells took Angel to Street Clouds. But Wilbur Larch didn't like television and finally, they gave the TV away. Nurse Edna and Mrs. Grogan were becoming addicted to it, and Larch considered that it was worse for the orphans than religion. It's better for anyone than either. Wilbur, Nurse Edna complained, but Larch was firm. He was the first man in Maine who called that television what it was, an idiot box. But Wally loved to watch it, and Angel watched it with him when Candy and Homer didn't object. For many years. Since Melanie left Street Clouds she had been dreaming of Homer Wells. 
She had found a job at a shipyard. That August of 195, just a few days before the picking crew was expected at Ocean View, Melanie took her vacation. Most of the shipyard workers, even the electricians, took a couple of weeks in the summer and a couple of weeks around Christmas, but Melanie took a whole month during harvest time, it made her feel good to pick apples. She had worked at different apple farms in the summer, and she had always asked about Homer Wells, but in vain. This year, she had decided, she'd try working at Ocean View. She hitchhiked when she traveled, and because she wore only men's work clothes, she looked like a tramp, no one could know that she was a shipyard skilled electrician, with enough money in a savings account to buy a nice house and a couple of cars. When Melanie arrived at the Apple Mart, Big Dot Haft was the first to see her. Wally was in the office, he didn't see Melanie, and she didn't see him. Candy was in the kitchen, talking on the phone. Melanie approached Big Dot Haft because Melanie felt comfortable with big, fat women. Big Dot smiled to see how large Melanie was, the two women liked each other at once. Does a guy named Homer Wells work here? Melanie asked Big Dot. He does, Big Dot said cheerfully. Are you a friend of Homer's? I used to be, Melanie said. I haven't seen him for a long time, she added. Have you just come to see him? Big Dot asked Melanie. I have actually come for work, Melanie said. I've done a lot of picking. Homer hires the pickers, Big Dot said. I guess you're lucky because you are old friends. Find Homer and tell him there's someone to see him, Big Dot told Vernon who was nearby. Homer's the boss. The boss? Melanie said in surprise. Homer Wells and his son, Angel, were taking their lunch break under one of the old trees in an orchard. They were quiet for a while, and then Homer said, Is there anything you'd like to ask me, about anything? Angel gave a short laugh, then he paused. Yes, Angel said to his father. I wonder why you don't have a girlfriend, why you are not even interested. This was not the question Homer had expected. I had a girlfriend, in St. Clouds, Homer said. She was older than me, and at the time, she was stronger than me. He said, laughing. Really? Angel said, he wasn't laughing, he had rolled over on his elbows and was watching his father intently. Well, we were very much alike, Homer, said. It was one of those cases when the sex happened before there was a friendship. But there really was no friendship, and, after a short while, there wasn't any more sex, either. After that, I'm not sure what the relationship was. What happened after that? 
Angel asked. I met Wally and Candy, Homer said carefully. I wanted to marry Candy but she married Wally. She was almost my girlfriend, for about five minutes. That was when Wally was in the war, when we didn't know if he was still alive, Homer said quickly. I've always been so close to Wally and Candy, and then, when I had you, I started to feel that I already had everything I wanted. Angel Wells rolled over on his back. Do you still like Candy? He asked. Are you not interested in anybody else? Well, yes, said Homer Wells. Have you met anybody you're interested in? He asked, hoping to change the subject. There is nobody who'd be interested in me, his son said. I mean, the girls who I think about are all too old to look at me. That will change, Homer said, poking Angel in the ribs. The boy rolled on his side, poking back at his father. Very soon, Homer said, the girls are going to stand in line to look at you. He grabbed Angel and they started wrestling. Wrestling with Angel was one way Homer could keep in close physical contact with the boy. A 15-year-old boy doesn't want his father to kiss and hug him, but wrestling was perfectly respectable, that was still allowed. They were wrestling so hard, and laughing, and breathing so heavily, that they did not hear Vernon Lynch approach them. Hey, Homer. Vernon said loudly. I've got a message for you. For me? Said Homer Wells. There's a fat woman who says she knows you. She's at the mart, Vernon said. Homer smiled. He knew several fat women at the mart. He thought that Vernon meant Big Dot Haft or Florence Hyde. I mean a new fat woman, Vernon said. She says she wants to be a picker, and she asked for you. She knows you. Homer got slowly to his feet, he'd rolled over a root of the big tree and the root had hurt him in the ribs. Also, Angel had stuffed grass down the back of his shirt. Angel said to his father, Oh, a fat woman, huh? I guess you didn't tell me about the fat woman. As Homer unbuttoned his shirt to shake at the grass, Angel poked his father's bare stomach. Then Angel noticed that his father had aged. He was still a slender man, and strong from all the orchard work he'd done, but just a bit of belly rolled over the belt of his jeans, and his hair was going gray. There was something grim around the corners of Homer's eyes that Angel had also never noticed before. Pop? Angel asked him softly. Who's the woman? But his father was looking at him in a panic. It can't be that girl from Street Clouds, can it? Angel was trying to joke with his father, but Homer didn't speak, he didn't even smile. Homer drove fast. 
On the way back to the Apple Mart, Homer took the public road instead of winning through the back orchards. The public road was faster, although Homer had told all the drivers to keep off it when they could, to avoid any possible accidents with the beach traffic along that road in the summers. Children are most impressed with the importance of a moment when they see a parent breaking the parent's own rule. Do you think it's her? Angel shouted to his father. You've got to admit, it's a little exciting, the boy added, but Homer looked grim. They drove to the mart. The boy followed his father to the place, where Big Dot and Florence and Irene were surrounding the massive Melanie. It is her, isn't it? Angel whispered to his father. Hello, Melanie, said Homer Wells. There was not a sound in the still, summer air. How are you doing, Homer? Melanie asked him. But although she had waited years to see him, Melanie was looking not at Homer Wells but at Angel. Melanie could not take her eyes off the boy. Homer Wells, a pleasant looking man in his forties, did not remind Melanie of the young boy whom she had known, but Angel struck Melanie with a force quite unexpected by her. Poor Angel felt uneasy, but he was a young gentleman and he smiled at the stranger. There's no doubt about who you are, Melanie said to the boy. You look more like your father than your father. Big Dot and the Apple Mart ladies were listening with great interest. It's nice that you see a resemblance, said Homer Wells, but my son is adopted. Adopted? Melanie said. She was disappointed in her oldest friend, after all these years, he still tried to deceive her. Then Candy noticed that no one was working and approached the small crowd. She stepped between Homer and Angel, she was eating an apple and was a little embarrassed to speak to the stranger. Hi. She managed to say to Melanie, who recognized instantly, in Candy's face, those few parts of Angel she had not discovered in Homer Wells. This is Melanie, Homer said to Candy, who had heard all about Melanie long ago, on the cider house roof. This is Mrs. Worthington. Homer mumbled to Melanie. How do you do? Candy managed to say. Mrs. Worthington? Melanie said, her eyes were darting from Angel to Candy, and from Angel to Homer Wells. At that moment, Wally willed himself out of the office and into the mart. Isn't anybody working today? He asked, in his friendly way. When he saw there was a stranger, he was polite. Oh, hello. He said. Hi, said Melanie. This is my husband, Candy said. Your husband? Melanie said. This is Mr. Worthington, mumbled Homer Wells. Everybody calls me Wally, Wally said. 
Melanie and I were in the orphanage together, Homer explained. Really? Wally said enthusiastically. That's great, he said. Let them show you the farm. Show her the house, too, Wally told Homer and started to roll back to the office. It's nice to meet you. He called to Melanie. Please stay for supper. Thank you. Melanie called after Wally. He's the only hero here, Melanie thought, watching the door swing closed behind the wheelchair, she could not control her hands. She wanted to touch Angel, to hug him, she'd wanted to get her hands on Homer Wells for years, but now she didn't know what she wanted to do to him. It was hard for Melanie to recognize that there was no love for her in his eyes, he looked like a trapped animal. No one remembered that Melanie had come, among other reasons, for a job. Angel said, Would you like to see the pool first? Well, I don't swim, Melanie said but it would be nice to see it. She smiled at Homer with such warmth that Homer shivered. I'll show you the house, Candy said, after Angel's shown you the pool. She dropped the uneaten apple, and laughed at herself. Angel poked his father in the back as they were walking toward the house and pool. Angel still thought that this surprise was great and unexpected fun. Homer turned briefly and frowned at his son, which was amusing to Angel. While the boy was showing Melanie the swimming pool, Candy and Homer awaited her arrival in the kitchen. She knows, Homer said to Candy. What? Candy said. What does she know? Melanie knows everything, said Homer Wells, in a trance. How could she? Candy asked him. Did you tell her? Don't be ridiculous, Homer said. She just knows, she always knows. Don't you be ridiculous, Candy said crossly. Wally's a great swimmer, Angel explained to Melanie. You're a good looking guy, Melanie said to Angel. You're better looking than your dad ever was. Angel was embarrassed. He took the temperature of the pool. It's warm, he said. It's too bad that you don't swim. You could stay in the shallow end, or I could teach you how to float. Candy taught my dad how to swim. Incredible, Melanie said. If I fell in. I'm sure you could save me, she said to Angel. I could probably save you, if you were drowning, Angel offered cautiously. Incredible, she repeated, her eyes were trying to take in everything. Do you want to see the house now? Angel asked her. She was making him nervous. Oh, that's a beautiful place, Melanie told Candy, who showed her the downstairs, Homer showed her the upstairs. In the hallway between Homer's and Angel's rooms, 
Melanie whispered to him, Boy, you have really done all right for yourself. How did you manage it? You even got a great view. She pointed out, sitting on the master bed and looking out the window. When she asked if she could use the bathroom, Homer went downstairs to have a word with Candy, but Angel was still there and he was still curious. Melanie spent a long time in the bathroom, and Homer Wells was grateful for the time, he needed it, to convince Candy and Angel to go back to work, to leave him alone with Melanie. She wants a job, he told them forcefully. I need to have a little time with her, alone. Mirrors had never been Melanie's friends, but the mirror in Homer's bathroom was especially unkind to her. She looked into the medicine cabinet quickly, for no reason, she dumped some of the pills down the toilet. She began ejecting razor blades from a metal dispenser. She emptied the dispenser before she could make herself stop. She cut her finger trying to pick up one of the blades from the floor. She had her finger in her mouth when she first looked at herself in the mirror. She held the razor blade in her other hand while she reviewed the forty-something years she saw in her face. Oh, she had never been attractive, she had never been nice, but once she had been an efficient weapon, she thought, now she wasn't so sure. After a while, she put the blade down on the edge of the sink and cried. Later, she found a cigarette lighter. She used the lighter to melt the handle of Homer's toothbrush, she sunk the razor blade in the softest part and waited for the handle to harden. When she clutched the brush end in her hand, she had quite a nice little weapon, she thought. Then she saw the 15-year-old questionnaire from the Street Clouds Board of Trustees. The paper was so old, she had to be careful not to tear it. How those questions excited her. She threw the toothbrush with the razor blade in the sink, then she picked it up again, then she put it in the medicine cabinet, then she took it out. Melanie stayed upstairs in the bathroom a long time. When she came downstairs, she found Homer waiting for her in the kitchen, she'd had enough time alone for her disposition to change and rechange, for her to understand her real feelings about Homer and his life. Perhaps she had enjoyed a few minutes of the discomforts she had caused him. But by the time she came downstairs she was no longer enjoying herself and her disappointment in Homer Wells was even deeper than her anger. I thought you'd end up doing something better than having sex with a poor cripple's wife and pretending that your own child isn't your own, Melanie said to Homer Wells. You of all people. You, an orphan, she reminded him. It's not quite like that, he started to tell her, but she shook her huge head and looked away from him. I've got eyes, Melanie said. I can see what it's like, it's like shit. It's ordinary middle-class unfaithful life and lying to the kids, Melanie said.
Palmer Wells had expected to be attacked by her. Melanie was an attacker, but this was not the attack, which he had expected. He had imagined that he would, one day, when he saw her again, be a match for her, but now he knew that he would never be a match for Melanie. Do you think I was always looking for you, only to give you a bad time? Melanie asked him. I didn't know you were looking for me, said Homer Wells. I always thought you'd end up like the old man, said Melanie. Like Larch? Homer said. Of course, like Larch. Melanie snapped at him. I thought you would be the missionary. The do-gooder. I don't see large quite that way, Homer said. Don't be snotty to me. Melanie cried, and her raw face streaked with tears. You're a creep. You couldn't even be real honest with your own kid. Some missionary. Isn't that brave? I call that a creep, Melanie told him. Then she left. She never asked him about the job, he never asked her how her life had been. He went upstairs to the bathroom and threw up. He filled the sink with cold water and soaked his head but it didn't help. 175 pounds of truth had struck him in the face and neck and chest, had constricted his breathing and made him ache. A vomit taste was in his mouth, he tried to brush his teeth but he cut himself in the hand before he saw the blade. He felt nearly paralyzed above the waist. When he reached for the towel by the shower door, he saw what else was wrong, he saw what was missing from the bathroom, the blank questionnaire was gone. Homer Wells imagined how Melanie might answer some of the questions. This new panic momentarily lifted him above his own self-pity. He called the orphanage immediately, and heard Nurse Edna's voice. Oh, Homer. She cried, so glad to hear his voice. This is important, he told her. I saw Melanie. Oh, Melanie. Nurse Edna cried happily. Mrs. Grogan will be thrilled. Melanie has a copy of the questionnaire, Homer said. Please tell Dr. Larch, I don't think this is good news. I'm speaking about that old questionnaire from the Board of Trustees. Oh, dear, Nurse Edna said. Of course she might never fill it out, Homer said, but she has it, it says where to send it. And I don't know where she's gone, I don't know where she came from. Was she married? Nurse Edna asked. Was she happy? Jesus Christ, thought Homer Wells and said, just tell Dr. Larch that Melanie has the questionnaire. I thought he should know. Yes, yes. Nurse Edna shouted. But was she happy? I don't think so, Homer said. Oh, dear. 
I thought she was going to stay for supper, Wally said, serving the swordfish. I thought she wanted a job, Angel said. I don't think she needed the job, Homer said. She just wanted to look you over, Pop, Angel said, and Wally laughed. Angel had told Wally that Melanie had been Homer's girlfriend, which was very funny to Wally. After supper, he helped Candy with the dishes while Angel drove around the orchards with Pete Hyde. Wally liked the twilight by the swimming pool. From the kitchen window, Homer and Candy could see him sitting in the wheelchair. It's time to tell, Homer said to Candy. No, please, Candy said. It's time to tell everyone everything, said Homer Wells. There's no more waiting and seeing. She stood behind him and put her arms around his hips. She pressed her face between his shoulder blades, but he did not even turn to face her. He just kept scrubbing the broiler rack. We'll discuss it with you, any way you want to do it, Homer said. Whether you want to be with me, when I tell Angel, whether you want me to be with you, when you tell Wally. Any way you want it, it'll be okay, he said. She hugged him as hard as she could but he just kept scrubbing. She buried her face between his shoulder blades and bit him in the back. He had to turn toward her then, he had to push her away. You're going to make Angel hate me. Candy cried. Angel will never hate you, Homer said to her. To Angel, you've always been just what you are, a good mother. Wally will hate me. She cried miserably. You're always telling me that Wally knows, said Homer Wells. Wally loves you. And you don't love me, anymore, do you? Candy said, she started to cry, then she threw the serving tongs at Homer, then she clenched her fists against her thighs. She bit down so hard on her lower lip that it bled, when Homer tried to touch lightly her lip with a clean dish towel, she pushed him away. I love you, but we're becoming bad people, he said. She stamped her foot. We're not bad people. She cried. We're trying to do the right thing, we're trying not to hurt anybody. We're doing the wrong thing, said Homer Wells. It's time to do everything right. In a panic, Candy looked out the window. We'll talk later, she whispered to Homer. She grabbed an ice cube out of someone's drinking glass, she held the cube to her lower lip. I'll see you by the pool. We can't talk about this around the pool, he told her. I'll meet you at the cider house, she said, she was looking everywhere for Wally, wondering what door he'd come in any second. That's not a good idea, to meet there, said Homer Wells. Just take a walk. She snapped at him. 
You'll walk there your way, I'll walk there my way, I'll meet you, she said. She ran into the bathroom before Homer heard Wally at the terrace door. That night when Homer put Angel to bed, Angel said, You know, you really don't have to put me to bed anymore. I don't do it because I have to, Homer said. I like to. You know what I think? Angel said. What's that? Asked Homer, who dreaded the answer. I think you should try having a girlfriend, Angel said cautiously. Homer laughed. Good night, I love you, Homer said. I love you. Good night, Pop, Angel said, but when Homer was almost out of the door, Angel asked him, What's the thing you love best? You, Homer told his son. I love you best. Next to me, said Angel Wells. Candy and Wally, Homer said. Next to them, Angel said. Well, Dr. Large, and all of them, in St. Clouds, I guess, said Homer Wells. And what's the best thing you ever did? Angel asked his father. I got you, Homer said softly. Next best, Angel said well, I guess it was meeting Candy and Wally, Homer said. You mean, when you met them? Angel asked. I guess so, said Homer Wells. Next best, Angel insisted. I saved a woman's life, once, Homer said. Dr. Larch was away. The woman had convulsions. You told me, Angel said. Angel had never been especially interested that his father had become a highly qualified assistant to Dr. Large. Homer had never told him about the abortions. What else? Angel asked his father. Nothing else, really. I'm no hero. I haven't done any best things, or even any one best thing, Homer said. That's okay, Pop, Angel said cheerfully. Good night. Good night, said Homer Wells. Downstairs, the bedroom door was closed and there was no light coming from the crack under the door. But someone had left a light on in the kitchen, and the outdoor light was still on. He went to the Apple Mart office to read the mail, with the light on in the office, Candy could know where he was. And if she'd already gone to the cider house, he could walk there from the office. The package from Street Clouds, arriving on the day of Melanie's visit, startled Homer. He was shocked to see the black leather doctor's bag with the gold initials on it, F.S. Dr. Stone, Homer said aloud, remembering how Larch had addressed him once. Candy had been waiting for him for a while, she was nervous. It was heartbreaking for him to see that she had made up one of the beds. She'd brought a candle from the house, and had lit it, 
although candles were against the rules. Recently, Homer had found it necessary to call attention to candles on the list. One of the pickers had started a small fire with a candle some years ago. Please don't smoke in bed, and no candles, please. He'd written. Candy was sitting on the bed, and she had brushed her hair. I'm sorry, he said softly to her. We've tried it. We've certainly tried, but it just doesn't work. Only the truth will work. Candy sat with her knees together and her hands in her lap. She was shivering. Do you really think Angel's old enough to know all this? She whispered. I think he's old enough, said Homer Wells. There's always so much to do during harvest, Candy said. We'll wait until them after the harvest, then, Homer said. We've waited fifteen years. I guess we can wait six weeks more. She stretched out on her back on the thin bed. He went to the bed and sat on the edge of it, and she put her hand on his knee. He covered her hand with his hand. Oh, Homer, she said, but he couldn't turn to look at her. She took his hand and pulled it under her dress and made him touch her. She wasn't wearing anything under the dress. He didn't pull his hand away, but he didn't allow his hand to be more than a dead raid presence against her. What do you imagine will happen? She asked him coolly, after she realized that his hand was dead. I can't imagine anything, he said. Wally will throw me out, Candy said quietly and without self-pity. He won't, Homer said. And if he did, I wouldn't, then you would be with me. That's why he won't. What will Angel do? Candy asked. He will do what he wants, Homer said. I imagine he'll be with you when he wants, and with me when he wants. This part was hard to say, and harder to imagine. He'll hate me, Candy said. He won't, said Homer Wells. She pushed his hand away from her, in another moment. Her hand found his knee again, and he held her hand lightly there. Where will you go? Candy asked him after a while. Will I have to go anywhere? He asked her. I imagine so, Candy said. Homer Wells was trying to imagine it all when he suddenly heard the car. Candy sat up and blew out the candle. They sat holding each other on the bed, listening to the car approach them. The heavy car stopped at the cider house wall. It's Wally. Candy whispered. Homer picked up the doctor's bag and felt his way into the dark kitchen, his hand groped for the light switch. He had not heard the car door open, but he suddenly heard low voices. Homer Wells turned on the light, which momentarily blinded him. 
He thought that he must be as lit up as a Christmas tree in the cider house door. And, he thought, wasn't it right that it had been the Cadillac that had rescued him from street clouds, and now here was the Cadillac, in a way, come to rescue him again? For here he was, with the well-worn doctor's bag in hand, at last prepared to tell the truth, ready, at last, to take his medicine. He held Dr. Large's bag tightly and peered into the darkness. Suddenly, it was clear to him, where he was going. He was only what he always was, an orphan who'd never been adopted. He had managed to steal some time away from the orphanage, but street clouds had the only legitimate claim to him. In his forties, a man should know where he belongs. All day Wilbur Larch worked in Nurse Angela's office. He was reviewing and putting the finishing touches to the history of Fuzzy Stone, that good doctor, Larch was also writing the obituary of Homer Wells. The rigors of an agricultural life and a high cholesterol diet killed him. Dr. Stone, on the other hand, was not a typical orphan. After all, who among the orphans had ever dared to challenge Dr. Larch? Fuzzy attacked Dr. Larch's beliefs about the abortions, and had such strong views on the subject that he repeatedly threatened to expose Dr. Larch to the board. Now Fuzzy was fighting diarrhea among the dying children of Asia. Larch had just read an article, which said that diarrhea was the number one killer of kids in that part of the world. It had been an exhausting day for Larch, who had also written to the board of trustees. Mrs. Grogan and his nurses knew it. He made them all meet in Nurse Angela's office. He leaned on his overworked typewriter like on a podium. Now, he said, because the women were chatting. Now we're going to prevent them. Whom? Nurse Carolyn asked aggressively. And you? Dr. Larch said to Nurse Carolyn, pointing his finger at her. You're my top gun. You're the one who's going to pull the trigger. You have to fire the first shot. Mrs. Grogan feared that Dr. Larch had finally gone crazy. Nurse Carolyn just wanted the facts. Okay, Nurse Carolyn said. Let's begin at the beginning. Whom do I shoot? You should inform on all of us, Larch told her. I'll do no such thing. Nurse Carolyn said. Very patiently, he explained it to them. It was so simple, to him it was simple because he'd been thinking of it for years. It was not simple to the rest of them, and he had to take them very slowly through the steps toward their salvation. They must assume that Melanie would respond to the questionnaire. They must believe that her response would be negative because Melanie was angry. She was born angry, she will always be angry, and even if she means us no harm, one day she will be angry enough, about something, 
about anything, so that she will respond to the questionnaire. And she'll say what she knows, Lar chatted, because Melanie is no liar. So he wanted the board to hear that he was an abortionist from someone else first. It was the only way they might be saved. Nurse Carolyn was the logical betrayer, she was young, she was relatively new, she had struggled with her conscience for a short period of time, and she had decided that she could remain silent no longer. Mrs. Grogan and the older nurses had to accept the situation because the doctor's authority was absolute. Nurse Carolyn, however, had a challenging attitude toward the authority figures of this or of any society. And when a doctor was breaking the law, even if it was not a nurse's role to challenge him, it was her right and her moral obligation to inform on him. And you, Lart said, pointing to Nurse Angela. You will recommend Fuzzy Stone. That it's a great load off your conscience, that I have been caught, Larch told her. But what will happen to you, Wilbur, if we expose you? Nurse Edna asked and cried. I'm almost a hundred years old, Edna, he said softly. I suppose, I'll retire. You won't go away, will you? Mrs. Grogan asked him. I wouldn't get very far, if I tried, he said. He had been so convincing about Fuzzy Stone, he had presented them with such marvelous details that Nurse Carolyn was the only one who saw the problem. What if Homer Wells won't come here and pretend to be Fuzzy Stone? She asked Dr. Larch. Homer belongs here, Nurse Angela said. But he doesn't believe in performing abortions. Nurse Carolyn reminded all the old people. When did you last talk to him about it? She asked Larch. I've talked to him recently, and he believes in your right to perform them, he even sent me here, to help you. And he believes that it should be legal. But he also says that he could never, personally, do it, to him, it's killing someone. That's how he sees it. That's what he says. He has near perfect procedure, Wilbur Large said tiredly. Homer Wells thinks it's killing someone, Nurse Carolyn repeated. Dr. Larch moved slowly in the small room. He handed Nurse Angela the letter to the board, which he had written for her. He handed Nurse Carolyn her letter, too. Just sign them, he said. Read them over, if you want. You don't know that Melanie will expose you. Mrs. Grogan said to him. Does it really matter? Larch asked. Just look at me. Do I have a lot of time? They looked away. I don't want to leave it up to Melanie. Or to old age, he added. Or to ether. He admitted, which caused Nurse Sedna to cover her face with her hands. 
I prefer to take my chances with Homer Wells. Nurse Angela and Nurse Carolyn signed the letters. Several examples of the correspondence between Wilbur Larch and Fuzzy Stone were also sent to the Board of Trustees. Nurse Angela included these in the envelope with her letter. The board could understand that all the nurses, and Mrs. Grogan, had discussed the matter together. Wilbur Larch did not need either to help him sleep, not that night. In the morning, Larch started writing a letter to Homer. This time the letter was written in Larch's most didactic voice. He told Homer everything. He didn't beg. Larch said that he was sure that Angel would accept his father's sacrifice. He'll value your need to be of use, Wilbur Larch wrote. Young people find risk-taking heroic, Larch continued. If abortions were legal, you could refuse. But as long as they're against the law, how can you refuse? How can you allow yourself a choice in the matter when there are so many women who haven't the freedom to make the choice themselves? The women have no choice. So how can you feel free to choose not to help people WHO are not free to get other help? You have to help them because you know how. Think about who's going to help them if you refuse. Wilbur Larch was really tired. Here is the trap, Dr. Larch wrote to Homer. And it's not my trap, I haven't trapped you. Because abortions are illegal. Women who need and want them have no choice in the matter, and you, because you know how to perform them, have no choice, either. If abortion was legal, a woman would have a choice, and so would you. You could feel free not to do it because someone else would. But now you're trapped. Women are trapped. Women are victims, and so are you. You are my work of art, Wilbur Larch told Homer Wells. Everything else has just been a job. I don't know if you've got a work of art in you, Larch concluded in his letter to Homer, but I know what your job is. And you know what it is, too. You're the doctor. Chapter 11 Homer Wells did not recognize the voice that spoke to him from the car. What have you got in the bag, Homer? Asked Mr. Rose. It's nice of you working all night to make my house nice for me, Homer, he said. When he stepped in front of his headlights, his black face was still hard to see. Mr. Rose Homer said Mr. Wells, said Mr. Rose, smiling. They shook hands, while Homer's heart calmed down. Candy was still hiding in the cider house, and Mr. Rose felt that Homer wasn't alone. Candy walked, guiltily, into the light. Mrs. Worthington said Mr. Rose. Mr. Rose, Candy said. Smiling, shaking his hand. We're just in time, she said to Homer, poking him. 
We have just prepared all the bed linen, she told Mr. Rose. Mr. Rose nodded and smiled. Then the baby cried. Candy jumped. I wrote to Wally about bringing the daughter, Mr. Rose explained, as a young woman, about Angel's age, walked into the light with a baby in her arms. I haven't seen you since you were a little girl, Homer Wells told the young woman, who looked at him blankly. A trip with a small child was exhausting. My daughter, Mr. Rose said in introduction. And her daughter, he added. Mrs. Worthington, said Mr. Rose, introducing her, and Homer Wells. Candy, Candy said, shaking the young woman's hand. Homer, Homer said. He couldn't remember the daughter's name, and so he asked her. She looked a little startled, and looked at her father. Rose, Mr. Rose said. Everyone laughed, the daughter, too. The baby stopped crying and looked with wonder at the laughter. No, I mean your first name, said Homer Wells. Rose is her first name, said Mr. Rose. You already heard it. Rose Rose? Candy asked. The daughter smiled. Rose Rose, said Mr. Rose proudly. Everyone laughed again, the baby was cheering up, and Candy played with the little girl's fingers. And what's her name? Candy asked Rose Rose. This time, the young woman answered for herself. She doesn't have a name. Yet, Rose Rose replied. We're still thinking how to call her, said Mr. Rose. Homer offered his help to unpack the things but Mr. Rose refused. So Homer and Candy started walking back to the office. He knows, Homer said to Candy, as they were walking. Of course he knows, Candy said. I guess it doesn't matter, Homer said. What's the bag for? Candy asked him, before she kissed him good night. It's for me, said Homer Wells. I think it's for me. In the morning, Candy sent Angel to the cider house to ask if Rose Rose needed anything for the baby, and then Angel fell in love. He was shy with girls his own age, boys his own age always teased him about his name. He thought he was the only Angel in Maine. In 195, Girls Angel's age looked forward to dating, boys Angel's age, as in other times, looked forward to doing things. Mr. Rose's daughter was not only the most exotic young woman that Angel had ever seen, if she had a daughter, and she had done things. It was cold and damp in the cider house in the mornings, when Angel arrived there, Rose Rose was outside, in the sun, washing baby Rose in a bucket. The baby was splashing, and Rose Rose was talking to her daughter, she didn't hear Angel walking up to her.
Rose Rose was only a few years older than Angel. When she was with her baby, her gestures and her expressions were womanly, and she had a full, womanly figure. She was a little taller than Angel. She had a round, boyish face. Good morning, Angel said, startling baby Rose in the bucket. Rose Rose wrapped her daughter in a towel and stood up. You must be Angel, she said shyly. She had a thin scar that sliced across one nostril and her upper lip. Angel was so smitten when he first met her that even the scar was beautiful to him, it was her only apparent flaw. Could I help you get anything for the baby? Angel said. I think that she is teething, Rose Rose reported on her daughter. She is cranky today. Mr. Rose came out of the cider house, when he saw Angel, he waved and smiled, and then he walked to him and put his arm around the boy. How are you doing? He asked. You are still growing, I think. I used to carry him on top of my head, he told Rose Rose. He used to grab the apples which I couldn't reach, Mr. Rose, explained. I think that I will grow a little more, Angel said. He wanted Rose Rose to know that he would be taller than she, one day. When Angel came back home and told his father that Rose Rose's baby was teething, Homer knew what to do. He sent Angel with Wally to town to buy some pacifiers, and then he sent Angel back to the cider house with a package of pacifiers and some whiskey. Wally drank a very little whiskey from time to time, and the bottle was three quarters full. Homer showed Angel how to apply whiskey on baby Rose's gums. It numbs the gums, Angel explained to Rose Rose. He dipped his finger in the whiskey, then he stuck his finger in baby Rose's tiny mouth. Baby Rose liked it so much that when he removed his finger to apply more whiskey, the baby cried to have the finger back. You will make her drunk, Rose Rose warned. No, I won't, Angel assured her. I'm just putting her gums to sleep. Rose Rose examined the pacifiers. They were rubber nipples, like the nipple on a baby's bottle but without the hole and attached to a blue plastic ring that was too big to swallow. The problem with using a bottle nipple, Angel Wells explained, was that the baby would suck in air through the hole, and the air would give the baby a gassy stomach. How do you know so much? Rose Rose asked Angel, smiling. How old are you? I'm almost sixteen, Angel said. How old are you? I'm about your age, she told him. In the afternoon, when Angel came back to the cider house to see how the teething was going, he saw that Mr. Rose was sitting on the cider house roof with a pacifier in his mouth. Are you teething, too? Angel asked. 
Mr. Rose removed the pacifier from his mouth slowly. I'm giving up smoking, said Mr. Rose. If you have a nipple in your mouth all day, you don't need a cigarette. He stuck the pacifier back in his mouth and smiled at Angel. In the cider house, baby Rose had fallen asleep with a pacifier in her mouth. I was checking on how the teething was going, Angel explained to Rose Rose. It's going fine, she said. You're a good doctor. You're my hero, for today. She was smiling. Angel Wells was really struck by love. He was walking back to the Apple Mart and thinking, who was the baby's father? And where was he? And where was Mrs. Rose? Were Mr. Rose and his daughter all alone? Angel went to his room and began to write a list of names, girls' names. He took some names, which he liked out of the dictionary, and then he added other names that the dictionary had overlooked. How else do you impress a girl who hasn't been able to think of a name for her baby? Abby? Thought Angel Wells. Alberta. Alexandra. Amanda. Amelia. Antoinette. Audrey. Aurora. Aurora Rose, Angel said aloud. God, no, he said plunging into the alphabet. Bathsheba? Beatrice? Bernice? Bianca? Bridget? In street clouds they had another problem. Nurse Carolyn knew that it was time for her to write to Homer Wells. While Dr. Larch was resting in the dispensary, Nurse Carolyn was writing in Nurse Angela's office. Don't be a hypocrite, she began. I hope you remember that you were always telling me to leave Gabe Kenneth, that my services were more needed here, and you were right. And do you think your services aren't needed here, or that they aren't needed right now? Do you think the apples can't grow without you? Who will replace him if you don't come? It will be one of the usual cowards who does what he's told, one of your typically careful, medical men. A little law-abiding citizen who will be of absolutely no use. Carmen. Cecilia. Charity. Claudia. Constance. Cookie. Cordelia. Angel Wells was thinking and putting on Candy's cap. Although it was cool in the early morning, he decided not to wear a shirt. Dagmar? He thought. Daisy? Dolores? Dottie? Where are you going in my hat? Candy asked him, she was picking up the breakfast dishes. It's my hat, Angel said, going out the door. Love is blind, Wally said, pushing his wheelchair away from the table. Homer and Wally were worried about Angel's love. 
Candy knew that Rose Rose had too much experience to allow Angel to get carried away. That isn't the point, Homer said. The point is Mr. Rose, Wally said. Homer Wells went to the Apple Mart office. In the mail, there was a letter for him from Dr. Large, but Homer didn't look through the mail. That was Wally's job, besides, the picking crew had arrived. Homer had to organize the work. He looked out the office window and saw his son not wearing any shirt and talking to Big Dot Taft. He opened the door and shouted at Angel. Hey, it's cold this morning, put on a shirt. Angel was already walking toward the barns beyond the Apple Mart. The rest of the crew except for Mr. Rose's daughter, hadn't been to Ocean View before. Mr. Rose arranged, with Angel, how Rose Rose and her daughter would spend the day. She should ride around with you and help you, Mr. Rose told Angel. She can sit on the fender, or stand behind the seat. She can ride on the trailer, before it's full. Sure. Angel said. If she needs to take the baby back to the cider house, she can walk, Mr. Rose said. She doesn't need any special favors. No, Angel said. It surprised him that Mr. Rose would speak this way about his daughter when she was standing beside him, looking a little embarrassed. Sometimes our cook, Black Pan, can look after the baby, Mr. Rose said, and Rose Rose nodded. Candy said she'd look after her, too, Angel offered. We don't have to bother Mrs. Worthington, said Mr. Rose, and Rose Rose shook her head. When Angel drove the tractor, he could let Rose Rose sit down, with or without baby Rose in her lap, and he could stand a little to one side of the seat and operate the tractor. The emergency handbrake was next to Rose Rose's hip, the gear shift was by her knee. You should be careful, she told him. You shouldn't get involved with me. But Angel was encouraged that she'd even noticed his interest. How old are you? He asked her casually. Later that day, I'm about your age, Angel, was all she said. Do you like the name Gloria? Angel asked. That's nice, said Rose Rose. Who is it for? Your baby, Angel said. I've been thinking of names for your baby. Rose Rose looked into Angel's eyes. Why have you been thinking of that? She asked him. Just to be of help, he said with embarrassment. Just to help you decide. Decide? Rose Rose asked. Yes, said Angel Wells. The picker named Peaches was almost as fast as Mr. Rose. He interrupted the conversation. Angel went to look over the apples, and at that moment, Peaches said to him, 
You shouldn't go into the knife business with Mr. Rose. Then he walked away, with his bag and his lighter, before Angel could say anything about his apples, which were, of course, perfect. Back on the tractor, Angel asked Rose Rose, Are you still married to the baby's father? I have never been married, she said. Are you still together, you and the father? Angel asked. Baby has got no father, Rose Rose said. After the first four or five days of the harvest, the wind changed, the early mornings were especially cold. Angel wore a t-shirt and a sweater over that. One morning, when it was very cold, Angel saw that Rose Rose was shivering and he gave her his sweater. She wore it all day. She was still wearing it when Angel went to help with the cider press that night, and for a while, they sat on the cider house roof together. Rose Rose forgot to give the sweater back, but in the morning, when it was still cold, she was wearing one of Mr. Rose's old sweaters and she handed the sweater back to Angel. He says that I shouldn't wear your sweater, she told Angel. The cap was pulled lower than usual over her eyes, and Angel noticed that Rose Rose had a black eye. I told you, she said. You shouldn't get involved with me. After the picking that day, Angel went to the cider house to have a word with Mr. Rose. Angel told Mr. Rose that he let Rose Rose wear his sweater because of the cold. Angel added that he really liked Mr. Rose's daughter, and so forth. Angel was very excited, although Mr. Rose remained a calm, calm man. Who told you that I beat my daughter, Angel? Mr. Rose asked gently. Rose Rose had told Angel, of course, but now Angel saw the trap, he was only making trouble for her. Mr. Rose would never allow himself to have any trouble with Angel. Mr. Rose knew the rules. They were the real cider house rules, they were the picker's rules. I just thought you had hit her, Angel said. Not me, said Mr. Rose. Before he put the tractor away, Angel spoke with Rose Rose. He told her that if she was frightened to stay in the cider house, she could always stay with him, that he had an extra bed in his room, or that he could leave his room and make it into a guest room for her and her baby. A guest room? Rose Rose said, she laughed. She told him he was the nicest man she had ever known. At supper, his father asked him, How are you getting along with Mr. Rose? I'm more curious how you're getting along with Rose Rose, Candy said. How he's getting along with the girl is his own business, Wally said. Right, said Homer Wells, and Wally let it pass. How you're getting along with Mr. Rose is our business, Angel, Wally said. Because we love you, Homer said. Mr. Rose won't hurt me, Angel told them. Of course he won't. Candy said. 
Mr. Rose does what he wants, Wally said. He's got his own rules, said Homer Wells. He beats his daughter, Angel told them. He hit her once, anyway. Don't make that your business, Angel, Wally told the boy. That's right, Homer said. I'll make it my business. Candy told them. If he's beating that girl, he'll hear about it from me. No, he won't. Wally said. Don't do that, Homer said. Don't tell me what to do, she told them, and they were quiet. Are you sure it's true, Angel? Candy asked. Almost sure, the boy said. Ninety-nine percent. Make it a hundred percent, Angel, before you say it's true, his father told him. Right, Angel said as he got up from the table and cleared his dishes. The next morning Angel learned that Rose Rose had never been in the ocean, that she'd picked citrus in Florida and peaches in Georgia but she'd never even felt the sand. That's crazy, said Angel Wells. We'll go to the beach some Sunday. You should let me take you to see it. He hugged her slightly but she suddenly cried out, when he looked at his hand, he saw her blood. After they kissed for a while, she showed him the cuts on her back, they were very thin, they were very careful cuts that would heal completely in a day or two. They were slightly deeper than scratches. I told you, she said to Angel, but she still kissed him, hard. You shouldn't have any business with me. Angel agreed not to talk about the cuts with Mr. Rose, Rose Rose convinced him of that. And if Angel wanted to take her to the beach, somehow, some Sunday, they should both be as nice to Mr. Rose as they could manage. But Angel could not keep secret Mr. Rose's crime. He told the whole story to his father, and to Candy and Wally. Did he cut her? Did he deliberately cut her? Wally asked Angel. There's no doubt about it, Angel said. I'm a hundred percent sure. I can't imagine how he could do that to his own daughter said Homer Wells. If you speak to him, he'll hurt her more, Angel told them. I want your advice, I don't want you to do anything. I wasn't thinking of speaking to him, Candy said angrily. I was thinking of speaking to the police. You can't cut your own children. But will it help her, if he gets in trouble? Homer asked. Precisely, Wally said. We can't help her by going to the police. Or by speaking to him, Angel said. I could ask her to stay with us, Angel suggested. That would get her away from him. I mean, she could just stay here, even after the harvest. But what would she do? Candy asked. There aren't any jobs around, 
said Homer Wells. Not after the harvest. Are you in love with Rose Rose, Angel? Homer asked his son. Yes, Angel said. And I think she likes me, at least a little. He cleared his own dishes and went upstairs to his room. What do you think of that? Homer asked Candy. Angel's in love. I hope it makes him more sympathetic to us, Candy told him. But Homer Wells was thinking about Mr. Rose. How far would he go? What were his rules? When Wally wheeled himself back into the house, he told Homer that there was some mail for him in the Apple Mart office. I'd like to bring it to the house, Wally told him, but I keep forgetting it. Just keep forgetting it, Homer advised him. It's the harvest. I don't have time to answer any mail. Nurse Carolyn's letter had also arrived, it was waiting for him with Dr. Large's letter, and with a letter from Melanie. Melanie had returned the questionnaire to Homer. She hadn't filled it out, she'd just been curious and she'd wanted to look it over more closely. After she'd read it a few times, it was clear to her that the Board of Trustees were a collection of idiots. Across the blank questionnaire, Melanie had written a brief message to Homer Wells. Dear Homer, I thought you were going to be a hero. My mistake. Sorry for hard time. Love, Melanie, much later that night, when he couldn't sleep, as usual, he decided to get up and read his mail. He read Melanie's message, Dr. Large's letter, and Nurse Carolyn's, too and any doubts that were remaining about the doctor's bag with the initials F.S. engraved in gold had disappeared. Homer decided not to send Melanie's response to the questionnaire to Larch or to Nurse Carolyn. He sent a single, short note, addressed to them both. The note was simple and mathematical. I am not a doctor. I believe that the fetus has a soul. I'm sorry. Sorry? Said Wilbur Large, when Nurse Carolyn read him the note. He says he's sorry? Of course, he isn't a doctor, Nurse Angela admitted. He will always be afraid to make an amateur mistake. That's why he would be a good doctor, said Dr. Larch. Doctors who think they know everything are the ones who make the most amateur mistakes. A good doctor should think that there's always something he doesn't know, that he can always kill someone. He believes the fetus has a soul, does he? Larch asked. Fine. He believes that a creature that lives like a fish has a soul. So he should believe in what he can see. If he's going to play God and tell us who's got a soul, he should take care of the souls who can talk back to him. He was furious. Then Nurse Angela said, So, 
We wait and see. Not me, said Wilbur Larch. Homer can wait and see, he said, but not me. He sat at the typewriter in Nurse Angela's office, he wrote this simple, mathematical note to Homer Wells. You know everything I know, plus what you've taught yourself. You're a better doctor than I am, and you know IT. You think what I do is playing God, but you presume that you know what God wants. Do you think that's not playing God? I am not sorry, not for anything I've done. I'm not even sorry that I love you. Mrs. Grogan asked him if he wanted some tea. But Dr. Larch told her that he felt too tired for tea, he wanted to lie down. Nurse Carolyn and Nurse Edna were picking apples, and Larch went a little way up the hill to speak to them. You're too old to pick apples, Edna, Larch told her. Let Carolyn and the children do it. He then walked a short distance with Nurse Carolyn, back toward the orphanage. Then he went into the dispensary and closed the door. Despite the harvest weather, it was still warm enough to have the window open during the day. He closed the window, too. It was a new, full can of ether. The ether dripped onto the face mask more freely than usual, his hand kept slipping off the cone before he could get enough to satisfy himself. He turned a little toward the wall, that way, the edge of the windowsill kept contact with the mask over his mouth and nose after his fingers relaxed their grip. There was just enough pressure from the window sill to hold the cone in place. He started his travel back in time. One hand, swinging back and forth beside the bed, knocked over the ether can. Slowly, the puddle developed on the linoleum floor, it spread under the bed, and all around him. The strength of the fumes overpowered him. By the time Larch moved his face away from the windowsill and the cone fell, he was already gagging. The cause of death was respiratory failure, due to aspiration of vomit, which lead to cardiac arrest. The Board of Trustees privately called it a suicide. The man was about to be disgraced, they told themselves. But those who knew him and understood his ether habit would say that it was an accident. Certainly, Mrs. Grogan knew, and Nurse Angela, and Nurse Sedna, and Nurse Carolyn knew, too, that he was not a man about to be disgraced. He was a man about to be no longer of use. And Wilbur Larch had thought that he was born to be a man of use. Nurse Edna found his body. She thought that the odor was especially strong and that Dr. Larch had been in the dispensary longer than usual. It was Nurse Angela who said it all according to the rules. Let us be happy for Dr. Larch, she said to the attentive children. Dr. Larch has found a family. Good night, Dr. Larch, Nurse Angela said. Good night, Dr. Larch. The children called. Good night. 
Wilbur. Nurse Edna managed to say. That Sunday at Ocean View was an Indian summer day and Homer Wells was fishing. It was not real fishing, Homer was trying to find out more about the relationship between Mr. Rose and his daughter. The two men were sitting on the cider house roof, for the most part, they weren't talking. Below them, Angel was trying to teach Rose Rose how to ride a bicycle. Homer had offered to drive Rose Rose and Angel to the beach, but it mattered to Angel that he and Rose Rose were independent. The beach was too far to walk to, and Homer didn't allow Angel to hitchhike, but it was only a four or five mile ride on a bike, and the road was mostly flat. Mr. Rose observed the lesson calmly, but Homer grew anxious, he knew how much preparation had gone into the trip, how Angel had fussed over both his own and Candy's bicycles. Angel was running alongside the wobbly bicycle, which Rose Rose struggled to ride. After the bike was moving at a comfortable speed, Angel would release his hold on it. But Rose Rose was unable to balance the bicycle and pedal it at the same time. Can you ride a bicycle? Mr. Rose asked Homer. I have never tried, said Homer Wells. There were no bicycles at the orphanage. The children could use them to ride away. I have never tried, either, said Mr. Rose. He watched his daughter zigzag over a slight hill, she fell, and Angel Wells ran to her, to help her up. A line of men were sitting with their backs against the cider house wall, some were drinking coffee. Some were drinking beer, but all of them were watching the bicycle lesson. Do you remember what you said to me, once, about the rules? Homer asked Mr. Rose. What rules? Mr. Rose asked. You know, those rules which I put up every year in the cider house, Homer said. And you mentioned that you had other rules, your own rules for living here. Yeah, those rules, said Mr. Rose. I thought you meant that your rules were about not hurting each other, I thought they were about being careful. Homer said. Like my rules, too, I guess. Say what you mean, Homer, said Mr. Rose. Is someone getting hurt? Homer asked. I mean, this year, is there some kind of trouble? Rose was upon the bicycle. Her look was grim, both she and Angel were sweating. She rode out of sight behind some apple trees, and Angel sprinted after her. Why don't they just walk? The picker named Peaches asked. They would be there now. Why doesn't someone take them in a car? Another man asked. They want to do it their own way, Muddy said. There was a little laughter about that. Show some respect, said Mr. Rose. Homer thought that Mr. Rose was speaking to him, but he was speaking to the men, who stopped laughing. 
That bicycle is going to break, Mr. Rose said to Homer. Homer Wells felt bad for Angel, but another subject weighed more heavily on his mind. So is someone getting hurt? Homer said. I'm speaking about the rules. Mr. Rose reached into his pocket, slowly, and Homer expected to see the knife, but it was not the knife that Mr. Rose removed from his pocket and very gently placed in Homer's hand, it was the burned down nub of a candle. It was what was left of the candle that Candy had lit for their love making in the cider house. In her panic, when she thought it was Wally who had caught them there, she had forgotten it. Homer closed his fingers around the candle, and Mr. Rose patted his hand. That's against the rules, isn't it? Mr. Rose asked Homer. Homer put the candle in his pocket. He and Mr. Rose looked at each other, it was almost a contest, the way they looked at each other. I'm worried about your daughter, said Homer Wells, after a while. Together they watched Rose fall off the bicycle again. Don't worry about her, said Mr. Rose. She looks unhappy, sometimes, Homer said. She isn't unhappy, Mr. Rose said. Are you worried about her? Homer asked him. Once you start worrying, you can worry about anybody, can't you? said Mr. Rose. Homer and Mr. Rose missed the moment when Rose gave up. They just noticed that she was running away, and that Angel was running after her, both bicycles were left behind. That's too bad, Homer said. Maybe I can convince them to let me drive them there. Leave them alone, said Mr. Rose, it sounded like a command. They don't have to go to the beach, Mr. Rose said, more mildly. They're just young, they're not sure how to have a good time, he said. Just think what might happen at the beach. They might drown. Or some people might not like a white boy with a colored girl. It's better for them not to go anywhere, Mr. Rose concluded. That was the end of that subject, because then Mr. Rose asked, Are you happy, Homer? Am I happy? said Homer Wells. Why do you repeat every single thing? Mr. Rose asked him. I don't know, Homer said. I'm happy, sometimes, he said cautiously. That's good, said Mr. Rose. And Mr. and Mrs. Worthington, are they happy? I think they're happy, most of the time, Homer told him. That's good, said Mr. Rose. Rose was lying in the dark grass under an apple tree. Angel Wells was lying beside her. She let her arm loll on his waist, he ran his finger very lightly over her face following the line of her scar down her nose to her lip. When he got to her lip, she kissed his finger. 
She had taken off the work shoes and the blue jeans, but she kept the t-shirt on. We'll go to the beach another day, Angel said. We won't go anywhere, she said. They kissed each other for a while. Then Rose said, tell me about it again. Angel Wells began to describe the ocean, but she interrupted him. No, not about that, she said. Tell me how we're all living together in the same house. You and me and my baby and your father and Mr. and Mrs. Worthington, Rose said. I like it, she said, smiling. And he began again, about how it was possible. He was sure that his father and Wally and Candy wouldn't object. You're all crazy, she told Angel. But go on, she said. There was plenty of room, Angel assured her. She shut her eyes, with her eyes shut, she could see what Angel was describing a little better. Angel talked all day, he just went on and on and on. In his story, Rose and everyone else got along perfectly. In the late afternoon, she was starting to stand up when an apparent cramp, or the pain from her fall against the bicycle's crossbar, dropped her to her knees, and Angel caught her round her shoulders. You hurt yourself on the bicycle, didn't you? He asked her. I was trying to, she said then. What? He asked her. I was trying to hurt myself, Rose told him, but I don't think I hurt myself enough. Enough for what? He asked. To lose the baby. She told him. Are you pregnant? Angel asked her. Again, she said. Again and again, I guess, she said. Somebody wants me to keep having babies. Who? Angel asked her. Never mind, she told him. Someone who's not here? He asked. Oh, he's here, Rose said. But never mind. Is the father here? Angel asked. The father of this one, yeah, he's here, she said patting her flat stomach. Who is he? Angel asked. Never mind who he is, she told Angel. Tell me that story again, only make it two babies. Now they're me and you, and everybody else, and two babies, she said. Won't we all have fun? Angel was shocked, Rose kissed him and hugged him, and she changed her tone of voice. You see? She whispered to him, holding him tight. We wouldn't have fun at the beach, Angel. Do you want the baby? He asked her. I want the one I got, she told him. I don't want this one. She struck herself as hard as she could when she said this, she bent herself over again. 
she lay in the grass. Do you want to love me or help me? She asked him. Both, he said miserably. There is no such thing as both, she said. You should help me, that's easier. You can stay with me, Angel began again. Don't tell me any more about that. Rose said angrily. Don't tell me any more names for my baby, either. Just help me, she said. How? Angel asked. Just get me an abortion, Rose said. I don't know anybody to ask, and I have no money. Angel thought that the money he'd been saving to buy his first car would probably be enough money for an abortion. He had saved about $500, but the problem was that the money was in a savings account, the trustees of which were his father and Candy. Angel couldn't take any money out without their signatures. So he told them the whole story. She doesn't want to tell you who the father is? Homer Wells asked Angel. No, Angel said. Probably Peaches, Candy said. Does it matter if she doesn't want to say who the father is? The main thing is she doesn't want the baby, said Homer Wells. The main thing is to get her an abortion. Wally and Candy were quiet. You'll have to take her to St. Clouds, Homer told Angel. But I don't think she wants to have the baby, Angel said. And if she had it, I don't think she'd want to leave it in the orphanage. Angel, Homer said, she doesn't have to have a baby in St. Clouds. She can have an abortion there. Wally moved the wheelchair back and forth. Candy said, I had an abortion there, once, Angel. You did? Angel said. At the time, Wally told the boy, we thought we'd always be able to have another baby. It was before Wally was hurt, before the war, Candy began. Does Dr. Large, do it? Angel asked his father. Right, said Homer Wells. He was thinking that he should put Angel and Rose on a train to Street Clouds as soon as possible. Homer didn't know how much more time Dr. Larch would have to practice. I'll call Dr. Larch right now, Homer said. We'll put you and Rose on the next train. Or I could drive them in the Cadillac, Wally said. It's too far for you to drive, Wally, Homer told him. Baby Rose can stay here, with me, Candy said. They decided that it would be best if Candy went to the cider house and brought Rose and her baby back to the house. Mr. Rose might give Rose an argument if Angel showed up at night, wanting Rose and the baby to go off with him. He won't argue with me. Candy said. I'll just say that I've found a lot of old baby clothes, and that Rose and I are going to dress up the baby in everything that fits her. At night? Wally said. 
Mr. Rose isn't a fool. I don't care if he believes me, Candy said. I just want to get the girl and her baby out of there. Do we have to hurry? Wally asked. Yes, I'm afraid we do, said Homer Wells. He had not told Candy or Wally about Dr. Large's desire to replace himself, or what revelations and fictions had been delivered to the board. When Homer called Street Clouds, he got Nurse Carolyn, in their shock, in their grief, in their mourning for Dr. Large. They had determined that Nurse Carolyn had the sturdiest voice over the phone. And they had all been trying to learn Dr. Large's plans, and to read a brief history of street clouds as well. Every time the phone rang, they assumed it was someone from the Board of Trustees. Carolyn? said Homer Wells. It's Homer. Let me speak with the old man. Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna, and even Mrs. Grogan, would love Homer Wells forever, in spite of his note of denial, but Nurse Carolyn was younger than any of them. She did not feel the long-lasting sweetness for Homer Wells that comes from knowing someone when he's a baby. She felt he had betrayed Larch. And, of course, it was a bad time for him to ask for the old man. When Larch had died, Nurse Angela and Nurse Edna and Mrs. Grogan had said they had not been able to call Homer. Nurse Carolyn hadn't wanted to call him. What do you want? Nurse Carolyn asked him coldly. Or have you changed your mind? There's a friend of my son's, said Homer Wells. She's one of the migrants here. She's already got a baby who's got no father, and now she's going to have another. Then she'll have to, Nurse Carolyn informed him. Carolyn, said Homer Wells. Stop it. I want to talk to the old man. I'd like to talk to him, too, Nurse Carolyn told him, her voice rising. Larch is dead, Homer, she said more quietly. No, said Homer Wells, he felt his heart dancing. Too much ether, she said. There's no more Lord's work in St. Cloud's. If you know someone who needs it, you'll have to do it yourself. Then she slammed the phone down. Homer's throat had not ached so deeply, the pain was pushing down, into his lungs, since that night, he had yelled across the river, trying to make the Maine woods repeat the name of Fuzzy Stone. Homer shut his eyes and watched the women getting off the train. They always looked a little lost. And now they walked from the station. Homer saw them marching uphill, there were more of them than he remembered. They were an army, advancing on the orphanage hospital, bearing with them a single wound. Where would Nurse Edna and Nurse Angela go, and what would happen to Mrs. Grogan? Worried Homer Wells. He remembered the hatred and contempt in Melanie's eyes. If Melanie were pregnant, 
I would help her, he thought. And with that thought he realized that he was willing to play God, a little. Homer Wells was thinking hard when he reached into his pocket and found the burned down nub of the candle which Mr. Rose had returned to him, that's against the rules, isn't it? Mr. Rose had asked him. On his bedside table, between the reading lamp and the telephone, was his old copy of David Copperfield. Homer didn't have to open the book to know how the story began. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show, he recited from memory. Homer went downstairs to the kitchen where Angel was pushing Wally around in the wheelchair. It was a game, which they played when they were both restless. Angel stood on the back of the wheelchair and pushed it, the chair went faster and faster, much faster than Wally could make it move by himself. Wally kept turning. He kept trying to miss the furniture. But despite his skill as a pilot and the good size of the kitchen floor, eventually the chair moved too fast to control and they crashed into something. Candy got angry at them for it, but they did it, anyway especially when she was out of the house. Wally called it flying, most of all, it was something they did when they were bored. Candy had gone to the cider house to get Rose and her baby. Angel and Wally were freewheeling. When they saw how Homer looked, they stopped. What's the matter, old boy? Wally asked his friend. Homer knelt by Wally's wheelchair and put his head in Wally's lap. Dr. Larch is dead, he told Wally, who held Homer while he cried. He cried a very short time, in Homer's memory, Curly Day had been the only orphan who ever cried for a long time. When Homer stopped crying, he said to Angel, I've got a little story for you, and I'm going to need your help. They went outside to the shed where the garden things were kept, and Homer opened one of the small leather cans with a safety pin. The fumes made his eyes tear a little, he'd never understood how Larch could like the stuff. He got addicted to it, Homer told his son. But he used to have the lightest touch. I've seen patients talking back to him while they were under the influence of ether, and still they didn't feel a thing. They took the ether upstairs and Homer told Angel to make up the extra bed in his room, first with the rubber sheet they'd used when Angel had still been in diapers, then the usual sheets but clean ones over that. Is it for baby Rose? Angel asked his father. No, not for baby Rose, Homer said. When he unpacked the instruments, Angel sat down on the other bed and watched him. The water's boiling. Wally called upstairs. Do you remember how I used to tell you that I was Dr. Large's helper? Homer asked Angel. Right, said Angel Wells. Well, I became very good at helping him, Homer said. Very good. 
I'm not an amateur, he told his son. That's the little story, Homer said, when he'd arranged everything that he needed where he could see it, everything looked perfect. Go on, Angel Wells told his father. Go on with the story. Downstairs, in the quiet house, they heard Wally in his wheelchair, rolling from room to room, he was still flying. Upstairs, Homer Wells was talking to his son while he was preparing the mask. He began with that old business about the Lord's work and the devil's, how, to Wilbur Large, it was all the work of the Lord. It startled Candy when she saw all the men on the cider house roof. Mr. Rose and his daughter were inside the cider house, and the men were waiting where they'd been told to wait. When Candy got out of the jeep, no one spoke to her. There were no lights on in the cider house. Hello. Candy called up to the roof. It suddenly frightened her, how they kept silent. But the men were more frightened than Candy was, the men didn't know what to say. They knew only that what Mr. Rose was doing to his daughter was wrong, and that they were too afraid to do anything about it. Muddy? Candy asked in the darkness. Yes, Mrs. Worthington. Muddy called down to her. Peaches? Candy said. Yes, ma'am, Peaches said. Please, someone hold the ladder, she said. Muddy and Peaches held the ladder, and Black Pan held her hand when she climbed up on the roof. The men made room for her, and she sat down with them. The first time she heard the sound from the cider house, it came from directly under her, Candy thought it was the baby beginning to cry. When your Wally was a boy, everything was different, Black Pan said to her. His gaze was fixed upon the coast. The noise under the cider house roof became more distinct, and Peaches said, Isn't it a pretty night, ma'am? It was definitely not a pretty night, it was a darker night than usual, and the sound from the cider house was now clear to her. For a second, she thought she was going to be sick. Be careful when you stand up, Mrs. Worthington, Muddy said to her, but Candy stamped her feet on the roof, then she knelt down and began to beat on the tin with both her hands. The roof is very old, Mrs. Worthington, Black Pan said to her. You can fall through it. Help me down. Candy said to them. Muddy and Peaches took her arms and Black Band preceded them to the ladder. Even walking down the roof, Candy tried to keep stamping her feet. Going down the ladder, she called, Rose. She could not say the ridiculous name of Rose and she couldn't make herself say Mr. Rose, either. Rose. She called ambiguously. Mr. Rose met her at the cider house door. He was still getting dressed, he was buttoning his trousers. 
he looked thinner and older to her than he'd looked before, and although he smiled at her, he didn't look into her eyes with his usual confidence, with his usual, polite indifference. Don't speak to me, Candy told him. Your daughter and her baby are coming with me. Candy walked by him into the cider house. She felt the tattered rules with her fingers as she found the light switch. Rose was sitting on the bed. She had pulled her blue jeans on. She had found only one of her work shoes, which she held in one hand. The other one was under the bed. Candy found it and put it on the correct foot. Rose wore no socks. Then Candy tied the laces for her, too. Rose just sat on the bed while Candy put on and tied her other shoe. You're coming with me. Your baby, too, Candy told the girl. Yes. Ma'am, Rose said. Candy wiped the tears from Rose Rose's face. You're fine, you're just fine, Candy said to the girl. And you're going to feel better. No one's going to hurt you. Baby Rose was asleep. And Candy was careful not to wake her when she picked her up and handed her to her mother. Rose moved uncertainly and Candy put her arm around her when they walked out of the cider house together. You're going to be just fine, Candy said to Rose. She kissed the young woman on her neck, and Rose, who was sweating, leaned against her. Mr. Rose was standing in the darkness between the jeep and the cider house, but the rest of the men were still sitting on the roof. You're coming back, Mr. Rose said, it was not a question. I told you not to speak to me, Candy told him. She helped Rose and her baby into the jeep. I was speaking to my daughter, Mr. Rose said with dignity. But Rose did not answer her father. She sat like a statue of a woman with a baby in her arms while Candy turned the jeep around and drove away. Before they went into the house together, Rose said to Candy, I could do nothing about it. Of course you couldn't, Candy told her. He hated the father of my baby girl, Rose said. He has been after me ever since. You're going to be all right now, Candy told the girl before they went inside, through the windows, they could watch Wally flying back and forth in the house. I know my father, Mrs. Worthington, Rose whispered. He is going to want me back. He can't have you, Candy told her. He can't make you go back to him. He makes his own rules, said Rose. And where is the father of your beautiful daughter? Candy asked, holding the door open for Rose and her baby girl. My father cut him up. He went away long ago, Rose said. He didn't want to be involved with me anymore. And your mother? Candy asked, as they went in the house. She is dead. Rose said. At that moment, 
Wally told Candy that Dr. Larch was dead, too. Homer didn't show his feelings, and Norfin learns how to keep things in. Are you all right? Candy asked Homer, while Wally willed Baby Rose around the downstairs of the house and Angel took Rose to his room, which was prepared for her. I'm a little nervous, Homer admitted to Candy. It's certainly not a matter of technique, and I've got everything I need, I know I can do it. But to me, it is a living human being. I can't describe to you what it feels like. When living tissue is touched, it responds, somehow, Homer said, but Candy cut him off. It may help you to know who the father is, she said. It's Mr. Rose. Her father is the father, if that makes it any easier. The made-up bed in Angel's childhood room and the gleaming instruments made Rose both talkative and rigid. This doesn't look like fun, the girl said holding her fists in her lap. Stay with Wally, Angel, Candy told the boy. Give baby Rose a ride in the wheelchair. Knock over all the furniture, if you want, she told him, kissing her son. Yeah, go away, Rose told Angel. Don't be afraid. Candy told Rose. Homer knows what he's doing. You're in very safe hands. Homer began to show Rose the instruments. This is a speculum, he said to her. It may feel cold, but it doesn't hurt. You won't feel any of this. He assured her. These are dilators, Homer said, but Rose shut her eyes. You have done this before, haven't you? Rose asked him. He had the ether ready. Just breathe normally, he told her. At the first whiff. She opened her eyes and turned her face away from the mask, but Candy put her hands at Rose Rose's temples and very gently moved her head into the right position. The first smell is the sharpest, said Homer Wells. Have you done this before? Rose asked him. I'm a good doctor. I really am, Homer Wells told her. Just relax, and breathe normally. Don't be afraid, Rose heard Candy tell her. Homer Wells started the operation. Downstairs, he heard the wheelchair moving through the house, there was a wild and non-stop giggling from baby Rose. Tell them not to get that baby overexcited, Homer said to Candy. He did not let the noise distract him. After the first abortion, thought Homer Wells, this might get easier. Because he knew now that he couldn't play God in the worst sense, if he could operate on Rose. How could he refuse to help a stranger? How could he refuse anyone? Only a god makes that kind of decision. I'll just give them what they want, he thought. An orphan or an abortion. Homer Wells breathed slowly and regularly, the steadiness of his hands surprised him.
He did not even blink when he felt the instrument make contact. For that night, Candy slept in the extra bed in Angel's room. She wanted to be nearby if Rose needed anything, but Rose slept like a rock. Angel slept downstairs, sharing the big bed with Wally. They stayed awake quite late, talking. Wally told Angel about the time when he first fell in love with Candy, although Angel had heard the story before. He listened to it more attentively, now that he thought he had fallen in love with Rose. Wally also told Angel that he must never underestimate the darker necessities of the world where his father had grown up. It's the old story, Wally said to Angel. You can get Homer out of St. Clouds. But you can't get St. Clouds out of Homer. And the most important thing about love, Wally said to Angel, is that you can't force anyone. It's natural to want someone who you love to do what you want, or what you think would be good for them, but you have to let everything happen to them. You can't interfere with people whom you love any more than you interfere with people whom you don't even know. And that's hard, he added, because you often want to interfere, you want to be the one who makes the plans. It's hard to want to protect someone else, and not be able to, Angel said. You can't protect people, kiddo, Wally said. All you can do is love them. Upstairs, in the bedroom, Homer Wells was wide awake. He'd volunteered to have baby Rose for the night. Because I'll be up all night, anyway, he said. He'd forgotten how much he enjoyed looking after a baby. Babies reminded Homer of himself, they always wanted something in the middle of the night. But after he'd given baby Rose her bottle, the child went back to sleep and left Homer Wells alone again, it was nonetheless a pleasure looking at the little girl. Her black face in the bed beside him was no bigger than his hand, and occasionally her fingers opened and closed, grasping at something she saw in her sleep. Homer Wells remembered sleeping quarters in street clouds. He tried to imagine the necessary announcement. Let us be happy for Dr. Large. Homer said softly. Dr. Large has found a family. Good night, Dr. Large. He didn't know which one of them had said it. Anyway, he decided to send his letter to Nurse Angela. Homer needed some more time. You must stall the board. Homer wrote to Nurse Angela. Tell them that you can't reach Dr. Stone now because the doctor is in transit between two of the mission's hospitals in India. Say that you don't expect to be able to communicate with him for a week or more, and that, if he was willing to consider the position at Street Clouds, he couldn't possibly be available before November. Homer Wells hoped that this would allow him the time to tell Angel everything, and to be finished with the harvest. You must forgive me for needing all this time, Homer wrote to Nurse Angela, 
but perhaps I will seem more believable to the board of trustees if everyone has to wait for me. It takes time to leave Asia. He also asked them to send him the available history of Fuzzy Stone. He told Nurse Angela that he had loved Larch like a father, and that they had nothing to fear from Melanie. Rose spent all of Monday in the bed in Angel's room. Candy brought her baby to her from time to time, and Angel visited her every chance he could get. You're going to love this room, Angel told her. You are just crazy, Rose told him. But I already love it. It was a bad day for the harvest, Mr. Rose didn't go out. Black Pan announced that it was a good day for a fast. Mr. Rose, it appeared, was fasting. He was sitting outside the cider house in the weak sun, wrapped in a blanket from his bed, he was not talking to anyone. We'll just have to get along without him, Homer told the men. Black Pen brought him a cup of coffee and some fresh cornbread, but Mr. Rose didn't touch any of it. It was a cool day, and when the faint sun drifted behind the clouds, Mr. Rose drew the blanket over his head. At the end of the day, Muddy informed Homer, he wants to see his daughter. Just see her. He says that he won't touch her. Tell him that he can come to the house and see her there, Homer Wells told Muddy. But at supper time, Muddy came to the kitchen door alone. Candy invited him to eat with them. Rose was sitting with them, at the table, but Muddy was too nervous to stay. He says that he won't come here, Muddy told Homer. He asks her to come to the cider house. He asks to tell you that they've got their own rules. He says that you're breaking the rules, Homer. Rose sat so still at the table that she was not even chewing, she wanted to hear everything. Angel tried to take her hand, which was cold, but she pulled it away from him and kept both her hands in her lap. Muddy, Wally said, tell him that Rose is staying in my house, and that in my house we follow my rules. Tell him he's welcome to come here any time. He won't do it, Muddy said. I have to go to see him, Rose said. No, you don't, Candy told her. Tell him that he can see her here, or nowhere, Muddy, Candy said. Yes, ma'am. I brought the bicycles back, Muddy said to Angel. They're a little broken. Angel went outside to look at the bicycles and then Muddy handed him the knife. You don't need this, Angel, Muddy told the boy, but give it to Rose. Say that I want her to have it. Angel looked at Muddy's knife. It was one of those jackknives where the blade locks in place when you open it so it can't close on your fingers. The blade was almost six inches long, it was very thin and the edge was very sharp. I'll give it to her, Angel said. 
tell her that her father says he loves her, and he just wants to see her, Muddy said. Just see, he repeated. Angel thought a little, then he said, I love Rose, you know, Muddy. Sure I know, Muddy said. I love her, too. We all love her. Everybody loves Rose, that's her problem. If Mr. Rose just wants to see her, Angel said, why are you giving her your knife? She should have it just in case, Muddy said. Angel gave her the knife when they were sitting in his room after supper. It's from Muddy, he told her. I know who it is from, Rose said, I know what knife everyone has got, I know what they all look like. It made Angel jump to see how quickly she opened the knife using only one hand. She closed the knife against her hip, her long fingers moved the knife around so quickly that Angel didn't notice where she put it. Do you know a lot about knives? Angel asked her. From my father, she said. He showed me everything. Angel moved and sat on the bed next to her. I told you, she began patiently. You shouldn't have any business with me, I could never tell you anything about me. You shouldn't know about me, believe me. But I love you, Angel said helplessly. After she kissed him she said, Angel. Sometimes love makes no difference. Then baby Rose woke up. Do you know what her name will be? She asked Angel. Candy, Rose said. In the morning, everyone got up early, but no one got up earlier than Rose. Angel noticed that Rose and her daughter had gone. Angel and Homer got in the jeep and drove out to the cider house before breakfast. The men were up and looking restless, and Mr. Rose was already maintaining his stoical sitting position in the grass in front of the cider house. The blanket was completely covering him except for his face. You're too late, Mr. Rose said to them. She has long gone. Angel ran and looked in the cider house, but there was no sign of Rose or her daughter. She said that she would hitchhike, Mr. Rose told Homer and Angel. I didn't hurt her. Mr. Rose went on. I didn't touch her, Homer, he said. I just love her. I just wanted to see her, one more time. I'm sorry for your troubles, Homer Wells told the man, but Angel ran off to find Muddy. She asked to tell you that you were the nicest, Muddy told the boy. She asked to tell you that your dad was a hero, and that you were the nicest. Didn't she say where she was going? She doesn't know where she's going, Angel, Muddy told him. She just knows she has to go. I loved her. The boy said. She knows, Muddy said. She knows who she is, too, but she also knows you don't know who you are, yet. 
Mr. Rose maintained his almost Buddhist position, in the afternoon he asked Black Pan to bring him some water, and when the men finished picking that day, he called Muddy. Muddy was very frightened but he approached Mr. Rose and stood at a distance of about six feet from him. Where is your knife, Muddy? Mr. Rose asked him. Did you lose it? I didn't lose it, Muddy told him. But I can't find it, he added. Is it around, you mean? Mr. Rose asked him. I don't know where it is, Muddy admitted. It was a cold and sunless late afternoon, but Muddy was sweating, he held his hands at his sides as if his hands were dead fish. Where did she get the knife, Muddy? Mr. Rose asked. What knife? Muddy asked him. It looked like your knife, what I saw, said Mr. Rose. I gave it to her, Muddy admitted. Thank you for doing that, Muddy, Mr. Rose said. If she is hitchhiking, I'm glad that she has got a knife with her. Peaches Muddy screamed. Go and get Homer. Peaches came out of the cider house and stared at Mr. Rose, who didn't move a muscle. Mr. Rose didn't look at Peaches at all. Black Pan Muddy screamed. When Peaches ran to get Homer Wells, Black Ben came out of the cider house and he and Muddy got down on their knees and peered at Mr. Rose together. Stay calm, Mr. Rose advised them. You're too late, he told them. No one is going to catch her now. She had all day to get away, Mr. Rose said proudly. Where did she cut you? Muddy asked Mr. Rose, but neither he nor Black Pan dared to touch Mr. Rose under the blanket. They just watched his eyes and his dry lips. She is good with that knife. She is better with it than you. Mr. Rose said to Muddy. I know she is good, Muddy said. She is almost the best, said Mr. Rose. And who taught her? He asked them. You did, they told him. That's right said Mr. Rose. That's why she is almost as good as me. Very slowly, keeping himself completely under the blanket, except for his face, Mr. Rose rolled over on his side and chucked his knees up to his chest. I'm really tired of sitting up, he told Muddy and Black Pan. I'm getting sleepy. Where did she cut you? Muddy asked him again. I didn't think that it would take so long, said Mr. Rose. All the men were standing around him when Homer Wells and Peaches arrived in the jeep. Mr. Rose had very little left to say when Homer got to him. You've broken the rules, too, Homer, Mr. Rose whispered to him. Say that you know how I feel. I know how you feel, said Homer Wells. Right, 
said Mr. Rose, grinning. The knife had entered in the upper right quadrant, close to the rib margin. Homer knew that a knife moving in an upward direction would cut a liver. The wound could continue to bleed for many hours. Mr. Rose died in Homer's arms before Candy and Angel arrived at the cider house. Mr. Rose had managed to soak the blade of his own knife in his wound, and the last thing that he told Homer was that it should be clear to the authorities that he had stabbed himself. My daughter ran away, Mr. Rose told all of them, and I was so sorry that I stuck myself. You should say that. Let me hear you say it. He raised his voice to them. You killed yourself, Peaches told him. That was what happened, Black Man said. That was how Homer reported it, and that was how the death of Mr. Rose was received, the way he wanted it, according to the Cider House rules. Rose had broken the rules, of course, but everyone at Ocean View knew the rules, which Mr. Rose had broken with her. At the end of the harvest, on a gray morning the men were picking up their few things. Homer Wells was there, and Angel had come with him to say goodbye to Muddy and Peaches and Black Ben and the rest of them. Wally had made some arrangements with Black Pan who was going to be crew boss the following year. Wally had been right about Mr. Rose. He was the only one of them who could read well and write at all. Muddy told Angel that he'd always thought that the list of rules tacked to the kitchen wall was about the building's electricity. Because it was always near the light switch, Muddy explained. I thought they were instructions about the lights. The other men, since they couldn't read at all, never noticed that the list was there. Muddy, maybe you will see her, Angel said, when he was saying goodbye. I won't see her, Angel, Muddy told the boy. Then they left. Angel never saw Muddy again, or Peaches or any of the rest of them except Black Pan. It wasn't a good idea to have Black Pan as a crew boss, the man was a cook, not a picker, and a boss had to be in the field with the men. Although Black Pan gathered a picking crew, he was never quite in charge of them. Wally finally settled on Jamaicans. They were friendly, non-violent, and good workers. They brought with them an interesting music and a straightforward but contained passion for beer and for a little marijuana. They knew how to handle the fruit and they never hurt each other. But after Mr. Rose's last summer at Ocean View, the pickers never sat on the cider house roof. It just never occurred to them. And no one ever put up a list of rules again. In future years the only person who ever sat on the cider house roof was Angel Wells, because he liked that view of the ocean and because he wanted to remember that November day in 195, after Muddy and the rest of them had left, and his father turned to him they were alone at the cider house and said, How about sitting on the roof for a while with me?
It's time for you to know the whole story. Another little story? Angel asked. I said the whole story, said Homer Wells. And although it was a cold day, that November, father and son sat on that roof a long time. It was, after all, a long story, and Angel asked a lot of questions. Candy, who drove by the cider house and saw them sitting up there, was worried about how cold they must be. But she didn't interrupt them, she just kept driving. She hoped that the truth would keep them warm. Then she went and got Wally out of the office. Where are we going? Wally asked her. She bundled him up in a blanket. We must be going north, he said, when she didn't answer him. My father's dock, she told him. Wally knew that Ray Kendall's dock had been blown over land and sea, he kept quiet. They were alone. Candy drove the jeep through the empty parking lot and out to a rocky embankment. She stopped near to the ocean's edge, where she and Wally had spent so many evenings, so long ago. She wrapped Wally's legs in the blanket and then she sat down behind him. This is fun, Wally said. She stuck her chin over his shoulder, their cheeks were touching, she hugged him around his arms and his chest, and she squeezed his hips with her legs. I love you, Wally, Candy said. Beginning her story In late November, the Board of Trustees at Street Clouds approved the appointment of Dr. F. Stone as obstetrician and the new director of the orphanage. Dr. Stone, who appeared a little tired from his Asian traveling, made the correct impression on the board. His manner was somber, his hair was graying and cropped in an almost military fashion actually, Candy had cut his hair. The board also approved of Dr. Stone's medical and religious credentials. On the matter of abortions, Dr. Stone surprised the board by the adamant conviction he held, that they should be legalized and that he intended to work through the proper channels toward that end. However, Dr. Stone assured them, as long as abortions were illegal, he would strictly support the law. He believed in rules, and in obeying them, he told the board. Dr. Stone said that he himself never would perform abortions, even if they were legalized. I just couldn't do it, he lied calmly. Dr. Stone's Christian tolerance greatly impressed the board. Despite his disagreement with Dr. Large on the subject of abortions, the young missionary said, I always prayed for Dr. Large. And I still pray for him. It was an emotional moment, and the board was predictably moved by it. And it was thrilling, after they had interviewed him, how he blessed them as he was leaving them. Ngasakin, said the missionary doctor. They all wanted to know what he had said. Wally, of course, had taught Homer the correct pronunciation although he'd never learned what it meant. 
Homer Wells translated the phrase for them, Wally had always thought it was someone's name. It means, Homer, told the board, may God watch over your soul, which no man may abuse. There were loud murmurs of approval. Mrs. Goodhall said, all that in such a short phrase. It's a remarkable language, Dr. Stone told them dreamily. Ngasakin, he told them again. They all repeated it after him. The Burmese phrase actually meant, curried fish balls. Candy and Wally and Angel went to street clouds for Christmas, and for Angel's school vacations, too, and after Angel had his driver's license, he was free to visit his father as often as he liked. It was often. When Homer arrived at the orphanage, Nurse Angela threw her arms around his neck and whispered in his ear. Oh Homer. She whispered. I knew you'd be back. Call me Fuzzy, he whispered to her, because he knew that Homer Wells like Rose was long gone. For several days. Nurse Carolyn was shy with him, but he wouldn't need more than a few operations and a few deliveries to convince her that he was the real thing. Dr. Stone, even as a name, could be a proper successor to Dr. Larch. Stone was a good, hard, feet on the ground reliable sounding sort of name for a physician. Candy and Wally Worthington devoted themselves to apple farming. And Angel Wells, whom Rose had introduced to love and to imagination, one day became a novelist. The kids got fiction in his blood, Wally told Homer Wells. When Homer was tired of insomnia, he missed Angel, or he thought of Candy. Sometimes he longed to carry Wally into the surf, or to fly with him. Sometimes, when he was especially tired, he dreamed that abortions were legal, that they were safe and available and therefore he could stop performing them because someone else would do them, but he was rarely that tired. For his education, he read carefully a brief history of street clouds. And as he grew older, Homer Wells also known as Fuzzy Stone took special comfort in an unexplained revelation he found in the writings of Wilbur Larch. Tell Dr. Stone, Dr. Larch wrote, and this was his very last entry, these were Wilbur's last words, there is absolutely nothing wrong with Homer's heart. Except for the ether. Homer Wells knew there had been very little that was wrong with the heart of Wilbur Larch. To Nurse Sedna, who was in love, and to Nurse Angela, who wasn't but who had in her wisdom named both Homer Wells and Fuzzy Stone, there was no fault in the hearts of either Dr. Stone or Dr. Larch, who were, if there ever were, Princes of Maine, Kings of New England